Mr. Vice Chairman, let's go ahead and begin with our meeting for the Board of Zoning Appeals. Ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. The Metropolitan Government's Board of Zoning Appeals is now in session for its regularly scheduled meeting of May 17th, 2018. My name is John Michael. I work with the Metro Codes Department and serve the Board of Zoning Appeals. I'll be presenting the cases of the Board for their review in today's public hearings. We apologize for the unusual and pointedly uncomfortable accommodations today, but we thank you for your relative flexibility as we work to ensure that the best spaces are available for early voting during this important uh, time where we're electing a new mayor. John Michael, yes. Let's sure. Well, while we do have microphones and we're being recorded, we don't have our normal uh, public address system, so uh, we can only hear when someone's across the room what they're saying, so please try to be extra quiet. And, uh, and we appreciate the assistance with that. Not only do we appreciate the assistance with keeping all uh, background chatter to an absolute minimum, but also to turning off your cell phones, turning off your tablets, and any other noise-making devices. Uh, it will accommodate not only the appellants who have limited time to make their cases to the board, but the board members who are trying desperately to hear every word they present. For today's public hearings, the board will review the correspondence that's been submitted in support of and opposition to to the cases. The board also reviews correspondence and recommendations from other government agencies in preparation for the hearings as well. In each of today's public hearings, the staff will present photographs, site plans, uh, maps, and other documents that have been submitted and comprise the case record. At the conclusion of the staff's presentations, the appellant will present his or her case to the board. After the appellant's presentation, the board will hear from anyone wishing to speak in support of the appeal. Then if it's a contested case, the board will hear from those wishing to speak in opposition. After opposition testimony, the appellant will have a brief period for rebuttal. Under BCA rules, the appellant has five minutes for, its, for his or her presentation if there, in fact, is no opposition present. For contested cases, both sides have ten minutes to make the desired presentation. I emphasize sides because that's not 10 minutes per person, that's 10 minutes per side. We would encourage everyone to divvy up their time accordingly in advance. At the conclusion of each individual hearing, the board will deliberate and then vote on the case in question. The board is vested with the power to act on these cases under the provisions of the Metro Zoning Code, specifically section 17.40.180. Each of the sections to which we refer today come from the Metro Zoning Code, which was adopted by the Metropolitan Council and became effective on January the 1st, of 1998. The Metro Zoning Code is applicable to the entire jurisdiction of the Metropolitan Government. I'll introduce the entire Zoning Code and make it part of today's record for each of the cases. The Metro Code requires a record of these proceedings because BZA meetings are recorded for the Metro Nashville Network and later uploaded to YouTube as well. It is imperative that, it is imperative that anyone wishing to address the board come to the table here at the front of the room to address the board, introduce yourself by name and address, and then make the desired presentation. Any comments made from the gallery will not only not be part of the record, but will be regarded as an overt disruption. We'll ask you to leave. We'll make a big deal about it. It will be embarrassing for all of us. So if you want to address the board, please come forward, introduce yourself at the front table, and take advantage of your opportunity to participate in the public hearing. The Metro Code requires four members of our seven-member board in order to establish quorum. The Code also requires at least four affirmative votes in order to grant an appeal. In the event that five or more of our members are present, which is the case today, and an appeal fails to receive four affirmative votes, the case will remain on the board's agenda for the next 30 days. Applications that fail to receive four affirmative votes within 30 days of the public hearing shall be deemed denied by operation of law. <clears throat> First with the board rules, any aggrieved party may file an appeal with regard to the board's action by means of a writ of certiorari to the uh, Chancery Court here in Davidson County. That must be done within 60 days of the original hearing date. Additionally, an aggrieved party may file a motion for rehearing within 60 days of the hearing date, pursuant to the terms of the BZA rules of procedure. After that time elapses, the board's action becomes final. No further action can be taken. For the appellants, if your appeal is granted, you are in fact required to obtain the permit for which you applied. A permit must be obtained within two years in order for a board's approval to remain valid. It should be noted that if any false or misleading testimony is presented to the board, any board approval or relief can be revoked at a later date by means of a show cause hearing before the BZA. Mr. Chairman, submit that all the cases have been submitted in the proper order, all the appellants have been notified by certified mail, and all legal notice requirements have been fulfilled for today's cases. Preliminary announcements involving cases that will not be heard today, first, Case number 2018-185 has been withdrawn. That was involving the property at 1740 J.P. Hennessy Drive. Again, that case is withdrawn. 
Case number 2018-158, involving the property at 4707 Nevada Avenue, has been deferred to our next meeting, June 7th. And although we will hear from council on the topic at the very beginning of our uh, docket today, case number 2018-47 is agreed upon to be deferred to a later date. That too, like case 185, is a short-term rental case. <coughs> Four members of the public and for the benefit of our record, the board utilizes a consent agenda. One board member reviews the record for each of the cases on today's docket prior to the hearing. That board member will identify cases where appellants met the criteria for their requested action. If the reviewing board member determines that testimony in the case would not alter the material facts at issue in that case, the matter is recommended to the board for approval on the consent agenda. We will enter into the record those cases that have been so recommended, and if anyone is here in opposition to one of the consent agenda items, please raise your hand, make sure that I see you. We'll merely remove the case from the consent agenda and have it heard in its regular order. It is a lengthy consent agenda today, Mr. Chairman, so bear with me as we work through it. The first case recommended for consent agenda is case 2018-86, involving the property at 1618 Dr. D.B. Todd Jr. Boulevard. This is a sidewalk variance request. The appellant has agreed to follow the planning department's recommendations on this affordable housing project. The second case recommended for consent is case number 2018-87, involving the property at 1612 Dr. D.B. Todd Jr. Boulevard. Also a sidewalk request and an affordable housing project. Case number 2018-88 is next at 919 43rd Avenue North. Is a sidewalk variance request, an affordable housing project, and as with the first two, the appellants have agreed to meet the planning department's recommendations. The next case on the consent agenda is 2018-089, involving the property at 2018 14th Avenue North, a, variant, a sidewalk variance request, an affordable housing project. The appellant has agreed to meet the planning department's recommendations. The next case recommended for consent agenda is case number 2018-188, involving the property at 3910 Nevada Avenue, a sidewalk variance request stemming from recent fire damage to the residents. That case has been recommended for consent agenda. Next is case number 2018-193, involving the property at 2444 Pulley Road. It's a request for a side setback variance. Uh, that case has been recommended for the consent agenda. Among the cases that I've identified at this point, Cases 86, 87, 88, 89, 188, and 193. Is there anyone in here in opposition to one of those six cases? Seeing none, each of them will be recommended for the consent agenda. I'll continue with the list, Mr. Chairman. The next case on consent agenda is case number 2018-195, involving the property of 109 C. McGavick Pike, a sidewalk variance request. That case has been recommended for consent agenda based in part upon the appellant's agreement to follow planning department's recommendations. Anyone here in opposition to case number 195? Seeing none, the next case is 2018-197. Involving the property at 226 Duke Street, a request for a change in legally non-conforming use in the R6A zoning district. Uh, is there anyone here in opposition to case number 197? <clears throat> Seeing no one. The next case recommended for consent agenda is 2018-206, involving the property at 633 Cherry Glen Drive, a request for a variance from setback requirements. Is there anyone here in opposition to case number 206? Seeing none, the next case on the consent agenda is number 2018-207, involving the property at 3410 West End Avenue, request for a variance from queuing requirements. Is there anyone here in opposition to case number 207? Seeing none, the next case recommended for consent agenda is number 2018-209, involving the property at 2805 Clarksville Pike, a request for a variance from distance requirements for the commercial use. Is there anyone here in opposition to case number 209? Seeing none, the next case recommended is 2018-210, involving the property at 620 Crowley Drive, a request for special exception involving height in the RM20 zoning district. Is there anyone here in opposition to case number 210? Seeing none, the next case recommended for consent agenda is 2018-211, involving the property at 622 Crowley Drive, a height special exception and variance for building separation in the multifamily development. 
Is there anyone here in opposition to case number 211? Seeing none, the next case recommended for consent is number 2018-212, uh, involving the property at 2601 Greer Road, a request for special exception for religious institution use. Is there anyone here in opposition to case number 212? Seeing none. The final case recommended for consent agenda is number 2018-214, involving the property at 418 Brewer Road, uh, request for variance from sidewalk and buffer requirements. Um, the appellant agrees to follow the planning department's recommendation, dedication of right-of-way, another affordable housing project. Is there anyone here in opposition to case number 214? Seeing none, Mr. Chairman, you have a complete consent agenda. I'll recap that for the benefit of our record. The consent agenda, as moved, will include cases number 86, 87, 88, and 89, cases number 188, 193, 195, 197, cases number 206, 207, 209, 210, 211, cases 212 and 214. Staff would humbly request a motion on that consent agenda. Okay, the following cases that John Michael read have now been moved to the consent agenda. Is there a second? Second. Motion's been made and properly seconded. Any discussion about the consent agenda? Seeing none, all those in favor of the motion signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Consent agenda passes unanimously. As there are many people on the consent <coughs> agenda, and many of them present at this time, you are now free to leave. Your case has been approved. Although you are free to stay, given that we have a, a certain premium on seating today, it might be appreciated if uh, you joined us another time if you had a different case. So again, for those approved on consent agenda, your case is approved, you're free to go. You can see the code staff as early as tomorrow to obtain or start working on obtaining your permit. John Michael, before we get started, um, can you explain to everyone, this is our third meeting this month and we missed a meeting last month because our election, and of course right now we have an election going on on May 24th, go vote, early voting ends this Saturday. We have many sites across the county, so do your civic duty, but that's why we're not in Sunny West today because early voting is right over there, and hopefully there are as many people early voting today over there right now than they're in this room. So. That's right, and we'll encourage everyone here today, if they haven't already, if they are Davidson County residents and registered voters, to get over and vote today. As you're right here on campus, might as well take advantage. So John Michael, tell us how many meet, how many items on the agenda we've had for this month compared to previous, just the whole year. Um, Mr. Idea. Chairman, the ballpark estimate is we're going to hear approximately 100 cases in these three month meetings in May. That's May 3rd, May 10th, and May 17th. So in a 15-day window, hitting around 100 cases, that was more than the BZA heard in the entirety of the year 2012. Um, and as recently as 2014, we weren't hearing much more than that, somewhere around 120 or so. So we are operating at literally record volumes before this board with the boom that is taking place with regard to development, with changes to the sidewalk wall, with the introduction of the short-term rental regulations and the fact that the board hears those. We're hearing more than ever. And it's uh, uh, my, my appreciation is to the board for their uncommonly long hours in preparation and uncommonly long hours in hearing the cases here at the board meetings and even more so to the staff that works with me as they spend all the truly hard hours preparing each of the cases. Yes, this is the kind of amount of paperwork we have for this meeting alone. So uh, we appreciate the hard work that you and your staff have done, John Michael, too, as well, to get us here. So thank you. Mr. Chairman, there are a few oh. cases at the top of our agenda today that um, have been heard previously but failed to obtain the required four votes for a motion one way or the other. Those will be taken up by the board first. The first such case on the docket I've referred to as a case that's going to be deferred by agreement. And I see, I saw a counsel for the case a moment ago. That's case 2018-47. It is an item A case involving short-term rental permits at the property uh, located at 2225 10th Avenue South. Four specific units and four related uh, short-term rental permits in, in particular. Having conferred with counsel for that case, Mr. Collins and I agree that with the state law likely to be in hand in a matter of hours, with at least days on the long end, um, it is wise for the board to consider another deferral, as you did at your May 3rd meeting, based upon the likely effect that the state law will have on this particular case. However, Mr. Collins is here today, and it's only appropriate to hear from him with regard to that deferral. Sure, Mr. Collins, thank you for being here, and thank you for voting. Uh, so we're back, and you wish for another deferral? Yes, it's my understanding on authority that it was signed this morning by the governor, the law that would apply to this case before he dedicated the metrology laboratory today. 
but um, I don't have a copy of that in hand, so I think it would be beneficial to both myself and uh, counsel for this board if we were able to have that hard copy before we okay. go forward. So uh, we'll just defer it one more meeting and that should take care of us or? The board has the opportunity if they wish to defer indefinitely and okay. allow us to just schedule okay. this at the first well, available meeting. Okay, so I move that we uh, defer this indefinitely. Is there a second? Second. Motion has been made and properly seconded. Any more discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor of the motion signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Passes. Good luck. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, the next item on the board's docket for today is case number 2018-147. This involves the property at 852 First Avenue North. Ms. Kim Eldridge is the appellant. You heard this case and closed the public hearing at the end of that hearing uh, at our last board meeting on May the 10th, 2017, or 2018. However, the uh, board failed to find four votes in support of a motion at that time. Therefore, the board has the opportunity to hear this case again today and take four votes. It is my recollection that Ms. Karpinek was not present for the proceedings at that time. So for the benefit of our record, Ms. Karpinek, I'll ask first, have you had the opportunity to review the case file for this matter? Yes. Have you also had the opportunity to review the video because you have the full transcript for the matter? Yes. And are you prepared to participate in the vote on the case today? Yes. Now. Mr. Chairman, it's also my understanding that there had been uh, at least consideration of a request to defer this case based upon the open proceedings in environmental court. I know one of the discussions at the last board meeting was to allow the matter to go to its scheduled date in environmental court, which was yesterday, May the 16th. However, it's my understanding, based upon having conferred with the Metro Legal Department, that that matter was not resolved yesterday, but in fact uh, continued to a later date. So the board does not have the benefit of that guidance from the court with regard to this case. However, this of course operates on its own separate track and does not prevent the board from taking any sort of decisive action today on the case, at least procedurally. So is there a reason that environmental court didn't hear the case yesterday? What are we waiting on? I only speak to my understanding from Metro Legal, and then you may want to hear from Mr. McMullen, counsel for the appellant in this case, who, as I understand it, is also counsel for our appellant uh, on, as the defendant in the environmental court proceedings. Uh, I believe there was still an outstanding subpoena due to with regard to some documents that the city had requested but not yet received. So doubtless some of the questions raised at the board's proceedings on May the 10th would be at least in part answered by those documents if, in fact, they were in hand. Uh, again, I, I should allow okay. Mr. McMullen to speak to that okay. first time. Please introduce yourself for the record. <coughs> and address and sure. Thank you. Uh, Austin McMullen, 1600 Division Street, on behalf of Mrs. Eldridge. Um, we did go to court yesterday. Um, we did talk about production of some documents and as well uh, just other matters the court had on the docket went late in the day. And so the court uh, is going to get back to us with another date. Uh, the documents that were being discussed actually were, would address some of the issues that I think the board, this board expressed some confusion about previously, specifically the question of whether Mrs. Eldridge had continued to rent the unit after learning from Mr. Michael that her renewal was not going to be granted. And in fact, we have those documents here today, which would show that she stopped, um, I believe the last rental ended on January the 31st. Um, and the letter from Mr. Michael came on February the 19th. And so, so we have are, that information. Are these the documents that you were going to give to the court, the uh, exact same documents? This, these are among the documents and that I intend but to, to is, is provide. Is there still additional discovery. documents covered by the subpoena from the court that aren't included in there? There are, most of the rest of the documents are already in Metro's possession with respect to just, and, and the advertisements that are the court is requesting are also in these documents. But are there um, some additional documents that you don't have the, there today? Uh, I believe these are, are all covered by the seeing. subpoena. You didn't, do you have any emails about the permits that haven't been provided already? No. Okay, then these are all the documents. Um, the court's requiring copies of advertisements, which we have, uh, the transaction history, which we have. Um, the court asked us to provide copies of renewals, which those are already in Metro's files and have been provided. And then if there were any emails about that Ms. Elders may have had with anyone about the permits, and those would have just been with Metro, and those are in Metro's file as well. So these are the documents that would be responsive to what the court has requested. And, and really the important thing, I think, is they address the confusion that the court, or that the BZA had previously about whether she had rented after getting Mr. Michael's letter. And then there was some confusion about these different units because there was one that was a phony 
advertisement that was out there that had her um, address on it. There was another one that was her brother's unit, and I have those here so that I could show you okay. that would explain that situation. Okay, so board members, this is going to come to us at the very end. We haven't reviewed any of this. Uh, we have an, a, a, another vote a member that didn't participate. What is your thoughts on how to proceed? Uh, Go ahead. Well, I don't know. I, I think it's hard to look at documents when they're handed to us mm -hmm. right now. Uh, is the environmental court case set? It was. So they deferred yesterday and it's just off in the future? Right. The judge was going to get back to us with available dates. Well, I mean, I guess if, if, if the case was left with a 3 1 vote? Yes. Or. 3 2 vote. I just left it last night. Yeah. 3 2 4. And the penalty was. And the three key votes was eight months or eight months. Okay. Seven. I believe it was seven. seven. Okay, seven. Let's hear from our lawyer. So, can you shed any light on all of this? Well, in, in this particular case, there was actually a hearing. Um, you all heard. Okay, so that triggered, in my opinion, that triggered 174240, which says that if uh, failure to receive four affirmative votes within 30 days of a hearing shall be deemed a denial. So you could, you could not make a decision today, but if you did, according to this, that's going to automatically be a denial um, of, the, of the administrative uh, appeal under item A. So okay. that's the provision what, of this as it applies to this board. What if we defer? Does that, does that stop the clock? It, it doesn't because you've already had a hearing. Okay. If, you, if you defer, like in the last case we just had, you all haven't heard that case. So that one has been deferred a couple of times by agreement, which is fine because this provision is not triggered until after a hearing. What if, uh, what if there's new evidence? As obviously, well, if that gets submitted, can, what are the possible ways to stop the clock? For for this, it doesn't speak for, to to any way to stop the clock specifically under this provision. Um, it just says that, you know, failure to receive the four affirmative votes within 30 days of the hearing shall be deemed a denial. So there was an opportunity to stop the clock before the clock started ticking at the last hearing when there was a request for a deferral. That was the time to stop the clock. When did, when did the environmental court ask for these documents? Yesterday. You, so they, you, they did not ask for them at all until yesterday, until you got there. there was, uh, Metro had sent a subpoena that Ms. Eldridge received on Friday of last week, yeah. and we went into court yesterday to discuss what would have to be produced under that subpoena. And yesterday afternoon, the court decided that we did need to provide some of the documents and others were not relevant and did not need to be provided. But the subpoena didn't say what the documents were. Yes, it was a list of documents that, that was attached to the subpoena, and the court decided okay, you, need, you do need to provide some of those and other ones aren't relevant and you don't need to provide those. And that was what happened yesterday afternoon. Okay. With respect to, to the 30 days, I thought that it would be 30 days from when the hearing was, and that hearing was a week ago, so the 30 days hasn't run out yet for the BZA to make my, its decision. My, my personal inclination is to defer this if it exists. Okay. Before we do, I want to hear from Mr. Osborne, who has been very uh, involved in this case, and please get in front of somebody's microphone because our Metro National Network people want to hear you. So on May 4th, I know that, hang on. Just, and, and our counsel is right, it's 30 days, uh, within 30 days of the hearing. The problem we run into sometimes is the scheduling of the BZA meetings and whether or not there will be another meeting right. bet before the 30 days uh, from the last hearing. Our next place. meeting, so. John Michael, for the Board of Zoning Appeals is? June 7th. Okay. Within the 30 days. Mr. Osborne, please get in front of somebody's mic and I want to hear uh, your take on this. On May 4th, Kate Pham did send an email to Austin McMullen asking for those specific documents um, re regarding the subpoena. That was a lawyer from Metro? For Metro, okay. yes, sir. So does that answer your question? On May 4th. Yes, sir. So I have a procedural question. Yes, sir. Uh, if, if Ms. Kaepernick has has reviewed the material and, and wants to add a vote or register her vote, does everybody, I mean, she can just do that. It, the, the original voting members don't all have to be present. No, but there's also, you can change your vote too. You're allowed right. during this period of time to change your vote. Well, the, yeah. but, but uh, the Sanford would still have that opportunity if, if she decided to change her vote. I'm saying, this, under the scenario I'm asking about is if, if she registered her vote today, mm -hmm. uh, 
potentially could resolve it, but there's still a flag ticking on any of us could change our vote after that. It, it only only if they're not for affirmative votes. So if her vote adding to the or vote, that, that ends it. If, if it, depending on which way she okay. votes. Uh, so she could potentially end it today where no one could change their vote afterwards, even though the 30 days continues, because that is the final action of the board. But if she votes uh, say it's two or three again, then it could then foreseeably within the 30 days someone could change their vote and if, if she votes to make it three three, then everyone can still change their vote or yeah. another vote oh. can be added. But Correct. if she's vote number four, then it's just done. Then that's, that's it. Right. Okay. And so, I, I'm almost. I mean, I'm I'm inclined to just defer it, uh, even if it expires uh, and it's denied. They can present new information, but we had specifically. Deferred it, or we specifically did, uh, were headed toward. We didn't take another vote or resolve it, let it linger because we really wanted it. I thought in the discussion to go to environmental court. Uh, it sounds like that um, there was quite a bit of time. I mean, I think I think to have the information for environmental court, and 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 maybe rightly so, they they chose to to uh, discuss and 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 figure out which is relevant and which isn't. But that was their choice, and so I don't know that we. To me, I'm, I'm perfectly comfortable just just letting this linger. Okay. So, but if, if if we want to vote on the seven months, and, and that's how. You, you so let me ask one vote, more question about that. Uh, one other possible. Uh, if obviously they can, if if they're denied, uh, their options to to refile an appeal would be based on new evidence that was not available. Well. And, and so I'm, I'm going to talk about terms just a little bit. So they could always file uh, a motion for rehearing under your board rules based on new information or new evidence that was unavailable at the time of the hearing, uh, so long as I believe that it, it was uh, submitted by someone who participated in the, in the hearing. And there's no time? Uh, 60 days. But within 60 days? Correct. So it can be done before the 60 days? Okay. Yeah, mm -hmm, okay. absolutely. Yeah. And, and what, so Mr. Taylor, um, were you one of the three people that voted? I was one of the three, and I'm not sure okay, I'll so sit there because I, I really, I really not sure. I mean, the more I hear about this, okay. the more I think so that, I, that so we were too lenient. The reason I'm asking the that is because if we hear from our board member that was not here, and she participates, she could potentially be the fourth vote, and then it's decided. So this is the opportunity. If anybody wants to change their vote on this case, right now. Well, I mean. It, I mean, I've stated how I feel about it. I, I, I'm, I would prefer to, to uh, defer the case. Well, let um, me add, John Michael. Last time you took the vote, you failed to get four votes, so you can make a fresh motion. Correct. There's you no standing motion. motion on the table. Okay, so we can make a fresh motion. Yes. And then just see where it goes. Okay. But only four of us are. Well, we're all eligible for we're, this. Cindy, we're here for the. Mm -hmm. Oh, yep. I'm sorry. Okay, so I'm going to okay. call for a new motion on this case. which also can include a deferred. So, I'm sorry, one more procedural question. <laughs> By accepting a new motion, does the does the old motion die? The yes. old motion died at the last meeting when it didn't get the requisite number of votes. <clears throat> okay. So, um, I don't understand. Ms. Sanford's not here. She's not able to vote on a new motion today. Right. You're saying we have to make a new motion, so does her vote count or not count? If we from make the, the last exact... Meeting, mm -hmm. Her vote from the last meeting does not count. It would be whatever your your vote is today. But she could still add a vote if, next if, time. If it's hung up. Yeah. If it's hung up, if it's hung up, and you all defer it to the next meeting, and that meeting is within the 30 days, then she's eligible to vote. Also, assuming that she reviews the information from today. I, I, I'll move that we defer this to the first meeting of June. I'll second. Is that okay? And motion then, been made and probably yeah. seconded. Um, Mr. Osborne. Yes, sir. When, would, when did this case get scheduled again to environmental court? Do you know? The next, the original court date or this, this next new. The new one? It uh, was deferred basically until the judge can get a courtroom for us, maybe specially set. Maybe set so on that, Wednesday we normally have court. It just kind of so signed a specific. What are the meeting. odds of that happening before our next meeting for the BZA? Mm, I, I believe I heard Mr. McMullen and Kay talking about scheduling. I know she's due for a vacation or out a week. Um, okay. 
in the so June and we're just deferring at one meeting. It doesn't look like that's going to solve this problem with then environmental. Then we can uh, I'll then defer and move uh, if you will withdraw your second to the second meeting of June. Okay. That's a month. Motion has been made and, second and properly well, seconded. What, question, if it, it pleases the board, mm -hmm. is the second that. meeting of June outside the scope of the 30 days? I would imagine it, it is. Then it they, is. Then I think okay. that they can make a motion for a rehearing based on new evidence. But either way, they're going to submit new evidence to us. Okay. So and that was well, your concern that, that, we, that, that we're getting, you know, all of a sudden we're getting more information and, you know, it, it, so just procedurally, if I'm understanding everything correctly, if, if the board votes for the second meeting in June, which is outside the scope of the 30 days since the first hearing, that's going to automatically result in a denial by operation of law, which means that the status quo remains, which is that the applicant does not have a permit. It is denied for a year. So I just want to make sure that that everyone understands that, and particularly the board. John, do you have anything to add to, to that piece of it? Not necessarily. Okay. okay. I know I said one more procedural question, but I have one more procedural <laughs> question. Can, can we not just reopen the case and leave it open? I can answer that one okay. for counsel. Mr. Harper, yes, you can. It's strongly recommended that you do so. If you choose to reopen it, reopen it at a later date. Counsel's doubtless not had the opportunity to prepare for a fresh hearing on this. Uh, nor has the city been prepared to present the case all over again. It's totally doable, but we would ask that it be done at the next board meeting. So, do you see where I'm going with this? And so if we, the board understands what I'm saying. One, one meeting and then reopen the case to hear at the next meeting? Well, I think, I think what I'm asking and saying is that if, if we open the case, then it's, it's not resolved, it's an ongoing case, so the 30 days can't run. But the whole concern is it's not going to do us any good for environmental court. They're not going to meet between now and then. So if that's a consideration. It's, it's highly unlikely. I don't practice in environmental court anymore, but, but I am familiar with it. And it is one of the, the um, matters that, that I work with um, from time to time. It, it is unlikely that we will get more than one special setting and the environmental court's busy because they're dealing with lots of Airbnb, I mean, short-term rental violations. They, they, you know, we could get it set if, if the judge agrees to set, hear it, and can find a courtroom and opposing counsel is available and Metro is available. It could happen, uh, but it's not likely to happen probably, uh, at least uh, certainly not before the first meeting. It may have happened before the second meeting in June. Okay, board members, what are we going to do? I just have another, I have a question as to that. If, as Mr. Michael suggested, we were inclined to reopen the meeting and we did so at a later date and we came back at the later date and deferred it indefinitely because it was in an open meeting, then we're not held, then environmental court has time to meet and we can determine what they do. That's a possibility. Okay. Okay. Anyone want to make a motion? I'd well, make that motion. Well, do we need to withdraw the previous motion? I'll withdraw that yes. motion and second your motion. Okay. Motion's withdrawn. Civics, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, I would make a motion that we defer this case one meeting uh, so that we can reopen the hearing and make a decision at that time as to whether to hear or defer indefinitely. I'll second. Okay, motion's been made and properly seconded. Any more discussion? Everyone understand what this motion is. All those in favor of the motion signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Passes unanimously. It's deferred one meeting. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, before moving into the cases that might involve uh, actual reopening and hearing other new facts today, we'll take this opportunity to hear from the Metro Council members who are present with us. The first one that joins us in respect for ladies first is Council Member Karen Johnson, who's been in the audience. Is Council Member Johnson still in the room? Yes, Council I'm a, I'm a yes. Council Lady, you come to the Yeah, I, I'm going to give the Councilman Brett Withers. He has a special <coughs> circumstance with his employment. Okay. Okay. Councilman Withers, please come forward. Thank you. Always good to hear from our six so council district council person. So. Register of Deeds Council. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and thank you so much for all your uh, work on all of these cases. Um, I am Councilmember Brett Withers, the representative from Metro Council District 6. There are three District 6 items on your agenda today, and I'm just going to speak on those briefly. 
Um, the first one is for uh, is case number 2018-180 for property located at 1007 Clearview Avenue. This is a, a short-term rental case. Um, I don't. I know actually know the um, the. The property owners. I haven't had specific uh, correspondence or discussion with them about this case. It would appear to be a pretty standard um, short-term rental case um, for the viewing audience and for those present. I just want to uh, let everyone know that this property does have commercial zoning. It is a house, but it has uh, commercial zoning, and so um, it is eligible for um, a Type Two ownership. Um, both under Bill 608 as well as under the uh, latest um, legislation that the state uh, passed, I believe. So you, you support? Exactly, yeah. I mean, I, I know that you have a procedure for reviewing, uh, evaluating uh, cases in which folks were found to be operating without permits. And like I said, there's, there's no, um, I don't have constituent complaints or specific circumstances to, to uh, present on that one. So that. I'm okay with uh, granting that permit. Um, my next one uh, is case 2018-198. Uh, this is for property located at 1514 McKinney Avenue. Uh, that's in my neighborhood of Eastwood. Um, this is a case, this is another short-term rental case. Um, in which there appears to have been some confusion or cross-communication uh, between the applicants, um, host compliance, and the staff. Uh, so it is a type one, it's owner-occupied. The uh, individuals had uh, previously applied for a permit as far back as March of 17. As I mentioned, there's, there are some mitigating circumstances with regard to cross communication, uh, and for this one, I would also support uh, granting the permit effective tomorrow. And, and then there's one more for District 6, which is a sidewalk, as well as a setback. Um, this is, I'm trying to find the number, it's for property located on Truett Avenue. I'm trying to find that one. 217. Thank you, yes. Um, this is uh, an application to, um, there's an existing home on the lot. It does have duplex zoning. It's an application to be able to construct a home in the, at the rear portion of the lot, which is a corner lot. Of course, that is allowed uh, in duplex zoning. This is not inside of the conservation overlay that encompasses almost all the rest of that neighborhood, but this particular block is outside of that. Uh, so therefore, detached duplexes are permitted uh, by law, but in order to make that uh, work well, they're requesting a uh, setback variance. I'm fine with the setback variance. I've heard no objections from neighbors. Uh, I'm specifically speaking to the sidewalk piece. Um, the request, as I understand it, is neither to uh, construct the sidewalk um, per the sidewalk ordinance nor to contribute to the in lieu fee. And that's what I can't support. The um, planning staff recommendation is to disapprove the variance as Mr. Harper lives in that area and is familiar with. Um, it is an area that actually has a, a high volume of pedestrian traffic, um, and the streets are quite narrow and currently lack uh, sidewalks in a lot of those areas. As you get back into where the Rolling Acres neighborhood joins in with uh, the Little Hollywood area of Lachlan Springs in an area kind of behind the Walden development, there's a lot going on right in there. The streets are very narrow. Um, and. Um, frankly, it's an area where we really need the sidewalks to be constructed. Uh, if the applicant is uh, unable to uh, do that at this time due to waiting on utility pole relocations and things like that, which certainly Metro deals with as well, I would be possibly amenable to allowing a sidewalk uh, in Luffy contribution, at least to help us fund some other sidewalks in that uh, general area. But uh, I, I agree with staff that in it, uh, that we would need either the sidewalks to be constructed or an in-lieu fee to be contributed uh, for that area because it is such a critical area for pedestrians. Okay, great. Any questions of Councilman Withers? Great. Thank, Thank you, you so much. Here. Councilman Johnson. Councilman Karen Johnson. And then congratulations on your um, yeah. you know, your victory. Thank and you. Um, if people don't know, Councilor Johnson used to be on this very board Yay. many years ago. So <laughs> welcome back to the BZA. 
We have two former BZA people in the Metro Council, Councilman Bedney too, so uh, you never know board members what your future will be, so Councilman Johnson. Thank you, Chair Ewing and Vice Chair uh, Taylor and esteemed uh, board members. Uh, I'm Karen Johnson, Councilwoman District 29. I respect the work that you do on this board. It's incredibly important. And I uh, appreciate you listening to my concerns today on behalf of my constituents in District 29. I'm here on case 2018-219. And uh, this is where uh, the appellant is requesting a variance from parking requirements in the R10 district to construct two single family houses. I looked at the um, request for the variance and uh, what is concerning is one, they did not contact me uh, to discuss this because it does have an impact um, on uh, traffic and safety. And that's one of the reasons why I'm here today. I don't come very often, as you know. And so uh, the reason why this one is in particular a concern to the community is because of where it's situated. Anderson Road does not have sidewalks. Um, it is heavily traveled as a main thoroughfare, um, and uh, there are a lot of traffic concerns, a lot of congestion in this particular area. So granting a variance from this applicant uh, from being able to have parking in the rear of the property would create traffic and safety issues for motorists and pedestrians um, that frequent that area. So that is the reason why I'm here today to ask that you not approve the variance. Uh, what I believe they need to do is they need to rework their plan, um, get with me as the council person for the area to see what the other alternatives would be uh, than to have um, parking off of Anderson Road. Um, and so uh, that's all the comments that I have. And, do you all have any questions? Yeah, I have for a me? question. So okay. you said they haven't contacted you. You expressed an interest in working with them. Mm -hmm. And I'm thinking about another former BCA member and a former Metro Council person, Chris Whitson, who if he was sitting here, he'd say, why don't we defer this and you talk to the people and see what you could come up with. Is the applicant here right now? Yes. Okay. Would you defer the case and meet with your council person? I'd be glad to. I'm sorry that I did not get that done. I thought from other comments to me that, that I'd be on a consent agenda. I, I'm sorry I did not get with you, but I'll get with you. I'd be glad to defer. You know, and, 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 and this case had a lot of neighbors in opposition. I mean, we, it's rare we get the, the level of neighbor uh, letters. And uh, how many people here today are in opposition to this particular case? Okay, we have fun. Okay. So, Mr. Uh, Chairman, I just know there are others here who, uh, some of whom had very, very small babies, and I encouraged to take a breather outside because um, okay. I didn't think we'd get to this case for hours. But okay. there are others present in opposition also. So, board members, what do we think of uh, having the two sides do you, meet? Do you think that you, the first meet, or well, let's ask, we'll is there a, the first meeting or second do meeting? Do we have you, space? Is there a better? That first, how many cases do we have scheduled for the first uh, meeting? Metropolitan government record of 62 have been filed for that period, Mr. Chairman. So, so no, bring so your dinner. Because, we because it's June not 21. of an urgent nature, in our view, we would prefer not to be um, deferred to that meeting. I would request that it be deferred to the meeting thereafter. That gives what, us what plenty of time. The second meeting. It's the second 21. meeting. June 21? Yes. Okay. I'll move that we defer this case to June 21st. Okay. Motion's been made. Is there a second? I'll second. Motion's been made and properly seconded. Any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor of the motion signify by saying aye. 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 Pose. Passes. Thank you so much. Thank you for you, being here. Let the folks outside know if there's yes. anybody waiting and on And maybe have your first conversation on your way Thank out you. with I the will. applicant. Thank you. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Mr. Chairman, we're also joined by Councilman Jeff Syracuse from Council District Number 15. Councilman Syracuse. Councilman Syracuse, before you get started on whatever case you're here for today, I saw you on the news last night talking about a, um, a short-term rental that I'm very pleased to report that Metro acted very quickly on and it's moving steps to revoke their permit. Yes. Tell us about that. I mean, this seemed just outrageous and um, 
what you know and what do we need to know about some of these worst cases? Sure, no, thank you. Um, I don't believe that we've ever had a situation like this on either like VRBO or Airbnb, but re refresh my memory on the uh, company that was like new uh, Red Arrow. Uh, Red. John would know. Red Awning. Uh, Red, Red Awning. Red, Red, Red Awning. They need to be looked at about their processes and procedures for how they are vetting out uh, people who are living. So you're saying if, I, if someone signs up for Airbnb or VRBO, there's a little bit of vetting, a little bit of background, but this other is just post a listing and pay. And it sound like credit card only, and, uh, and, and that was it. They were underage. Um, where so the people that don't know, what happened? Um, it was uh, a, a party in, in the Pennington Bend area on, on Miami a Avenue. Party? How many people? Um, over 100 on a small street um, at the very end of, of Pennington Bend. So this is um, a neighborhood. These this, are people this, living next door to 100 people show up. Absolutely. Loud, outside. Yeah. And not only was there a party with drugs, but somebody brought an AK-47 and shot up the house. Um, so In a residential neighborhood in the city. In a residential I mean, neighborhood. this is outrageous. It's absolutely outrageous. So uh, I know it's an ongoing investigation with uh, Hermitage Precincts. I've been in you know, direct contact with them for sure. Um, very thankful for codes for taking a quick action for, for writing a letter to, uh, and revoking their permit. Of course, they patched up the holes and put a new listing on VRBO. So, uh, you know, I've asked. Well, that's a separate violation. I'm sure Mr. Osborne right. over there will be yes. dealing with that in whatever way we can. I appreciate you asking about that. Yeah, that's uh, to say it's disconcerting is uh, an understatement for sure. And thank you yeah. for bringing that to our attention and, yeah. and being an advocate for, you know, safe neighborhoods. And, you know, there's there's got to be a better way. So Amen. thank you, Councilman Syracuse. Thank you, Mr. Chair, Commissioners. Um, Hope everybody's doing well. I'm here about uh, BZA case 2018-053, uh, 2124 Wooddale Lane. Uh, sidewalk variance. Um, I'll be honest, this is the most unpopular sidewalk that I've dealt with uh, in, in my term. Uh, the same area we were just talking about, about the, uh, uh, that, that short-term rental, it's not too far from this. Um, residential area, however, almost country back roads, if, if you will. There are no sidewalks in that area, and believe it or not, the residents like it that way. Uh, very quiet, except for short-term rental, rental issues and whatnot. Um, this is uh, a couple who just wants to build one home on a very large uh, lot, but it has uh, significant stormwater issues. Um, it's on the corners uh, of Pennington Bend and, and Wooddale, and I'm thankful that uh, planning did suggest that uh, Pennington Bend had significant stormwater issues to, to do a sidewalk there, even a, uh, an alternative construction would not be a good idea. And so they're recommending that um, you all approve the variance for the Pennington Bend piece, but they're also suggesting an alternative um, uh, construction for the Wooddale Lane piece, which quite honestly, be, especially because the, the Pennington Bend uh, variance was recommended for approval, it would be a permanent sidewalk to nowhere. So it would not even uh, uh, facilitate future ex extensions of sidewalks and walkability in an area, again, that neighbors don't want anyway. Um, so I'm, I am... Um, I'm, I'm supportive of, of the variance for, for sure, as are many, many neighbors in, in that area. Um, so I, I would ask that you uh, approve the, the, the variance in, in total. Um, it's, it's a great couple that just wants to build one house, um, which is great because the, the, you know, it's a large lot, but there is a, you know, some stormwater issue, so one house is perfect. Um, and so I, I approve uh, of, of their variance request. And do you have any opinion about the fund? Um, you know, I, I would suggest, that especially because it's going to be a, almost a permanent sidewalk to nowhere, um, uh, require that they dedicate the, the, the right of way for any future project. But um, because, you know, I, it, one of the issues, of course, is that uh, where's that money going to go and when's it going to be there and, and, and whatnot, um, I, I don't even think that it's, it's, it's worthy. Okay. Uh, questions for Councilman Syracuse? If the funds were to go somewhere else in your district, would you support paying into the MA fund? It wouldn't go anywhere near that area that would that would benefit those residents because, uh, like I said, the, it, uh, that area is almost very country, way in the back at the very end of, of Pennington Bend. And I don't think that those residents would even see any benefit of them paying for um, a, a sidewalk that wouldn't be anywhere close to them. Yeah, and, and, and I appreciate it and, and just had a, a quick comment. The sidewalk was almost a year old. Uh, they, I think our chair reminds us uh, frequently that it got unanimous support. Sure. Um, and But it, a lot of this, a year old, uh, with appeals that come to us, you start to see what those issues are, and you're here with, a, with a, an issue. And as what one of the things that we've seen that I think would apply to this property, because it is an extraordinarily large lot, is that 
the in lieu fee uh, on some of these properties is many times uh, what your annual property tax is, yeah, which right. which many homeowners uh, you know feel is excessive. And so as as the council goes back and reviews what the problems are and tweaks tweaks it, uh, it would be really helpful to us if we had a, a different either scale for residential commercial or some other uh, means to help contribute to the sidewalk fund on these extraordinarily large properties. But uh, sometimes you have a 50 a 50 foot lot that has two homes on it. Sure. $3,000 a, a unit, maybe that's not uh, a big burden, but then other properties in your neighborhood are 150, 250 foot, you know, street frontage um, for the same size home. Sure. And all of a sudden you're looking at, you know, 50 to $80,000 uh, that, that is a, a real big difference. It, it may be outside the spirit of what they were, uh, what they were trying to do. But anyway, I, I appreciate you coming and, sure. and, and know you, you see that, but uh, again, we, we appreciate any tweaking to keep you know the, the level of appeals that we have uh, managed absolutely too. and i thank you for having to deal with all that i won't speak for uh, councilwoman henderson but she did obviously a fantastic job oh, yeah. of putting this bill together and i know that she's been working on you know looking at the cases right. and, and how we can make a little more maybe pragmatic tweaks to right. to, to this so right. yeah, thank, thank you, you. yeah appreciate it. any other right. questions from councilman we really right. appreciate you being you so there much. and uh, go after those lawbreakers amen there. thank <laughs> you appreciate it have a good day thanks john michael Mr. Chairman, we were also joined by Councilman Scott Davis from Council District Number Five. I don't see if he's in the room at the moment, uh, as he is not at the moment. I can call him up next time we're in between cases, I sure. suppose. Sure. Okay. And with that, Mr. Chairman, we'll circle back to the docket as presented. Page two, the second item is 2018-176. As the board will recall, this was heard at our last meeting. Public hearing was taken, but then closed. The case involves a property at 1943 Dabbs Avenue. This is the property owned and operated by the St. Mary Coptic Orthodox Church of Nashville. At our last board meeting, the board approved the um, motion to, well, approved the special exception for the religious institutional use on this property. The board also approved the sidewalk variance uh, on this case. What remains for the board to decide is first, the question of a height variance. And secondly, in conjunction with that construction of the building that would require the height variance, the expansion of the legally non-conforming structure, specifically the building in place exceeds the setback requirements, but is considered legally non-conforming, the new construction would meet that same property line, but require a board approval of the item D matter. So what the board will vote on today will be both the height variance and the item D matter. The board had asked for copies of the recent or prior orders given to this property from the BZA with regard to their projects. Um, I provided that earlier today to the representatives for the appealing party. Sorry that I didn't get that before today, but we did dig them up and find each of the four. I'll distribute those to the board while you're uh, taking up whatever questions you may have from the appellants. Did you have any issue with the four? Uh, no, sir. Others, um, Paula Hap with OHM Advisors, 209 10th Avenue South, representing St. Mary Church. Uh, there were four prior appeal cases. The original one in 2013 uh, was the 22,000 square foot building that was going to replace the one that burned down. Um, the appeal was uh, approved with two items, which was uh, permanently closed the entrance at Dabbs Court with an opaque fence, and then the other one was. Um, to take the ramp cut from the pavement line of Cur uh, Dabbs Court and make it a landscape strip. So um, both of those items were conditions, and if the plan had gone through, those items would have been put in place. As it is now, uh, the uh, St. Mary went ahead and closed that um, with a regular fence, um, so there is no um, entrance through there right now but they did not do the opaque fence or the landscape strip because they hadn't gone through with the project. So uh, the other appeal that had conditions was in 2014 and that was for a daycare. And that appeal had four conditions um, and that daycare did not um, happen either on the property. So those four conditions don't apply really to what we're talking about here. So we would be, we'd be more than happy to continue these conditions from the 2013 case um, and add them to these items today, and we would properly put them on the site plan and account for them. Okay. Other questions from the board about this? What are the 2015 conditions? The 2014, uh, the case in 2014 for the daycare was no dogs permitted. 
6 a.m. to 6 p.m. Monday through Friday only. Playground to be fenced and no spas or swimming pools. I'm sorry. I thought we had. I thought there was a uh, one after that. No, there was, uh, well, there was two 2014 cases, okay. but one of them might have bled over and actually taken place in 2015. So you don't, you don't need the, I mean, the, the, I mean, the, uh, the conditions for the daycare, you don't have a daycare, right? Right, there's so no the, daycare. So those really are not applicable. Exactly, so exactly. The, so we're really just talking about the two. From the 2013-088 case. Okay. And the church is not opposed to honoring those conditions? No, ma'am. Okay. Is there opposition here today, Representative, for this case? I guess not. Okay. We heard from the opposition <laughs> last case and um, has been kind of frequently involved with this over these many years. So, is there any other um, issues that need to come up and you have? the items of the conditions of the previous orders. Is there anything else that you would want to add or to consider? Um, was there more than this? Um, there, there's a, it's a bit here, so 2013-88 is what you, is the one that has the two conditions on it. I don't think they have that one. Well, the, the, the big stack went down. The big stack, oh, the big stack has, where's that? Are you sure? I don't know. Well, I just got that. Do you have the 88 in there? You say one? Oh, okay. No. Yeah, you can pass, pass that down to okay. David if you haven't seen it. Because here's the, this one has that on there. Do you have that? That's just for him. I know. I was just saying. <laughs> That's just the three. Okay. Anything else that you all need to raise or that's come up since the last meeting? Okay. Um. Well, I mean, we we had said last time we would just defer until we got these conditions, right? Right. So. And so here are the conditions. Yeah. So. So the relevant conditions, I guess, we need to, right, yeah. to talk about. Because that was for the daycare, and these right. are the only two for the. But, I mean, I'm 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 okay with moving for the uh, uh, approval of the item D of non-conforming use, and then also approving the um, height uh, setback uh, or the variance from height restrictions uh, for this uh, property based on the two conditions that were agreed to and appeal case. 2013-88, which are the entrance on Dabs Court will be permanently closed with an opaque fence at least eight feet uh, in height prior to the issu issuance of the UNO uh, and remove the ramp cut and replace with a uh, landscaping strip. Okay. Uh, motion's been made and properly seconded. Any more discussion? Just a point of um, administrative point. Do you need to ask me those three questions, John, in order to so I didn't realize you had to participate on this one as well. Oh. Ms. Carbonate, did you in fact review the entire case file for this case? Yes. Did you in fact review the video for the full transcript of the case? Yes. And are you prepared to vote on this matter today? And yes. Okay. <laughs> okay. Very good. So we have our motion and it's been seconded. Yes. See any more discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor of the motion signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Passes unanimously. Thank good, you. Luck. good luck. Thank you very much. Thank you. John Michael. Mr. Chairman, in a similar manner, case 2018-181, which involved the case at 448 Atlas Drive, also was heard by the board at our May 10th meeting, but also failed to get four affirmative votes on one of the two items that was sought before the board. There was a variance request from tree density requirements. The board has already taken its formal action on that matter and received a unanimous vote. But there was also a request for a sidewalk variance. So that matter remains open because there were not four affirmative votes. The board will have the opportunity to vote on that today. Uh, Ms. Chapel and or Ms. Karpenek, I don't remember who was present for that hearing. Have both of you, ha have either of you had the opportunity to review the case file and the video of the case? Yes. Yeah. With both affirming, are both of you uh, ready to participate in the vote today? 
Yes. yes. Very well, Mr. Chairman, with that, you'll have five members eligible to vote on this matter today. Again, Justin Crandall was the appellant on behalf of DBV Properties, LLC, the owner of the property at 448 Atlas. The original request was for a variance from a sidewalk requirement and from the tree density requirement. Again, the board's already voted to uh, deny the variance on the tree density requirement. Okay. And all that remains is for the board to determine what they is, want to do with the sidewalk. Is there a request. motion related to the sidewalk for today? Um, did, did you guys have any discussion that you wanted to interject? I don't know. Okay. I'm not after watching the hearing. Good call. <laughs> well, I'll move that we, uh, we, we grant the sidewalk variance uh, and that the applicant pay the in lieu fee. I'll second. Okay, motion's been made and seconded. Any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed? Okay, four to one. Okay. A short one. Recess. Yeah. John Michael, short recess. We will take a short recess and reconvene with the new hearings at the top of the docket, page three. The first will be case 2018-053 in about five minutes. Okay. Reconvene with today's BZA meeting. Our board is now reassembled and we'll pick up where we left off at case 2018-053. There's the zoning map shown here. Uh, Michael and Karen Angerol are the appellants and owners of this property at 2124 Wooddale Lane in Council District Number 16. You'll recall you heard from Council Member Syracuse just a short while ago with regard to this case. The request is for a variance from sidewalk requirements and this the R15 zoning district. It's a large track there in the center of the screen that is at issue along Wooddale near Pennington Bend. The site plan submitted shows, proposed, uh, shows the uh, uh, site plan that was submitted or rather the original survey and then from my site visit which took place probably a, a good month or more ago now but presumably the land has not changed since then near the intersection of Wooddale and Pennington Bend you see the long drag along where there's an established ditch line signs properly posted in the upper left hand corner the uh, peak that's formed there at the intersection of those streets and the view across the street into the residential area and a little closer to the interior of the lot as shown in the lower right hand corner with that slide the appellants are present and have uh, worked extensively, Mr. Chairman, with the planning department with regard to their sidewalk request and trying to come up with the best plan possible. They have reached out to their district council member and been engaged with the community to some extent. There has been opposition submitted at times during the course of this case, as indicated by the number. This is one that we've been, we've had in hand for quite a while, but they're ready to proceed today. Okay. So with that, we'll hear from the appellants, Mr. and Ms. Angrel, if you would just introduce yourselves by name and home address. How are you doing? Uh, my name is Mike Angerol, 2124 Wooddale Lane. Uh, Karen Angerol, 2124 Wooddale Lane. Okay, is there anyone here in opposition today? Okay. Please present your case and um, tell us why you're here. Sure. Before addressing specifics, I'd like to clarify the fact that we by no means represent a development company. I'm simply a retired fighter pilot. My wife and my elderly mom want to build a home, a home to live in, retire in on the five acre parcel that you, you see on the, the wall back behind me here. One home, one family, that's it. In the next few minutes, I'll provide uh, findings of facts that can be applied to and probably satisfy all seven, the standards necessary to grant a variance. Hopefully you, you received the sketch, I think, and, and in addition to that, a blown up cutaway view that'll help you view the area of the suggested sidewalk. As you know, planning has suggested that an alternative sidewalk be placed away from the current paved street on the inside of the power line poles along Wooddale Lane. This places the 915 foot stretch of concrete an additional 15 feet into our personal property. By the way, the area that we would not be able to use uh, by virtue of this sidewalk equates to about 14,000 square feet. That's two whole lots in East Nashville. Now Wooddale Lane has a uh, somewhat of a non-standard non uh, right away being 30 feet fairly narrow for Nashville standards which is usually 40 to 50 feet the physical pavement of Wooddale Lane which is only 21 feet is not even physically centered on the right of way as a matter of fact it veers off the center of the right of way and goes into and along our platted property line for three quarters of the length down Wooddale Lane what does this mean why is it important to us the right of way normally allows for sidewalk drainage and uh, infrastructure to be built contiguous to a paved street. Um, but uh, it normally, it normally uh, 
normally doesn't impose on the platted property line uh, along which it runs. In our case, we'd be required to construct an entirely or an entity for public use completely on private property, significantly outside the right of way. Okay, so what are you suggesting as to that? What are you suggesting? I'm suggesting that we offer uh, a permanent right of way to Metro of 10 feet okay. to, in to increase the right of way along Wooddale Lane such that a sidewalk or uh, stormwater uh, infrastructure can be put in any time in the near future or whenever decided. And we heard from your council person you have his enthusiastic support yes, for sir. this request given the location of this and the size of the lot too. Are there any questions from our board members? Yeah, there are a lot of other letters in support as well. Yes. Can I say one other thing? Of course so you just can. clear for you all? Yes. Um, the pay and lieu fee, mm -hmm. that's, a, that's a big deal. I know that, uh, well, I'm not going to, the pay and lieu fee at $170 a linear foot, in this case, mm -hmm. at 915 feet, it's about $164,000. That used to be a house in Nashville. Yeah. yeah. But I'm just saying yeah. that it's not, it's, it's not that, I know we can't say that solely as a case. I realize that. I know, I know. But there's, there's stormwater but issues. Once again, you have the enthusiastic support of your council person. Uh, any other questions for the applicant? We appreciate your service to our country. We Thanks, appreciate sir. you being here. And um, thank you for working with your neighbors and your councilmen on this. We're going to close the public hearing. Um, I'll move that we approve the sidewalk variance uh, with the condition that uh, the applicant agreed to a 10 foot uh, right of way uh, for any future sidewalk or stormwater development. Thank you. Add in your motion, it's both street frontages. Is that what you mean? On both, yeah, on 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 the on the entire no property. No build, no pay. No build, no pay on the entire property. Okay. And dedicate ten feet of the right of way. And dedicate ten feet of right of way. Sure. I'll, I'll second that. The motion's been made and properly seconded. Any more discussion? Seeing none. All those in favor of the motion, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed. Okay. Passes four to one. Good luck. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. John Michael. The next case to be presented to the board is 2018-079. Shown here on the zoning map, an R10 zone property. Stephen Pryor is the appellant on behalf of the property owner. Um, the appeal takes place at the property located at 812 Inverness Avenue, shown here and shown here on the aerial map, not far off the 8th Avenue corridor in the Hoppin Melrose neighborhood. The request is for a variance from lot size requirements in order to establish duplex eligibility in this, the R10 zoning district. <clears throat> from my recent site visit, you see the view of the property in the lower right hand corner with the appropriately placed zoning sign, the view across Inverness there to the multifamily development in the upper left views down the cross street there in the upper left hand corner and back up Inverness in the lower right. Is there anyone here in opposition to case number 79? Aye. There is. As a result, both sides will have 10 minutes to make the desired presentations. To the appellant, we will note you want to save any portion you might want for rebuttal commentary out of this originally allocated 10 minutes. So just introduce yourself by name and address and make the desired presentation. Okay, uh, uh, I'm uh, Steve Pryor and uh, I live at 600 Shore Road, uh, Long Beach, New York, and I'm a, a college professor there. Um, so I bought this uh, property in 2008 um, and uh, with the prospect that I would uh, retire here. I have family in Nashville in this neighborhood, so I wanted to eventually retire. Uh, but uh, as I think you can see from the pictures, you know, the neighborhood has changed very drastically over the years. Uh, there's a huge uh, complex that was built across the street from me, apartment complex, and then uh, uh, adjacent to me there was a uh, zero lot development with, you know, uh, duplexes, etc. But this lot, it turned out, is about 17% uh, less than the standard lot. And so I, I need a variance in order to uh, construct a um, uh, uh, apartment, a, a duplex on it. Uh, and uh, so I... Uh, 
talked to the representative, Colby Sledge, and he was supportive of you know, my variance, and he directed me to uh, the planning department, and then they suggested you know, I ask for this variance. Um, so uh, I don't think that I want a, a large house in my retirement, and I'm not going to retire for another five years. And so uh, what I would like to do is to build um, a, an apartment in the back of this that would re essentially replace the garage that's there that's facing Elliott Street. Um, and the apartment would be uh, uh, about a 20 by 30 foot uh, apartment, uh, not t terribly larger than the footprint of the garage, and it wouldn't be any higher than the roof line of the house. So it really wouldn't affect, you know, the density that much of, of uh, the house. And then I could uh, essentially live there close to my family, uh, and I could continue to rent the apartment in the front of it for income during my retirement. Uh, and so those are my plans. John, I have a question. What the applicant had said that it, the house doesn't differ much, or it, it's different from the others, but it looks like on that it's 60 by 151, which is the same dimension as the house next door, and the lot two doors down is smaller, and the lot three doors down looks to be smaller. Well, so the, the square foot is, a, it turns out, is about 17% smaller than, you know, what, what would be required if I didn't wouldn't didn't need a variance? Right, but if that, well, that was my, what do you know what the I don't I don't see the sheet that tells us what the actual variance the is. The square footage basically it's R10 zoning, so 10,000 square feet is what you're seeking here. The variance request is predicated on the fact that by my quick map that 60 by 151 gets you 9,060, okay. so a variance request of 940 off. feet to reach right. the 10K standard. So when I bought the house, I really wasn't even aware that it was less than <laughs> the neighboring lots. It didn't seem so, but uh, it obviously is. Okay. Do you have anything else to add? Uh, I don't think so. I think that's... Okay. You'll have some time left over for... A rebuttal after we hear from the opposition. So, opposition, please come forward, state your name and address, and why you're opposed to this request. This is the time for the opposition to come forward if you have any words. Uh, my name is Zane King, and I reside at 20. 427 Elliott Avenue, which uh, in the photograph there, if you see B, uh, the letter B there at the top of the figure. So I'm, I'm directly behind the property here uh, in question today. Um, I'll focus my comments based on, I moved, uh, in, as far as the last year and a half, I moved there in September of 2016. And uh, in this entire time, I've never met Mr. Pryor. Um, because as he stated, he lives in New York. And um, for a couple of three months, the first two or three months, the, the property was just vacant. And so we didn't think too much about that. It was fall and winter. Uh, when it got to be springtime, uh, there was some college kids that began to live there, uh, a lot of college kids that were living there. And uh, they, they, of course, made a lot of noise, very late at night, had a lot of dogs they didn't control well. Uh, but very, uh, it was really the, the grass and the, the lawn, everything about the property is just, is just not well done. It's not well kept up and maintained whatsoever. Even now, today, if you look at the back fence, there's all kinds of uh, natural growth that's growing into my fence line. And um, I've not known even where to begin, you know, to turn on that matter. Then also we have, um, um, just the, 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 when you go from Elliott and turn on to Inverness, most of the time those bushes have been so large that's really created a safety issue 
and even turning uh, from Elliott to Inverness. And uh, so, and I have all, I don't know if, if there was a written correspondence as well from my neighbors, um, but my two next door neighbors that live in the properties similar to mine, Gordon Phillips and James Short, uh, they're also opposed uh, to this variance request. Um, we have um, an email from Gordon and James. Okay. okay, thank you. Thank you. Um, next, please. Uh, my name is Mark Thien. I'm uh, at 2407 Elliott Avenue. It's uh, five residences down on Elliott. Um, the images that you are seeing here do not represent uh, the Elliott side of the property. <clears throat> and so um, some of the information that's been uh, provided you is that it does not material, materially change the, vi uh, the sight lines or the visuals of the property from Elliott Avenue. And it absolutely would. It would um, create a, a two-story where one now exists, where the garage is, and it would actually go deeper um, so from Elliott Avenue would represent as a completely different property. Um, as Zane had mentioned, this property has been a challenge for us. Um, Zane, who's a relative newcomer, and I've been in the neighborhood since 1999, uh, seen a lot of change, seen all of the change, have weathered all of it. Um, and uh, this rental um, has created some issues for us too many vehicles parked on that corner, uh, an excess of vehicles uh, for a single property. Um, I think that Metro has a flop house law or whatever that might be referred to, but I think they've uh, exceeded the number of renters in the unit um, in the past. Uh, the hedges that Zane mentioned have been a perennial uh, problem for us. We have, unfortunately, the property assessors website does not provide contact information, um, uh, telephone information or emails to get in touch with property owners. And so through the years, we've had to um, negotiate with landscapers who had come over to mow yards and uh, never mow, uh, trim the hedges. We would actually have to um, pretend like we'd been in touch with the owner and that they had authorization to trim the, the hedges. What happens is that they grow so tall, and one year they grew into the stop sign, they grew so tall um, that you cannot at all um, see onto Inverness uh, to pull your vehicle out safe, safely. Um, I know it's not your jurisdiction, but we need to be in touch with um, another division of codes to find out um, if we can have those removed by the city. They are um, a motorist problem. So, so one, one of the things I'm, I'm looking at, and I'm trying to figure out, um, because I, I, I see the property and I see that all around it, I mean, you've got a, an SP, an apartment complex across the, the street, and then behind, uh, I think where you live, it's, uh, NHR. well, yeah, it looks like, you know, the, the, the duplexes, you know, the two homes on, on a lot that kind of stretch down that side. And, and, but I do know the, I do know the street, you're coming up right off of a Vaith Avenue and where this home is, is when this street turns predominantly residential. Uh, and single family, not uh, that is not as right. many. Now you do have there are duplexes and 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 other parts of it, and it's just pretty common in that area. But uh, but I just wanted to get a sense for because when you look at the at the photo that we're we're seeing, it, it looks like it's a, a very multifamily, and and it is, but it also turns into yeah, this is it really does transition. Be, yeah, this is really where where the residential neighborhood, if you will, that's the, kind of the line for it, and you know, and I would add that. You know, the character of Elliot, and, and certainly the character of Inverness down through there, but certainly the, the character of Elliot is single family homes. And so if this was granted, uh, the variance, and for him to put a second dwelling there, uh, which in my, in what I would suggest, I mean, what, he's going to rent that. And uh, for the next five years at least, as he stated, he was not going to, to move here. So for the next five years, I mean, we would have you know, you know, two families there, but probably two groups of college kids living there, and eight to ten college kids living on the corner. Uh, it's just not something I'm I'm really excited about. Okay. Regarding your issues with the 
edges that are overgrown? I believe you can call the property standards department. You we can, can. Uh, absolutely we okay. can. And then, yeah, and in the fairness, I mean, they're, today they're, they're great, but uh, for the first year and a half, I mean, we've just had no, no connection here to, the, to, to ownership. And, uh, and I think you called codes. Well, we've point. not caught up, but the hedges are in great shape today because I um, had to kind of be on stakeout and I had the occasion to um, make contact with Mr. Pryor's sister who handles much of the property management. Um, and I walked to the hedges with her and we discussed them very uh, specifically. And um, so it, it's not because of homeowners keeping it well. You just mentioned the tax assessor's office, so I was trying to help you. Oh, I'm sorry. I'll tell you maybe a different department. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much. The, the issue you, that we have is that where are your homes, I'm sorry, where are your homes on this My home is, um, the four long rooftops. I'm two doors uh, to the north of those. And I, I am the first one. The first of those long? Yes. Okay. Yeah, directly on the line with Mr. <laughs> Sorry, I Go ahead. Yeah, that's all right. Uh, the issue that we have with those hedges, yeah, you know, somebody, it, it, we have pedestrians, we have motorists, and it is a safety uh, hazard for both. Um, the secondary issue is that we should not be calling um, any department at Metro to have those uh, shrubs cut, pruned, maintained at all. Uh, those ta our tax dollars belong somewhere else. And so, so what we're suggesting is because of this problem we've had for the, since Mr. Pryor has owned the property, it would only suggest that, that this behavior is going to continue with, and you have two dwellings now, and while the hedges might get took care of, what else, you know, could happen there? You know, since there's been that kind of neglect, you know, the history of that. So. Any, any other questions for the opposition? Thank you for being here. We're going to hear from the applicant again. So this is rebuttal time. Respond to what you just yeah, said. Yeah, well, you know, I apologize that uh, the hedges weren't trimmed. You know, it's been under property management. You know, as I said, I live in New York. And I bought this with the prospect of retiring here, and so it's been under property management. Um, and, you know, I wasn't getting any feedback. You know, they're supposed to have taken care of, you know, the hedges and the lawn. That was part of the contract. And, you know, as time has gone on, especially in recent years, you know, I, they have not proven very uh, uh, good in their management. Not, not just this issue, but, uh, you know, there were several other issues that I feel like they, you know, were... Do you still use well, them? Uh, no. I, I, Who do you use now? Well, the property is undergoing a renovation, so it's not occupied. So the grass still needs to be cut and got the hedges. Well, right, and it was. Who's doing that? Well, uh, a lawn service. Uh, but they're not dealing with the hedge, obviously. Well, they, they did. They cut the hedge, and uh, as he, he said. How did you from New York City know that the property management company was doing a bad job? Because on one hand, you said, I didn't know. I thought everything was being taken care of. And then you just said, well, well they weren't doing a good job. Well, I, since uh, I started the renovation and have been there, I've been getting feedback that uh, it, it wasn't taken care of in, in terms of the uh, vegetation. Feedback from who? People that found Yes, you? my sister informed me that, uh, and that's the first I had heard of it. You know, I, you know, Essentially, I was just, uh, you know, it was under management. I thought it was, you know, being properly taken care of. I, in terms of, you know, the um, people that rented it, I never heard any complaint. Uh, well, so, I mean, so uh, how, do, how do you decide? I, I don't, didn't rent it myself. Again, it was Tandem Realty that, you know, rented, you know, the. And how uh, many how many people were in this house when it was rented? I, I don't know. You don't uh, I allowed uh, them you to You just gave rent. everything to the property management right. company and you just have no clue? Well, I wasn't uh, getting any negative feedback from, you know. So as long as the check cleared, you were happy? Well, I, I uh, you know, basically, you know, I, I was allowing them to manage, but I, I obviously my 
situation was that I didn't, I don't live here, and so, you know, I allow, I thought that they came rec recommended and I thought they were doing a good job, I, I, except for the last year when I felt like they, it, there were a lot of issues that were cropping up. Okay. The other four houses we can see on Inverness in that photograph, are those single family or those duplexes? The ones Immediately across from me, it's it's a uh, apartment building on that. on yeah. Elliott, and then uh, uh, also on Inverness, it's an apartment building immediately across from me. In the back, the, those new housings are the yeah, zero right. lot the houses lot. directly beside you. Those four that go to the left on Inverness. yeah, they're all single family. Okay. And are any of those across the street other than the one that I can see that appears to be an apartment? Are those single family? Well, on the corner, immediately across from me is an apartment complex, which yes, you sir. can see. And then the rest going on interviews are, are single family. Okay, thank you. So, you know, basically, Elliot is a very dense apartment on one side. Mm -hmm. uh, and. Uh, and then the new buildings that have been built are very dense also. Sure. There are hardly any lots, you know. Sure. So, I mean, those uh, that were recently built that these gentlemen live in, I mean, except for, you know, a, sm a small, you know, sliver that was messing in my lot, I could have built exactly the same thing. Okay, questions for the applicant. Do you intend to build, if the variance is approved, build a garage with an no. apartment above it? What do you intend to build? Uh, it's going to be a 20 by 30 uh, 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 two-story complex, uh, or apartment, I mean, uh, that will basically be in the footprint of that garage. Uh, and, it, of course, it'll be a lot uh, 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 shorter than the houses of the gentleman that objected. I mean, it will only go to the roof line, whereas theirs are really massive. Okay, any other questions? Okay, we're going to close the public hearing. Discussion. I mean, uh, you know, I'm empathetic. I uh, understand why he wants to do this. Um, but the, you know, the, the, my hang up right now is a couple of fold. One is I, I don't know of a hardship um, other than the lot's too small. And it does appear to be the same size as the neighbors that are zoned the same way. I think the, uh, from the previous chart, the ones that are a duplex really are, uh, are close. I think he has 9,000 square feet. And the ones that, that his neighbor that was Complaining, uh, it looked like, I think if I remember right, it was 176 and a half times 60. Anyway, it was like 9,888 feet, but it also had a different letter by the zoning, you know, <laughs> block. So I think it was, I think it's not zoned R, R10. And so I think he's in one of these unusual spots where it, it feels like based on his immediate neighbors, he should be able to do this, but based on his zoning, he shouldn't. And that in itself isn't a hardship. And I'm almost, uh, I mean, I'm inclined to, deny the variance uh, with allowing the applicant to know that uh, uh, if you want to reapply in six months and have a different plan and have a site plan and uh, engage uh, maybe some of the neighbors and, and with, with more uh, and, and have a legitimate hardship, then, then that might be something to do. But uh, I, I didn't see the hardship in the variance request. Okay. Does anyone have a motion? No, I'll move that we deny the variance. Okay, motion's been made. Is there a second? Second. Motion's been made and properly seconded. Any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor of the motion signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Passes unanimously. Motion denied. I mean, the variance denied. John Michael. Mr. Chairman, the next case that's scheduled to go before the board is 2018-100. This is the appeal of Michael Giles involving the property of 1000 to Warren Street, unit number 106. Mr. Chairman, this was another matter. It's a short-term rental case, item A appeal. Uh, the appellant was, in fact, before the environmental court before today's hearing date and received a three-year injunction from the court. Because he intends to appeal that action in court, 
uh, we have suggested that it's appropriate to indefinitely defer the BZA matter in the event that he succeeds on his appeal, then his case will be pertinent before the board once again. For okay. me, in the meantime, though, it wouldn't help him much to proceed. Thus, we're recommending indefinite deferral and solicit a motion to that effect. Okay. Is there a motion? I'll move that we indefinitely defer this case. Is there a second? Yep, 100. Is there a second? second? Motion has been made and properly seconded to <coughs> discussion. Seeing none, all those in favor of the motion signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? passes unanimously, case indefinitely deferred. John Michael. Mr. Chairman, the next case is 2018-107. Brett Garrett is the appellant on behalf of CH Realty, the owner of the property at 3818 Logistics Way. This is in Council District 33, not far from the old Starwood Amphitheater property. I know our fellow board member, Ms. Sanford, would miss having an opportunity to talk about an area that she knows and loves well. Uh, this request- uh, uh, the Houston concert I saw there. <laughs> we'll allow you to date yourself, Mr. Chairman. Um, the sidewalk variance request that has been presented in your board packet, the aerial photograph here shows the large industrially zoned area on that particular side of the street, and as you go further to the south and east, more to the industrial zoning in that area as well. From my site visit a little while back, you can see the construction underway. The uh, view up and down Logistics Way tells the story of their absence of sidewalk under the present conditions. The board has, of course, the formal recommendation from the planning department with regard to their recommendations on this matter. We'll let you check back on that as you're hearing the presentation. Uh, is Brett Garrett present or other representatives for the case? Anyone on case number 107 involving the property on Logistics Way? With that, Mr. Chairman, we'd respectfully recommend a deferral to a later date and see if we can get to the second meeting in June. I so that's a brilliant idea. 65 cases? Okay, I move that we defer this case to the second meeting in June. Is there a second? second. But, Assuming they're not out in the hall, right? Yeah, and if they, if they come back, we'll hear it today. Motion's been made. Is there second. a second? Yeah, okay, um, any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Uh, motion passes, deferred to second meeting in June. Mr. Chairman, the next case is number 2018-154. David Bishop is the appellant and owner of the property at 1616 Glenridge Drive, shown here on the zoning map and here on the aerial map. It's an item A appeal of the denial of a short-term rental permit. This appellant had come before you off this property previously, having been um, denied a short-term rental permit based upon prior operation. The board took their action to reduce the 12-month period, but before then, staff was uh, provided with a formal letter from the attorney for the Homeowners Association indicating that there were restrictions against disuse in that area. Staff reviewed, determined that that was an appropriate basis for denial of the permit, and took subsequent action when the application came through. This is the appeal, then, of the second denial of the application, which, again, had been based upon zoning administrator and staff's determination with regard to the language uh, of the Homeowners Association's covenants, as reflected in the letter from attorney uh, Jerry Wigger in his letter to uh, code staff. I believe you have that in your board packet. With that, Mr. Bishop is represented by counsel today, Mr. Wren. There's the face of the property in the aerial once again. Uh, is there anyone here in opposition to case number 154? There is. As a result, the appellants will have 10 minutes to make the desired presentation, saving back any of that time they might wish for rebuttal purposes. Then we'll hear from the opposition. Please introduce yourselves by name and address. Good afternoon. My name is Michael Wren here on behalf of David Bishop. Um, my office is located at 2126 21st Avenue South in Nashville. If you introduce yourself, please. I'm David Bishop. I'm the, uh, one of the owners of 1616 Glen Ridge. This is my wife, Sandy. She's the other owner. Okay, let's get started. Thank you. And I have some documentation to hand sure. to the board, if I could, please. Um, it'll be please a give it to our lawyer, and then we'll get it. of our time. I believe there are two separate issues here um, that, that I would like to discuss in regards to the Homeowners Association claiming that a short-term rental is prohibited by the covenants of the HOA. The first thing that I'd like to address is the HOA covenants for 
this homeowners association were drafted and approved in 2009 before short-term rentals really became an issue in, in Davidson County. Um, the language that is in the homeowners association covenants does not specifically apply, discuss anything about rentals, short-term rentals, um, and I would say is vague when it comes to this type of issue. The main thing that the uh, Homeowners Association Covenants does discuss is that the uh, resident, residents in the HOA should be used uh, as far as they conform with codes. And this short-term rental permit would conform with codes. Now what the HOA was trying to say, and the other argument that I'd like to present to the board, is that it is a business and therefore is not allowed under the uh, HOA. And one of the, the things in the packet that I've shown you is that there are a number of home-based businesses that are located within 600 feet of my client's residence. Um, the first document that I provided is between myself and my client are the home-based businesses that we had found uh, just by searching online or, or going through the neighborhood. We have a hair salon, a tree trimming business, child care services, two contractors, a home base chef, two other short term rental permits, a music production studio, an Amazon fulfillment center, and also piano lessons. Now one of the doctrines under Tennessee law is called waiver. And waiver is where, in a contract, you have terms or provisions, but you don't enforce them. So therefore, you're waiving that provision of your contract. The next page that I have is one of the other short-term rentals located at 7169 Bay Cove. This one expires on October 25th of 2018. The next one is at 412 Northridge Court. Um, which expired uh, December of last year. The next page is a music production company located at 800 Eads Court. This is within 600 feet of my client's residence and is an actual music production studio. This is a home-based business and is still allowed under the HOA to operate. The next page is a piano le picture of piano lessons. And if you look closely, it says piano lessons available here, meaning in the home or in the residence, located in the HOA. Now, why does all of that matter? In regards to waiver, if they've never enforced this covenant regarding home-based businesses, then it would be waived. The next page is from the Davidson County Chancery Clerk and Master. If an HOA was going to restrain somebody from operating a business, they would file that restraining order in Chancery Court. You can see from the search, Riverside Homeowners Association, there are no cases that have been brought by Riverside Homeowners Association. On the next page is from the Davidson County Circuit and General Sessions Court. There are two cases that have ever been brought by Riverside Homeowners Association, both in 1999. Unfortunately, they're so old that there are no documentation from that, but it is safe to assume that that is regarding HOA dues and nothing regarding restraining any home-based businesses in the Homeowners Association. So based on the vagueness of the covenants in the Homeowners Association uh, uh, guidelines, the fact that there are a number of home-based businesses located in this Homeowners Association, and that the HOA has never enforced this covenant at all, it is our position that one, it is too vague to apply to short-term rentals, and number two is even if it did, they failed to, to enforce that provision and therefore it's waived. And with that, I will reserve any time for uh, rebuttal. So, the, the, there is an attorney that had sent a letter for the homeowners and said that, I guess, and I don't, we don't have a copy of 
all of paragraph 17 he quoted two spots but he basically was saying that uh, the lot you know shall only uh, well shall be used as a residence or such other use permitted by this declaration no other purpose um, and that each lot shall be used for private single family residential purposes and not otherwise um, that's I, he says paragraph 17 you now it the, uh, the question a question I have for you and and maybe ultimately uh, codes or whoever else wants to weigh in is it you know it did it, it seems to me that when the council passed the short-term rental law uh, it in effect allowed this as a use for single-family residential purposes uh, the problem that are it's also quoted as paragraph 17 W uh, that no house or other structure shall be used for business or commercial purposes and that's the one that's that's troubling and just to make sure I understand your argument is that due to the kind of plethora of other commercial purposes that are existing in the neighborhood that this is selective uh, enforcement by the HOA that's correct um, you have listed two other STRPs on the data but and, and I assume they are these two that you handed out and it looks like they've expired um, so do you know if there are active STRPs in the the 7169 Bay Cove Trail that one shows that it does not expire until October 25th of this year. Okay, I may just be looking, I'm just looking at the bottom at permit status, but is that something? Oh, I see you're looking at the at the uh, expiration date 1025. I was just looking down below where it has data, but I see that, that I see what you're saying there. Okay. And I, we can ask Robert if we have a question on that. The other one, it looks like the other one expired in December. That's correct. And the reason that I brought up the, the information from Chancery Court from General Sessions is that these other ones were operating, or at least operating at some time. The, uh, the HOA covenants were, were drawn and ratified in 2009. We have nine years where there has been no enforcement or no other uh, complaints filed regarding at least the other two short-term rentals and then a, a number of other home-based businesses okay. as well. Great, thank you. So okay. what if the Homeowners Association have just now learned about these other uh, STRPs and other businesses? Maybe they didn't know about it. I, I will tell you in the two weeks leading up to this, I, I was able to find this information. Um, and so it, it, it didn't take a whole lot of time or a whole lot of work for me or my client to find these other short-term rentals. To, there's a sign that says piano lessons here in the front yard of one of these businesses. Uh, and another one is a music production uh, company being run out of one of the houses. So, um, I, I, that, yeah, that, and, that is, that is, a, and so it is, I, I get that answer. Yeah. I guess more. I guess let's let's say, <clears throat> on a hypothetical level, you know, on on the waiver issue, uh, you, you, well, are you arguing that they waiver applies because the homeowner? How could the homeowners association not know that this level of activity was going on, sure. and they chose not to enforce? And I, I guess, and and I, let, me, let me clarify a little bit. I don't think that the HOA covenants apply to short-term rentals, but I know that is something that you guys hear um, every time that there's a, a BZA meeting. So I did want to present, as far as waiver, uh, under Tennessee law, if you have a contract provision and somebody, uh, let's say, as far as a, a rental issue, if you have a, a long-term rental and your tenant keeps paying on the sixth, seventh day instead of the fifth like they're supposed to, under Tennessee law, if you keep ca taking that rent, you're waiving that issue if you want to evict them the next time they're not uh, paid by the fifth. And that applies here. We have all these home-based businesses. Um, I think that the proof shows that it's very apparent that these home-based businesses are going on in this HOA. And now my client is being singled out at this point. Um, I, I think it's been waived uh, if you believe that the covenant even applies to short-term rentals. 
Um, Councilor, how do you get around the fact that John Michael, tell us the language that one has to sign when they uh, have a short-term rental, the affidavit related to sure. HOAs? Sure, if you'll permit me to just refer to it generally, it's basically a declaration that there's nothing about your property that is subject to a homeowners association or other restrictive covenant associated with that uh, property that would prevent you from operating a short-term rental at that particular address. Um, there is also in the ordinance language the effect of all representations must be truthful, but not just truthful, but accurate, meaning even if you make an honest mistake, if it turns out there has in fact been a mistake, that's something that the staff has to take action on at a later date. That's what we get into here. So to sign off on that affidavit declaring that there is not the violation may be in goodwill, but then it reverts, ba reverts back to the question of uh, whether or not that was an accurate declaration. So the accuracy here is what we had to assess at the staff. How do you, how do you respond to that? It's yes. one thing if you were in court arguing waiver yes. about this, but this is very specific of saying, okay, we're going to give you a short-term rental permit, mm -hmm. but you've got to sign this declaration saying there's nothing in my HOA that prevents me from having that. Sure, and, and I believe that the declaration was accurate. Now, the reason I'm talking about waiver is because if the board thought that it applied, then there's a secondary argument of waiver. But in regards to the provisions here, it says, subject to the provisions of the bylaw, no parts of the property may be used for purposes other than housing and the related common purposes for which the property was designed and is allowed by municipal zoning laws. Okay, I get that part, Councilor. What about the part that says, quote, private, that this can only be used for private single family residential purposes and not otherwise. Well, it also states that each lot shall be used as a residence or as such other use permitted by this declaration for no other purposes except for that professional and quasi-professional people may use their residence as an ancillary or secondary facility. Now, this is, is short-term rentals a private single-family residential purpose? I, I at, at this point, I don't see why it would not be because my client is not renting out an entire home. I, the board probably doesn't remember the last time that we were here when it was operating without and we went through the, the hearing to get that clarified. Okay. But the proof at that time was when he rents it out, it is not the entire house. He is home at that time. It is a room. Mm -hmm. And so under that, um, it is, it is being used as a residential purpose at the same time. Is there any? Oh. Yeah, so a type two uh, non-owner occupied uh, short-term rental home would be, in your opinion, a commercial use that would not be allowed by this homeowners association. I believe that's correct. And now, you might also argue that it would be, should be waived, but, yes. um, because, but, but that, that it just in, it, before we get to that question, the first part in terms of, of the chair's question, and I think I addressed it earlier, that the use, the residential use of a residential SDRP, uh, it, it doesn't change the resident, uh, having an, a residential SDRP does not change the residential nature of, of a home. That's correct. It's included, okay. Any other questions for the applicant to, uh, before we hear from the opposition? Well, I am curious. I mean, I like your argument a lot, and I like the waiver argument, although you know, I guess you're saying the notice, you're assuming they were on notice and they would have filed lawsuits to enforce the covenant, and your proof that because no lawsuits have been filed, the HOA knew about it and allowed those uh, uses to occur. But it just seems like... You know, what we've got to determine is whether the zoning administrator erred. And we have a letter that interprets the HOA um, bylaws to say that you don't, that it would apply to short-term rentals. And, you know, so that's evidence on, on our side. And I'm just curious why you wouldn't sue the HOA. I mean, it seems like that's a better avenue for relief for you than to try to get it here. And it was, it was one of the things that we've discussed, um, but in our looking at the HOA covenants, um, the fact that this was drafted in 2009, that there is no specific language to, not even just short-term rentals, but as to long-term rentals. And I, unfortunately, I didn't have time, but if I had gone and pulled up the 
uh, actually people who are licensed to be landlords and had these properties listed, I'd be willing to bet that there are some that are being rented in this area. If that's the case, they would be violating this HOA as well under their interpretation. Um, but I, I just think it is, it is too vague as to short-term rentals or any rentals. Um, and when it says that it is to be used for residential purposes, other except for, and then gives professional or quasi-professional people, uh, that's a pretty broad brush that I think my clients fall into when they are still occupying the residence and even staying in the residence when it does have someone uh, come in under a short-term permit, or at least that would be the intent. Okay. Any other questions for we hear the opposition? Okay. You'll have four minutes left for rebuttal, so please go back and we'll hear from people. Thank Oppose, you. please identify yourself for the record and address them while you're in opposition. And while, while they're transitioning, is John, do you know if um, the basis, why, you know, why this was kicked back? Um, was it, was it, was there a determination, you know, by staff that, that um, it, it did violate the HOA? Yes, I can speak to that affirmatively, that I reviewed that with the zoning administrator, Mr. Herbert. And in reliance on the letter drafted by uh, the attorney, Gerald Wigger, for the HOA, we determined that that was a sufficient basis to determine that the HOA guidelines did not, in fact, allow this particular use. So that was an but, affirmative decision. Because the representative of the HOA said it, it did. Uh, right? Based on our review of that right. language okay. as presented in the letter from the attorney. Okay. Awesome. Thank you. Okay. Please identify yourself for the record and address and why you're here in the position. <laughs> Okay. Good morning, uh, members of the Metro uh, Board of Zoning Appeals. My name is Brian Hull, and I live at 7044 North Ridge Drive in Nashville, Tennessee. I am a, home, a homeowner and a member of the Riverside Homeowners Association. And as a voting member of this association, I am here today to express my opposition to the appeal being heard before this board, which is to determine if the zoning administrator ruled in error or acted arbitrarily in denying the request to turn the property at 1616 Glen Ridge into a short-term rental property. On grounds that it resides in a homeowners association that forbids short-term rental properties as identified um, by the well, staff. Let me ask you about that. You say, it, where's the language that says it prevents short-term rental properties? Um, I, I'm getting to that. Can I? continue reading or do you want me to oh, jump to that piece? Yeah, answer okay. that question. That's why we're here. Yep, so um, there are a couple of different pieces. So in section five of the um, covenants and restrictions, it says, quote, uh, there has been formed an association having the name Riverside Homeowners Association Incorporated and uh, Tennessee Not-for-Profit Corporation, which association shall be the governing body for all unit owners. Um, it goes on to say in section four of article six, all lots, and again I'm quoting, all lots should be used in accordance with provisions of the bylaws, the deeds, the rules and regulations, and Metropolitan Nashville Code. Each lot shall be used solely for residential purposes. Section 17 of the Association Covenant states that each lot shall be used as a residence or as such other permitted by this declaration, and it goes on to list a few of the exceptions that have already been highlighted here. Um, but it says nothing about short-term rental properties. Wow, she just said it did. You said it was prohibited under your HOA. Oh, well, I think that the, the, the... That's your interpretation. Right, I mean, that's what we're here to discuss. So let me ask, you're on the board of the HOA. Why aren't you more specific about this? I, I'm not on the board of the HOA. Okay, you said you were a voting member. You just belong in... Everyone that owns a property there is a voting member. So I have one vote, Mr. Bishop would have one vote, and it seems to me that any disputes um, or interpretations of the bylaws or covenants would be um, referred to the, the homeowners association board um, that you know is in charge of all of these properties. Okay. Well, I mean, I guess you know the, the appellant has has kind of two lines of argument. The first is that uh, because the council says that you can have you can engage in this activity as a resident that it is a resident it, it is a uh, you know residential purpose you know it, it, it qualifies as a residential purpose and I think you disagree but then uh, if we were to agree with the applicant and say well this is a residential purpose uh, it kind of begs a question about the commercial use of a short-term rental and 
the applicant has given us a long list of neighbors that they say engage in uh, commercial activity. Are, are you aware of, of those commercial activities and is that the kind of thing that happens in the neighborhood? You know, a hair salon, uh, people that run their businesses from their home, uh, piano lessons, long-term rentals where people rent their home for more than 30 days at a time, maybe for a year. Uh, I mean, are you aware of people in your neighborhood doing those types of things? I'm not aware of any of that with the exception of the uh, piano instructor, which is uh, directly across the street from my house. And this is an individual who uh, occasionally teaches children uh, piano lessons uh, on the side. It's not a full-time job uh, or anything like that. I mean, it's just an individual who knows how to play the piano and likes to you know, help out other families and children in the neighborhood. Very different from uh, running a you know, short-term rental property out of your house. Which how, you have. Does that, how does that differ in terms of the use, though? That person is making money from a different use of their property. It arguably would bring traffic to the neighborhood other people that the neighbors don't know. So really, how is that different from a short-term rental in that way? So I would say that it doesn't uh, necessarily bring much additional traffic as it's uh, directly across the street from our house. Um, I mean, I think that this is something that probably occurs uh, maybe a couple of times a week. I mean, we don't have uh, significant traffic out there due to this. Um, it also doesn't have any impact on the neighbors um, as we discussed at the beginning, or you all discussed at the beginning of this meeting, these short-term rental properties can have significant impacts on the neighboring communities, whether it's 100 people at a house party or someone bringing an AK-47 um, to, to one of these short-term rentals. Once you rent it out, you have no, you, you don't know how the people are going to behave um, who are renting the property. And so there may be good intentions, um, but once the permit is given and this precedent is set, it opens the door for anyone else uh, that wants to come into our homeowners association um, against what I view as our bylaws and covenants and the will of the people of the homeowners association well, as our like lawyers stated. It has been set many times um, just on STRPs. I mean the list here is, I don't know, maybe 10 or a dozen. Again, I, I wasn't certainly not aware of any of those. So they can't be bringing too much traffic if you're not aware of them. I can't, I cannot, like I said, I, I'm not aware of those. I cannot speak to that. Any other questions for the opposition? Okay. Anything else to add? No. Okay. Thank you. Thank We're going to hear from the opposition again. This is rebuttal time, so yes. you get uh, to respond no, to what you just heard. I, I will keep it brief. Um, and, and I, I thought the question about the piano lessons and how is that different from the short-term rentals was a very good question. And the reason I think so is because his answer was uh, it's going to happen a couple times a week. In regards to short-term rentals, an owner-occupied where my client lives there, he's not going to have different people coming multiple times a week. Uh, I think it would back when you were unfortunately operating without a license and that we've already come here before. What was the most frequency that you had guests during the month? Um, different, that, that's probably 10, maybe 12. My guests had strict rules. I had rules on the, you can go on Airbnb if I was online there, you can see my rules. There's no partying, there's no entering my house. If you're intoxicated, I run a strict house. And the, the average age that we had was about 40. People loved it because it's quiet, it's peaceful, and the people that, that are under 40, they don't like the rules, and that's just the truth of the matter. So I made the rules real strong because I was going to appreciate and take respect to my own home, including the neighborhood. I told the people when they came there to park right in front of my home and don't park anywhere else. So my rules are strong, and, and the people respected my rules, and we never had a problem. But in regards to um, the, the the actual running of, of the short-term rental and the effect that it had on the neighborhood, you can see from the list that I provided, there are a number of different things that are happening in this neighborhood that no one ever had an issue with or has had an issue with until my client, unfortunately, was running one without one, ended up reapplying and getting denied and coming back through this board and had to put up the proper notifications through the mailings and the signs. And that is the only way 
that this became known to the HOA, that they have all of a sudden now become concerned because uh, through their past history, it, it hasn't been an issue for them. Um, and I, I would say, one, the short-term rentals do not apply under the language of the covenant. And then number two, if you think that it does, their actions have clearly struck in that provision from their, their HOA covenants. Okay. Anything else to add, Counselor? The last thing um, is in regards to the new bill that was signed today. Um, I've read the House Bill 1020. Um, I haven't seen the signed copy yet. Uh, in regards to how this case applies to the new uh, bill that has been signed, um, I, I do remember reading that it said uh, no, nobody could deny a permit and it gave different exceptions. And, and there were a number of exceptions to that. But I did not see one that applied to um, uh, covenants of homeowners associations or anything else like that. So. Um, it may be something that's reserved or, or something to think about, but I... Well, we might see you again or you might be traveling to some other port. <laughs> so, any questions for the applicant? Okay, thank you. Thank you for your time. Uh, close the public hearing deliberation. Well, I'd, I'd just ask our, our uh, attorney to uh, help me understand if the thought that I've been mulling over about... <clears throat> Uh, short-term rentals being a legitimate residential use was uh, valid and I will let her say yes um, the commissioner is asking what whether or not that is a valid use of a residential uh, property and and just to kind of frame it up um, there are a couple a lot of different issues in this case uh, that have been brought up and some of them are actually going to be a private party issue uh, the issue of waiver that's that's really between the homeowners association and and the um, resident um, that's not one really that's before this board what's before this board is whether or not um, there is any prohibition as as uh, mr. Ewing has said that would prevent the issuance of a short-term rental property and it turns interestingly enough it turns on whether it's occupied or not if it is a non-occupied, and I bring that up because I was looking at different versions of the zoning code as the discussion was taking place, and under 1708030 of the zoning code, uh, prior to bill number uh, 2017-608, prior to that, it looks as though the short-term rental properties were all listed under residential uses under the zoning code. However, when this bill came into effect at the first of the year in January of 2018, it looks like this bill specifically made a distinction between short-term rental properties uh, owner-occupied and non-owner-occupied. And the distinction is important because they took out non-owner-occupied and listed it in the land use table under commercial uses, leaving uh, owner occupied in residential uses among other uses okay. so I think that that that's kind of what this case may turn on and and, and I certainly think that the zoning administrator uh, did not err from the standpoint of having the information that he had before him at that time with regard to the letter that was submitted by the um, by the uh, the attorney was certainly worth this board having an opportunity to weigh in in on that and then it, you said in terms of the commercial use, um, is that something that we weigh? How do we weigh that? I mean, well, here they will, the reason that's important is because in the letter that is the basis of the denial, I think you have to at that point look into what are the um, statements that are being made concerning whether it's prohibited or not. And you look at the language that is being quoted here and it says each lot shall be used as a residence or such other use as permitted by this declaration and for no other purpose. And then each lot shall, uh, shall be used for private single family residential purposes and not otherwise. Well, what is a single family private residential purpose? Well, I think that's where we look to the zoning code and see how uh, Metro has categorized those uses and make that determination from there. So if it was not owner occupied, then clearly it would be a commercial use because that's how Metro has characterized it. But I think something has to be said for the fact that they didn't do that as it relates to owner occupied. So the sentence that says a lot should be used, uh, well, let's see, no house 
or structure on any lot shall be used for any business or commercial purposes except as referred to in paragraph 17 which says each lot shall be used as a residential a residence or such other use permitted and you're saying that a residential use includes strp so that would be owner occupied strp owner so if, he, if the testimony were that he were were renting it out and he was not occupying it then i think we we would be in commercial uses um based under the ordinance so why we're here and why we're spending so much time on this particular case is because this is vague you know it residential use or whatever does it apply to short-term rentals does it apply to non-owner occupied these hoas are sophisticated organizations they have lawyers property management companies they read the newspaper they know that's going on in the nashville short-term rentals they should update their if they really don't want these in there make it crystal clear this isn't crystal clear which is why we have to deliberate on this as someone who now lives in, with an HOA, it's very clear in our rules, STRP is not allowed. It's Mentioned by out. name mm -hmm. or, Short -term you know, property. it's not allowed. And Mentioned so to me, name. if this is going to be, if this is vague and they chose not to update it, which they could do at any time, um, shouldn't hold that against the applicant. I agree. Who wants to make a motion? Um, to be clear, so we're, we are finding that the zoning administrator erred. Uh, okay, so I'll, I'll just I'll move that uh, we find that the zoning administrator did err. And uh, do I need to say why or how? You need to say. Yeah. Well, I'll, well, I'll, I will say that I will say due to the fact that the uh, HOA uh, covenants were. Were, were vague and uh, unclear as to the issue of STRP operation. Okay. Motion's been made. Is there a second? I'll second. Motion's been made and seconded. Uh, any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor of the motion signify by saying aye. 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 Those? Passes four to one. Thank you very much. Mr. Chairman, our next case is 2018-180, another short-term rental property case involving David Spicker, the appellant, and owner of the property at 1007 Clearview Avenue. You've already heard from the district council member, Mr. Withers, with regard to this property. The item A case involves the denial of a short-term rental permit at the property shown here on the aerial map, here from the face photo on the assessor's website. Is there anyone here in opposition to case number 180? Seeing none, the appellant will have five minutes to make the desired presentation to the board. Please just introduce yourself by name and address. Hi there. My name is David Spiker. My house is 1007 Clearview Avenue. I'm appealing the suspension of my uh, renewing of my permit. I had a permit last year. I just made a clerical error and uh, put it off in a blue. clerical blue. error. In my brain. I thought it was March and it was February when it expired. Uh, uh, as, as, as Brett Withers spoke about earlier, my, my house is in a commercial zone surrounded by bars. I don't bother anybody. Uh, okay. Yeah. Um, very good. Mr. Osborne, tell us about this case, how you heard about it, and if there are any non-permit uh, violations and how many rentals have happened <laughs> since your letter. So it looks like the permit expired on February 6, 2018. Um, a notice was sent on March 2nd of 2018. Um, his appeal date was 3-21-2018. It looks like there are two reviews in March of 2018. Um, I don't have any other uh, complaints against the property. Okay, so you get a letter on, when did you get this letter? March 2nd. March 2nd. You kept on renting? I didn't cancel a couple people. I'm prepared. I, if I were to continue renting, your rating, your like they call it your five star rating as a host is everything. I would. It wouldn't be worth doing if I cancel people. They would just no one would rent from me again. It wouldn't be worth doing if you didn't have a permit either. It wouldn't. No, I, I want to be in compliance. I want. This is what I want to be. Yeah. But we don't care about five star ratings up here. We care about following the law. That's what I want. You didn't do. have a permit. You knew it, and you kept renting. I, I immediately pulled my listings from the website. But you had two rent, rent, after you got the letter, you just said you had, you rented it twice. The, uh, I didn't, can't, yeah. I, Mr. Osborne. I was trying to get the permit renewed, sorry, that's what I was, 
that's why I didn't cancel if, them. If I may, they have two weeks to leave a review, so it's hard to say when exactly okay. in March they but, are left. But you rented it after that, right? I admit that, yes. Okay. Questions for the applicant? Do you have anything else to add? No, I'm prepared to pay the fines if needed for those uh, people I didn't cancel. And you haven't rented since? No, you it's not. Rented. It's uh, it's empty at the and moment. The listing's down or hidden. The or listing whatever. is down right now. Okay. Close public hearing discussion. We we first heard from Councilman Withers, who is supportive of this applicant's appeal. Well, I, I mean. You know, it, it's troubling that, that the applicant rented twice and uh, by its own admission, uh, but at the same time, uh, I, I do have a great respect for uh, his councilman who uh, rarely asked for anyone to have uh, the type of leniency which he requested. And so uh, to me, it's it's a, on the low side and whether it's, it's uh, whether you want to consider something for the two rentals or not is, is but you know, having a valid permit, uh, having gone through the process, it's, I, I do think it's, it's different than renting without uh, having a permit at all. Okay, discussion over here. Well, have? We have people come before us all the time. They cancel, rate, cancel their rentals, regardless of whether it affects right. their ratings or not. I mean, so I, I, uh, I think that does factor in to what I would decide. Anyone have a motion? Mr. Chapel, let me make a motion for what you feel it should be. I would make a motion that we find the zoning administrator did not err and the applicant can reapply uh, five months from his date of his original application, which was March 21, 2018. Okay, the motion's been made. Is there a second? Second. Motion's been made and properly second. Any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor of the motion signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? And how many hands for a support? Support. And opposed, okay. Motion passes four to one. Mr. Chairman, the next case that will be presented to the board is 2018-183. As shown here on the zoning map, this is for the property at 455 Humphrey Street, Council District Number 17. You previously received an email from the Councilman Colby Sledge with regard to his take on the subject. Justin Crandall was named appellant on behalf of Clearwater Properties, LLC, the owner of the property. The request involves three variances on the, sorry for the fuzz, but the aerial shown here on a very thin lot site plan shown here. First, for a sidewalk variance, second, for a variance from the required parking count, and third, from, for a variance from the side buffer require, requirements in this, the MUL zoning district. Of note, the urban forester has reviewed the side buffer and determined that it's completely appropriate to grant that uh, variance request and has asked me to indicate as much to the board. Um, if, in fact, the board chooses to grant that one, that would leave you with just the sidewalk variance, which has been opined upon by the planning department in writing in your packet, and then the parking reduction. This is all in con conjunction with the proposed construction of a new apartment complex of single one bedroom units at the subject location. From my recent site visit, the property is seen in the lower right hand corner. To stave off the first question from the board, yes, it's that skinny. The view up and down Humphreys here, um, back toward fourth in the lower right hand corner and back toward eighth in the upper left. Is anyone here in opposition to case number 183? Seeing no one, the appellants will have five minutes to make the desired presentation. Just introduce yourselves by name and address. Hey, John, quickly, it, it's a four-unit apartment building. Why are there only three spaces instead of four required? Do you know? Um, I believe that this is in the urban zoning overlay, which creates certain allowances to decrease uh, the count okay. by up to a quarter, I believe. All right. Do, do we have an image that shows the uh, surrounding properties? The, do we know the, the width of those? Oh, thank you. That helps. Okay, thank you. It's required because it's a Because of, I believe, the um, change in zoning from the neighboring properties. Looks like you're up against IWD there to the east. So it requires a landscape buffer between the residential and the industrial. Apparently so. And again, that's what the urban forester specifically opined was completely appropriate to grant a variance upon. 
My name is Jeremy Kelton. I live at 1610 Martin Street, just up the street from there. I'm, I'm the owner of the property. My name is Garrett Bjork. I live at 3907 East Ridge Drive. I'm an architectural designer and uh, help people with preliminary land planning for this type of purposes. Okay, so what are we trying to do here? And uh, this is a tiny, narrow lot. Yes, sir. It is. It's a... Uh, Please, uh, um, did you, you said your address, so please continue. Thank you. Um, I'm, tr I'm trying to build four studio apartments, um, two up and two down, on a on a pretty skinny lot. The, n the neighborhood is is full of um, well, it's filling up with restaurants and places where people want to go and people want to live and stay next to it. So it's, it's there's a lot of this kind of development in the neighborhood, and um, that is that's what I'm trying to do. So the, the quick question is, well, why not just three? Could, seems like you would meet. Uh, I mean, would, would three make a difference? Would does that give you relief on your parking? Um, so the parking requirements actually have been met. The only reason why that is still in question is because the two parking spaces that we have at the alley would be backing out into the alley. Right. Um, under so you're going to have that problem no matter what. No matter what. Okay. And from I what I don't understand that part. What is, what is? I mean. Our, my, our thing says that you have three parking required, but you want two. Uh, so you're not asking for that variance? No, we we only need three, and we were we have the one on street parking lot or a parking space on the front of our property. We need to have 23 feet in width for a parallel parking space on the street, and we have 25 feet. And John is. place two along the alley and back out in the alley? I'm not asking for a variance on where they go, but just in the count. And, and we're not actually asking for that variance. I'm not exactly sure why. The only reason why the three parking spaces wasn't initially approved, and from my understanding and the information we received when we made this initial application, was that two of them needed to be reviewed uh, with the traffic and parking because they backed out into the alley. With so Required to have three spaces, and you're providing three spaces. Okay. So it seems that this two backing out into the alley is a different department, two different departments yeah, let, that let, need can to. Can we talk about the sidewalk variance? And when John comes back, ask him about that because I, I thought that the alley backing up, you just went to public works, or I mean, I, I don't think you come here for that. We've never had a back into the alley right. case. So can we let's talk talk about your yeah. sidewalk variance? Sure. So in this particular case, the sidewalks are. Uh, in excess of what would be required. Uh, we, there's a nine foot sidewalk running along the en entire frontage of Humphreys, nine foot wide of concrete. And for our zoning in, our, in this particular spot, we would need a four foot grass strip and then a five foot sidewalk totaling nine feet. So in order for us to be in compliance, we would have to remove four feet of concrete and it would be the only four feet of concrete removed along the whole stretch. So theoretically, like even our sidewalks are in great condition as you saw. Um, it, it would just be jackhammering out concrete and making the sidewalk strange in front of our parcel. Is there a, is there a curb and gutter there already? There's actually a curb and gutter and, um, yeah, everything's been maintained. And so, so go back. can you go back one picture? Is that your lot? Yes, sir. Yeah, on the bottom right. Is that a curb cut? Yeah, there's a curb cut right there, but we're actually not able to make use of that and we're not going to. So you abandoned the curb cut, or are you, wouldn't you be replacing that with a new sidewalk? Uh, I mean... The curb cut is not a sidewalk. Is it not? It's a curb cut. So, let me ask our architect friends. I mean, is a curb cut a sidewalk? Oh, well... You run into it while you're walking on the <laughs> sidewalk, but I, would, I, don't, I mean, yeah, I don't consider it a sidewalk now. I would, yeah. But planning um, department um, actually recommended we approve you not building the sidewalk, but they're recommending you contribute in lieu to the in lieu fund. What is your thoughts on that? Well, I'd, I'd rather build the sidewalk yeah, than and contribute if, if that was if something was required. But I'm not sure anything should be required. Yeah, yeah you either build or you pay in lieu is typically. How the very yeah. where I was yeah where I was going with that was 
I don't know, maybe Public Works wouldn't make you do it, but I, I would assume that you would replace the curb cut with sidewalk, and if you're doing that, you're half half the length anyway, so. So how wide is that house right now that's on the lot? So, uh, a little over 20 uh, feet. And your house that you're for, for, for this? Exactly the same. It'll, we're looking. How do you get to the back, yo? Alley access. Well, there's no way to come up between lots to. Our, yeah. The zoning for this actually requires zero side setback. It's, and same with the IWG next door, and same with uh, the rest of the zoning on this block. It's designed for that high intensity usage. But you're not going zero setback. We are no. not planning. We're planning on replacing this footprint. Exactly. Not. We're not going to like use reuse same the same foundation, same but way. yeah. Okay. Any other questions for the applicant? And John, they had said earlier that. Uh, that they didn't need a sidewalk, I mean, a, a parking variance because they have three spaces provided, and but they wanted us to approve allowing them back out into the alley, but we were thinking that was someone else's uh, responsibility for the backing out in the alley. Well, typically the city's chief traffic engineer at Public Works chimes in on those. So although the board can grant it in terms of the zoning code requirement, ultimately it'll be Public Works determination. This is probably a step in that process to getting that full eligibility for such. Yeah, I just don't ever, I mean, I remember a lot of, I mean, there's an awful lot of folks that back into the alley and new construction and we haven't heard a single one. So it seems like, I don't. It's an unusual request. That's not, doesn't color the request in any way, but we don't typically see a lot of that. Okay. Well, I guess the question is, do we have to find a hardship for that? I mean, have, having I never heard one of those in my, I don't know, seven or eight years of doing this. For any variance, you'd have to find a hardship. I mean, I might have I made a mistake when I made that drawing with the cars pointing into the lot. They could have backed in from the alley into their parking space, in which case they would be pulling out into the alley. I mean, are we in, are we in? I'm just not even sure how we find okay. a hardship on something like that. Okay, I mean, so we'll, it happens we'll, all the time. we're not deliberating yet. Any other th questions? Anything else to add? Okay. Close public hearing. Now we get delivery. Uh, I, I, on the on the, the, the car thing, I, I would just, to me, I would prefer to just defer it to public works because they make these decisions all the time. If they have an issue, then they can come back. But it seems like it's if that's the only place you can get your parking, it's not something that they typically deny in this type of case. So I, and, and they said they don't need the parking variant. So. Um, since we haven't really talked about nor seen pictures nor really addressed that safety issue, I'd rather them weigh in. Personally, I'd rather them weigh in. Um, and I don't have, I mean. Okay, the other? Uh, the side buffer I don't have an issue with because that's uh, the unique <coughs> nature of, of, of the property. Uh, I'll let y'all speak to sidewalks. Y'all have stronger feelings so, on that. Um, so going back to the to the alley drive drive in drive out business, do, should we should we defer that and then let Public Works deal with it? I mean, I'm you could you could rule on the other two issues yeah. and um, you know make your findings as it relates to a variance on the other two issues and defer that particular action. Allow the applicant to go to Public Works and seek. Uh, relief from them, and if they can't, they can always come back because you haven't heard that. I mean, you haven't uh, ruled on that issue yet. And if it turns out that they don't need to come back to Metro, then they can withdraw their appeal on that on that part. All right. So, I'd, if we're ready for a motion, I'd move that uh, we uh, grant the the setback variance and uh, deny the, the sidewalk variance. The side buffer? The side no. buffer, yes, I'm sorry. Grant the side buffer? Yes, I'm sorry. Grant the side buffer. Well, I'm, I'm asking you to clarify. You said grant the side buffer and deny the side The sidewalk. Okay. Yes. I'll second. Okay, motion's been made and properly seconded. Discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor of the motion signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Passes unanimously. Thank you. Good night. Thank you. But does, does there have to be a separate action then on the parking piece since that was not included in the. So the parking is so on the. I move that we defer. Indefinitely. Indefinitely on the on the parking issue. Okay. Motion's been made. Is there a second? 
I'll second, second. second. Motion's been made and properly seconded. Any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Parking. Oh. Well, is it about the last motion? Yes, this is about I the I think the hardship the was the narrow yes, lot. We didn't state the hardship, but for the record, that was the hardship. Okay. We'll, yes. we'll add that. That's correct. Um, Thank you. So, and the parking gets deferred and they'll work with so if our you need, traffic. If people. you need to come back for that, just yep. you come back. Okay. Okay. The parking. If we get, uh, if, I, if public works, works, works fine, you don't, have, you don't have to come back, yeah. but if they but say if they give you a problem, you got to come back and talk to us. <laughs> okay. John Michael. Thank you. The next case for the board's consideration is 2018-187. It involves a property at 1024 Lishy Avenue, Council District Number 5. The, the uh, zoning map here shows the subject property at the intersection. This single-family uh, construction project seeks a sidewalk variance property in its prior state, shown here in the aerial photograph. The site plan submitted shows a proposed layout of the construction at the cross street with Evanston there, right off Lishy. From my recent site visit, you see the view across the street, kind of catty corner from that intersection, and then the face of the property presently under construction there in the lower right-hand corner. Uh, the view up Lishy on the upper left hand, down Evanston on the lower right hand. Again, I know that uh, Council Member Scott Davis was here earlier today, apparently wasn't able to stay and comment on this and the other cases from his district. Regardless, we are joined. Uh, by Gail Wells, the appellant for the property. The property is owned by Three Beans, LLC. Is there anyone here in opposition to case number 187? Seeing no one, the appellant will have five minutes to make the desired presentation. The request on the sidewalk requirement is to not build or pay into the sidewalk fund for these properties at this corner lot. If you have planning's recommendation in your case file with regard to their assessment of the property. Uh, with that, we'll turn it over to the appellant. Just please introduce yourself by name and address. Hi. Um, I'm Gail Wales from Three Beans. I'm the middle bean. Um, so um, we're just trying, it, we're at uh, 10, sorry, 1024 Lishi Avenue. And um, <clears throat> the reason why we're requesting a variance is because there's really nice sidewalks, existing sidewalks there that are much, lo they're much wider than the new, um, I guess, new laws, the sidewalk laws. And um, so we don't see any need to tear them up or they, they're fabulous over there. They're How wide are they? They're about um, almost, I think, eight feet wide. <coughs> so they go, we're on the corner lot and they go, the front were 50 feet and then 150. So if you were to build the sidewalks as the law now requires it, you'd have to take out that little historic little piece in front of your house. Right. And it also, the way I understand it, um, we would have to go into our lot. So it would sort of, it, it would disrupt the whole flow of the sidewalk. That's um, what they told me. Well, that's what they... I mean, that's true. But tell me about, so when was the house originally built, do you think? Well, the original house... That was not there. That, that's not there anymore. Yeah. It was built in the probably the 30s, I think. My dad owned. That. My dad owned it, and yeah, okay. and it was. So this this uh, little thing next to the sidewalk, what are architect friends? Those all that. The little things up there. Yeah. Well, so the since there's wall. no, uh, well, they're just little decorative. They've been there. But they've long, been there for a long time. For a long time. Okay. They're they're all down the street okay but there's no so the parking's in the back anyway so there's no um and if councilman scott davis was here board members you know what his drill <laughs> is it's in the fifth congressional congressional it's in the fifth council district he would say he's for the applicant and you know he's a just a very strong supporter of the people that come in front of us in his district so that for the record questions of the applicant Anything else to add? Well, the, if I may, the planning department noted that you were not eligible to contribute in lieu, um, but we have the ability to make her eligible to contribute to the in lieu. Well, fund. When I spoke with uh, Mr. Gonzalez, he said he, I mean, he didn't, we're looking at 200 feet. We're, if we had to pay in lieu of, it would be it would be 30, over thirty five thousand dollars. Yeah, we have a lot of complaints no, from people that come yeah, here. Yeah, and, and I understand, you know, and we I did pay into in lieu of over in the nations, but you know that's just when there's something existing right now. I just I, I feel and and Mr. Gonzalez agreed with me. He just felt that that was unnecessary that we. Mr. Gonzalez. Oh, he's in the he's 
in the planning department up on the, yeah, sorry. They're recommending that you pay in lieu. The official recommendation from planning is say pay in lieu. Okay, that, that's not, oh, that's interesting because that's not what he said. I mean, he understood, I mean, he just said that's just, we're trying to keep our costs down unlike a lot of built, I mean, I just, very small. We build a few houses a year and we try to keep our houses very um, workforce friendly. That's what we try to do. But to add an additional $35,000 of cost onto this, what they, the homeowner will have to, we're passing it on to the homeowner and that they have to pay this for sidewalk somewhere else, I, I don't think that that's really, um, I'm really opposed to that, so. A lot of people are opposed, but it's the way the legislation is written. Okay. We, we hear this a lot. Right, okay. Other questions for the applicant? Okay, anything else to add? Pardon me? Anything else to add? No, sorry. Okay, thank you, we're gonna close the public hearing. So this is another corner lot that is, you know, has a lot more footprint for sidewalk. Um, like I said, Councilman Davis, if he were here, he'd be saying, you know, hey, you know, this is one of my good fifth um, district people and um, they shouldn't have to do this. I do think that the sidewalk looks like it's in fairly good shape. I, I would, you know, the although the original house isn't there, this element that was probably close to 100 years old is still out there. So. I agree with you is what Councilman Davis would say. Uh, at the same time, you know, we could talk about granting the, granting the request on one side and requiring the in lieu mm -hmm. on one street front. Because um, well, I, I, you know. I'd be in favor of that. I think that, yeah, well, and I mean, I think that uh, the, the chair does make a good point on the, the, the frontage, but where we get into these issues where there, uh, in my mind, appears to be uh, significant inequity in, in the law uh, is when you have an existing really nice sidewalk and it's a corner lot and whereas the next door neighbor would pay for 50 feet, you're expected to pay for, uh, well, two and a half times that. And so, you know, I, I think if, if uh, if there is to be a motion on, on paying, I would suggest that it be on the uh, Lishy side, uh, which is the shorter side. Okay. Anyone have a motion? I would make that motion that we grant the variance as to Lishy as to no build, but to contribute in lieu, and also that we grant the motion as to Evanston Avenue, no build, and no pay. Okay. Motion's been made. Is there a second? Yes, sir. Motion's been made and properly seconded. Any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor of the motion signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Passes unanimously. Good luck. Good. Thank you. John Michael. Mr. Chairman, the next case is 2018-189. Ryan Budden is the appellant and owner of the property at 629 Neal Avenue. It's an item A case involving a short-term mill permit. Permit op, uh, application was denied based on prior operation. Zoning map here shows the intersection at Neal and Mansfield where the subject property is located. This is the aerial photograph from the assessor's website, although dated, that was the house. Um, is there anyone here in opposition to case number 189? Seeing none, the appellant will have five minutes to make the desired presentation. I know he has some documents to distribute, so we'll have staff to distribute those here. to you. Please identify yourself for the record and address. Hi guys, I'm Ryan Button. Uh, 629 Neal Avenue is my address. Just want to quickly say thanks for being here. I'm sort of embarrassed that I have to be sitting in front of you guys today. Um, I just want to quickly go over some dates and I'll reference to the packet that I've given you guys throughout this. So I bought the house in August 24, 2016. Um, it needed quite a lot of cosmetic repair, but that was the price range that I fit into and I was willing to do the hard work to get it to where I wanted to be able to live in it. Uh, looking back on it, I probably overextended myself in buying a house when I was 25 years old, and, but that's where I am. Um, I wanted to long-term rent two of the rooms, and I was going to live in the third. Found two tenants, signed all the paperwork. A month later, they ended up backing out, and as you can imagine, that put me into sort of a, a freak out of how am I going to now pay for this. So Airbnb popped up. It was becoming really popular back then. 
Uh, that was in November that the renters fell through. I started renting it in January 2017 on Airbnb after filling out their process. Um, I truthfully read the policies online and somehow misinterpreted them. So what I did was notify all of my neighbors and get a million dollar insurance policy as required by the law. Um, that's the first two sheets that I've actually handed you guys is the insurance that I did take out on it. Um, and then I notified the neighbors. Um, after that, I- Did you get smoke detectors and call the fire marshal? I didn't, no, I didn't call the fire marshal, no, Why sir. Not? Why did you pay attention to part of the Airbnb rules and not the other part? I wish that I had. I don't, honestly, it was in a moment of panic that I put it up there and- Panic, what does that mean? I mean, you read it and you said you misread it, so how did you misread it to uh, comply with a couple steps and then not the other steps about smoke detectors, fire marshals, and you sent your neighbor's letters and you bought an insurance policy? I wish I had a good answer for you. I, it was in, back in 2017 and I, to this day, had thought I was full well, until I received the letter from the state, the state, local government, um, thought that I was doing the right thing. So uh, I, of course, received the letter saying that I was in, not in compliance. And then um, what did you do after that? Yep, so immediately after that, I went on to Airbnb and blocked the rest of the dates. Uh, the next, the, that next weekend, I called in codes and figured out that was not the correct thing to do. So about seven days later, I then went back and worked with Airbnb to actually unlist it. Um, I wasn't familiar that that's what you could do. So it, was, uh, it has been unlisted. On March 19th, I talked to John Shire at the Revenue Department. He sent me all of the forms, and then the next day, Tamara Books issued me a hotel occupancy a tax account. Um, I then came back into codes down here the 22nd, two days later, to make sure that I was doing everything right up to that point. And on the 27th, uh, I paid, so seven days after talking to the tax department, filed everything from the entire time that I'd been renting. So that was $2,150.84. And then that is the next two pages that I've handed you showing the receipts. Um, I actually worked with John Shire so that he could print this off so that I could show you guys that I had paid that up to the um, current date. When was the last day you rented the property? Um, the last day that I rented it should have been, oh man. You know, it's, it, I don't have this quite in front of me. It's, it's okay. in March. We have someone that might know. Mr. Osborne, the enforcer. Tell us how you heard about this property, you know, what was listed and how many times and maybe when the last time you saw it was listed. So from, from our records, it looks like it, this was started to be rented back in October 2016. It was brought to our attention by host compliance. Uh, we sent a notice on December 29th of uh, 2017 for short-term rental and tax violation notice. Um, and then we sent another notice for a short-term rental violation on, on April 3rd uh, via host compliance. Um, it looks like, the best I can tell, that he did somewhat stop uh, or uh, block his somewhat calendar. Somewhat stop. That's what I told the officer when I was going through the stop sign. Well, there were two I stays. Somewhat stop. Two stays that in January me, of 2018 and at least one around February of 2018. And then after that, I don't see any more reviews. Uh, it looks like flip key was left up until end of April, which is what why is that, flip key? it's another site similar to Airbnb. So, yeah, so if I could address that. So I, that is correct. So I took it down as soon as, as was just said. I did get the second notice from flip key. And to be honest with you, it's one of those things where you click sign me up on these other platforms. I didn't even know it was on there. I've never rented through the platform, but I was able to log in and immediately take it the day that I received that second letter. So you, this started on October 2016, that's not 2017. I believe that my first rental should have been in 2017. That's what so I saw. When did all this start? That's what I was compliance showing. Uh, the only reason I know this is through my Airbnb records, which I printed to make sure that I got my tax information correct. So, I don't have an actual printout of it to go back and scroll through all the reviews to, to tell you exactly when, but that's when, that's how they base these documented stays off okay, of. So getting off back to how in the world did you attempt to comply with insurance policies and notifying your neighbors and then not smoke detectors and 
actually giving us fifty dollars and getting a permit? Yeah. So the smoke detectors I, I made sure was in every I smoke detector. The fire marshal. You know, fire marshal says yes, that they're good, not yes, sir. You. So I'm still curious. How did you read online and go get a million dollars worth of coverage and send letters to your neighbor and not think that you had to do the other and not get a permit? Again, I, I, I truly wish that I had a good answer for you. I, I just don't. I'm trying to be honest with you. I, okay. Question. I, so just if I could make a couple other statements. Sure. Thank you very much. Um, so, you know, I made a mistake. It's a really convenient thing to be able to tell somebody. So I just want to make a couple points about myself and who I am. Um, so I was born in Australia. I've moved over my entire life. Community is really important to me. And as you can see in the last two pages of this, I have two of my neighbors that felt strongly enough that they wanted to write letters in support of that. Um, I you know, bought a house that needed a lot of work. I take a huge amount of pride in the community that I live in, including barbecues twice, you know, once a quarter. I try and get everybody over so everyone gets to know each other. Um, uh, the first one month I was on Airbnb, but I was able to achieve Superhost. Not that that's important to you guys, but it just shows I'm trying to put effort into this. Um, the other thing is I run, as soon as I graduated from college in 2014, I started my own business here. I've run that business since then, so I'm used to working with local and state governments to make sure that I'm doing the right thing, I'm paying my taxes, I've been successful in doing that for the last two and a half years. I also am building a garage on the back of the property, so I'm familiar with codes and coming down here and getting all this stuff, all getting the permits, having the inspectors come, I'm now on the third inspector coming out to look at it, so I am familiar with that process. The only reason that's relevant is I can genuinely look at each of you and say, I hope that that shows that if I knew I needed to do this, I am consistently willing to make the effort to do it. That I, there's no way that I would go through all of these processes and then short out. And again, sir, I, I wish I had a better answer on how I managed to miss that. But I hope that that's willing to show you that I'm w consistently willing to make the effort if so one to stand. So the, the, um, our, our coach inspector said that you'd last rented in February? Yes, sir. Okay. And March, March 1st is when I called to make sure that when I had been told that I was not, had, hadn't taken down the right way and that that day Airbnb helped me permanently remove the listing. Okay. Okay, any questions for the applicant? Okay. We're going to close the public hearing. Discussion? No opposition. There's no opposition? So. No, to this case. Okay. Discussion? I think that uh, there hasn't been a, an awful lot of rental since the first of the year. Um, I do think the applicant, through the letters from his neighbors and through his testimonies, demonstrated his willingness to uh, do the right thing. And so, uh, you know, I'm, I am, um, I'll, I'll offer a motion that we uh, find that the zoning administrator did not err, uh, that the applicant did operate prior to obtaining. Uh, the proper permit. Uh, the penalty I propose is three months from March 1st, which would make him eligible on June 1st, which is two weeks from uh, today. Okay. Motion's been made. Is there a second? Would you consider making your motion to March 22nd, which was the date he actually applied? We have a hard date that we know when he came down here. Well, I mean, I'd, ra I'd rather say eligible on, you know, like June 15th, which would be a month from now, than, than, to, than a certain month from the, the time. Um, because I, I do think that, uh, I mean, I, I, I know I, I understand your, your point of, of that date, and, and yet I also will always factor in, well, when's the last time you actually, you know, even though it might have taken you a week or two, I don't know what. Uh, what keeps people from doing it. I mean, some people go the very next day and others say, well, I had stuff to do, I was out of town or whatever, but yet my activity stops. So to me, activity stopping is important. Uh, and so I, I am willing to go a little bit more for you all, but, but I would say eligible June 15th on that motion. Is that acceptable? Sure. Yes, sir. Okay. Uh, motion has been updated, properly seconded. Um, discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor of the motion signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Passes unanimously. So eligible to apply for a permit on June 15th. So I can come down the codes at that yeah. Yep. yeah. Just thank you very much. Sure thing. Thank you.
Mr. Chairman, the next case for the board is 2018-191. Matamo McIntosh is the appellant and owner of the property at 2207 Old Matthews Road up in Council District Number 2, shown here on the zoning map, shown here on the aerial photograph. Tonight I may appeal involving a short-term rental property. Um, Mr. Osborne will make the staff presentation on behalf of the codes department with regard to this case. But Ms. McIntosh is present. Before we begin, is there anyone here in opposition to case number 191? Seeing none, at the appropriate time, the appellant will have five minutes to make the desired presentation. Mr. Osborne. All right, so this one was brought to our attention by host compliance. Uh, on 1027 2008 or 2017, we sent a notice um, to successful survivors who was showing as the owners at that time. A warrant was issued on 12 5 of 2017 and um, ended up in court on January 24th, 2018. Um, during this case, we did find out that there was an error with the deed um, because the owner of, or uh, the representative with successful survivors did contact us, um, at which point we let him know based on our, our investigation that there was an error. Um, however, he never showed up to court um, so a three-year injunction was entered on 2-12 of 2018. So who owns this house? Uh, I, I own the house, but I had no, I, I didn't know that at all. Um, okay, there is an error. For the record and address. Yeah, but I guess I find if, 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 if there's a three-year injunction on the property, what, what do we do? So what's in front of you, Mr. Taylor, and that's the right question. Because there, the injunction was entered against a defendant who was not the current owner of the property at that time, um, it's something that uh, the Metropolitan Government has the option of pursuing as a motion to set aside that order or refile that case against the correct defendant, the current owner, Ms. McIntosh. It's worthy of note that although the records indicated the prior owner was the current owner at the time, the notice of violation was initiated by the Codes Department, that error has since been corrected, and the records properly show that Ms. McIntosh took ownership of the property in, I believe, 2009. And Ms. McIntosh may be able to speak to that more, more precisely than I am able to. With that, though, there's an opportunity to amend what has been done in court if that needs to be done. However, here before the board, you can proceed today and determine whether or not to reduce the 12-month wait period that is presently the status quo with regard to the uh, wait before application based upon prior operation before the permit was issued. Um, so that if, in fact, that three-year injunction from the court is altered, amended, or overturned entirely, then it's more clear what the next steps are for the today's appellant with regard to the short-term rental permit. But it, it was issued based on behavior. Yeah, yeah I think property. let's talk to Mr. Osborne. How did this end up getting an environmental court, and what, what went on here? So we initiated the case as it showed in our system, according to the property assessor, that successful survivors own this property. Um, and like I said, they contacted me and said, hey, we don't own it, and, and sent some information to me, which I sent to legal to inquire as to what to do Was with that. Was it a default judgment in the environmental court? Did anyone show up? No, sir. Uh, the last correspondence I had with, uh, with the representative was on January 22nd, sending him the information about the error in the deed and, the, and you know, so telling me. when was the environmental it. court date and who showed up? Nobody showed up. Okay, so it was a default judgment? Yes, sir. Okay. Um, and then after that, um, I, don't, I don't know if she was notified by the previous owner about the violation, uh, so I did have to initiate a case okay. um, on March 8th, which she did come in. Okay, so board with. members, what do, you, what, do, what do we want to do here? I'm, I'm sorry, I'm still a little confused on what, what the original violation was. Operating was without a permit. But it was assessed to the, to the wrong person? Wrong person. Why did that case get in? go to environmental court as opposed to just here? Because we sent a notice. It was still in violation. It, at the time, it looked like we sent it to the right person because the property assessor is showing uh, that the ownership was to that person. And so, if I may chime in, Mr. Chairman, bear in mind a BZA case is brought by the appellant or the property owner, sure. the permit applicant. We don't bring it to BZA. They bring it to BZA. So only if someone had come in would it get to BZA. We bring cases to environmental court. Okay, so what do we want so, to do? Well, I guess so to me, the, the bottom line is that we, we need to determine if this owner has owned the property the entire time SDRPs have happened, to your knowledge, right? 
And so we need to determine if the applicant operated prior, what the, it, whether or not they operated prior, and then what the penalty is. And then the applicant needs to work with whoever the applicant needs to work with, Metro Legal, to determine if a mistake was made on the environmental court case and get that reversed separately from us. That's right. In fact, you can almost excise the entire second half of that analysis. What's before the board today is, did the zoning staff correctly determine that there was operation prior to issuance of a permit? And then secondly, do you want to reduce the 12 month period based upon whatever evidence you hear today? Right. As far as the board goes, that's kind of the end of the discussion. Right, and the environmental court says so it's a whole separate thing. It is, okay. it is probably true that there was activity before a permit, so we can determine whether the owner had anything to do with it or kind of why. Right. right. So is that, is that what we want to do today? Okay. Let's go. Okay. Name and address <laughs> and why we're here. So um, I'm LaTamara McIntosh. Um, I bought the property in November 2009. Um, single parent with two children. This is the first I'm hearing of this. Yes, um, the deed is still in successful survivors, and I contacted my uh, realtor numerous times about it because they're the house sat empty for a year before I bought it. So it was whose name is on the it was today? very shady successful survivors, um, who, and it's and I forget his name, but I hadn't. Uh, Did I don't you buy know. This? Did I, I bought the home and in the- In 2009? Yes, sir. Did you finance it? I mean, how did you buy it? Uh-huh, Wells Fargo is okay. my- uh, So you're saying that basically when you bought the house, they never transferred the ownership to you they, properly? They never transferred it properly. And, and have you fixed that lately? Uh, no, I have a few emails to uh, okay, Michelle, so. and she assured okay, me so that- mm -hmm. Time out. John Michael. The, the documents from the registered deeds at this point do show Ms. Um, well, I guess it was prior name, uh, Latamara Newman, was on the deed that shows now as the proper owner of the property dating back to 2009. Okay. So that's so, what our record shows so today, can, okay. just not at the time that the so case So as far as we're concerned, you own the property. That's right. Yes. Okay, that's continue. Good news. Congratulations, you own yeah. the property. <laughs> <laughs> Finally. Yeah, that's good news. And uh, um, when I did a modification on the home earlier this year, they said it would be corrected. So I've been trying to correct that. Um, so you were renting this as a short-term rental? Yes, um, I, I was renting as a short-term rental. Um, and When did you start that? I started uh, a few years ago, uh, and it started just from, it started from us um, doing the whole house. We would go and stay at a friend's house. Or if I went home to Ohio, I said, "Hey, let's let's do this," because I was a, I'm a single. So why, you, why didn't you have a permit? Okay, so I didn't have a permit permit because up until last year, I did not know. What we did was, as in going to those, um, we would go to a hotel or Airbnb. Nobody ever had one, but one lady had one, and I called her and I asked her about it, and we she stayed on the phone with me. We talked to like midnight and she gave me all the details on how to get one. That was someone the, that lived in Nashville. Mm -hmm. We were staying and she knew I was a renter and okay. so I called her and I asked her and she gave me all the details. Um, I started the process just just like the other guy and I, I started it and I, I, um, I did send letters to only four of my neighbors in the front, the side. When did you couple. start the process? So I started it several months ago mm -hmm. and um, and before I had, I didn't get a letter till March, um, but I started the process and I, I dropped the ball and my and I and I didn't have the money to get the alarms, but I was. She told me they had to communicate. My dad came from Ohio and he tested them. He said they communicate. So at that point, I didn't have to get those. So I came. I I um, I, I just didn't finish. And when I got the letter. Did you have future listings when you got the letter? I did. And what did you do with those? Okay, I um, I had to cancel them. All I have. Of them? Yeah, I ha well, when I got the letter, my last rental was the twenty fourth. Uh, I have twenty fourth of, of what? March. Okay. I have regular renters. I have a a lady named Lisa who works for Ten Care for longer she, than thirty days. No, 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 no. She comes for four days and visits oh, okay. us every month. Okay. And so I had to cancel my regular sure. people. Mm -hmm. um, now, one renter, 
after I got the letter, they had booked like four months ago, and I didn't want to just cancel on them when they were coming like that weekend. So I think I had one or two more visits, and I canceled everybody. And I even have uh, emails. I sent out a courtesy message. I let them know. I said, hey, I have to apply, comply with codes. I'm going to have to cancel your reservation. Some of them were not nice. Some of them understood. But then um, contact Airbnb, and they closed me out. But you still allowed a couple to kind of slip through. Because when you get that letter from Mr. Osborne, and then you know there's laws and you don't have a permit, there's usually two reasons why people continue to rent. One being, we've heard them today, I want my rating to be still high, five stars or whatever. And two, it's just they want the money. So why didn't you cancel? Okay. <clears throat> so I want to say um, the letter on the date on my letter, um, it had a, it, well, they had a date and I didn't go past that date. So I thought I was in compliance as long as I canceled before that date. Also, my um, I, I started renting a bonus, the bonus room in my house. That's only $35 to $60 a night, and which I reduced um, before for my regular renter. So, um, okay, so it sounds like you were renting more than one room. Is that correct? Yeah, I started off doing the whole house, but but we. We went to um, Florida and we stayed with a Russian couple who was doing it. And I said, hey, why don't we do our bonus room? And what we found was that we enjoyed that a whole lot more than renting the whole house. So okay. we'd rather continue to rent the bonus room because that's where we had so our So you stayed room. in the house and rented the bonus room and that's the only room people stayed? Yeah, and that's what we enjoy. We, you no, know, well, I guess my question was, how many rooms are in your house? Uh, four. Okay. So you would stay in one room, and was there any a time where you rented out two different rooms to two different people? No. Okay. That's what I was going No, it's just the bonus Just room. one room just at one a time. Room. Okay, yes. good. Question for the applicant. Do you, do you have anything else to add? Um, yeah, so I, I would say, um, um, and it, it, I don't know if you understand it, but it was, we had fun with these people. We really did, you know. They enjoyed my daughter, and we got to know a lot of these people, and they, they were repeat. So that's what we want to continue to do, to do. We don't want to rent the whole house. That was very, very stressful to have to find a hotel or go on. We don't want to do that anymore, but we do want to continue to rent the bonus room, especially for people like Lisa, who has to work in Nashville once a week. So I want to we want to do that again. And um, one last thing, we had a we had a guy who left his ear AirPods, brand new AirPods, and and glasses. We said, you know, he said, hey, I, you know, I think we left this, and we sent them back to us. And, and because we did that, and I have proof of that, he sent me a twenty-five dollar Amazon gift card and a card that said thank you for doing that. So we're not trying to make a million dollars. We make a few dollars a week. And it's very helpful. Okay. Um, thank you. We're going to close the public hearing discussion. It's hard to be Nashville nice and bad obey the law <laughs> exactly when you got somebody coming up the next weekend. And I know that uh, I, 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 I do have empathy for it, although I do appreciate the fact that there are others that. Uh, that get the letter and absolutely do exactly what is required of them by the law. Um, and we've heard a lot of both stories and um, I do find it uh, the, the competing city values of, of trying to be polite and hospitable, uh, I, I, I understand it, but again, uh, it's not quite in the same category as, as the folks that, that uh, that, that sacrificed everything. So, she but, canceled several. I mean, she but she did cancel a lot. And, okay. and, and again, I'm very empathetic to her and think it's on the. Okay. On the Do you have side. a motion? Well, uh, I, I would like to say that the, uh, you know, a lot of times people talk about how they'll uh, they'll contact Airbnb and they'll they'll work it out to, to find another location, because it, it obviously behooves the website to do that. 
but it's, it, it seems like it would also be useful if the website would help educate their clientele as to needing these permits mm -hmm. that they could avoid this mess. Mm -hmm. That's all I have to say about that. There, there's no shortage of lessons that Airbnb should take from our cases to help their, mm -hmm. uh, help their folks. <laughs> okay, motion. Oh, you know, I mean, uh, again, I think uh, similar to, to the um, last case, I would move that the zoning administrator did not air uh, that applicant operated prior and the applicant would be eligible um, to apply for a permit. Um, I'll say again, June 15th. Okay, motion's been made. Is there a second? I'll say. Motion has been made and properly second in any discussion. Seeing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Passes unanimously. You'll be eligible June 15 to apply. John Michael, recess. Five we'll take a brief recess and reconvene with case number 192 after the break. <laughs> Mr. Chairman, the next case to be presented to the board is 2018-192 as shown here on the zoning map. This is the property located at 1318 Massman Drive in Council District Number 13, not far from the airport. It's an item A appeal involving a short-term rental permit. The appellant is Michelle Resch, and owner of the property is Ms. Resch present. Please come forward, take your seat at the front table. I believe Ms. Resch has some documents to pass out to the board. Uh, staff will assist with passing that around for your review. Is there anyone here in opposition to case number 192? Seeing no one, the appellant will have five minutes to make the desired presentation after we hear from staff with regard to the permit. Okay, Mr. Osborne, how'd you hear about this? Um, what what happened? Any non-permitting violations and anything else? We, how many times it's been written? So this one was brought to our attention by host compliance. We sent a notice on March 4th for a short-term rental and tax violation. Um, looks like the operation started sometime in December of 2016, uh, roughly 48 stays. Um, I had a conversation with her uh, on March 23rd um, instructing her of the actions to take to try and obtain a permit, make sure she understood to take everything down. Um, one, one thing I'm, I am a little concerned with is that the ad says she's 30 minutes away. What do you mean 30 minutes away? It, from the, uh, she would have to explain that better. It just says okay. to get a hold of her. She's Please identify away. yourself for the record, your name and address and 30 minutes away. Yeah. My name is Michelle Resch. Um, I'm the owner of 1318 Massman Drive. This was originally an owner-occupied um, Airbnb. It's a two-bedroom, two-bath. Um, they list it as a condo. It's technically a townhome. I don't have anyone above me, below me, or beside me on the one side. Okay. Um, Do you live there? Um, I don't any longer, no. I live in Hendersonville now with my fiance, uh, roughly 25, depending on traffic, 25, 45 minutes away. Okay. So um, I did get the letter uh, on March 4th. Um, I, the letter was dated March 4th. I didn't get it until the 19th. Um, I travel often uh, for work. So let's so um, ask John Michael, is this still eligible for type two? Uh, RM20 zoning is eligible for uh, the non-owner occupied permits. Okay. Yeah, and there's two other ones in my in this actual subdivision. Part of the packet that I provided to you will, will show that um, I'm not. I don't have any other excuses other than I didn't know I had to have a permit. I know you've heard a variety of that today. Um, I have um, in that packet. You'll see letters of support from my neighbors. Um, I'm active in the HOA. I'm active in our neighborhood watch. Um, and there's a letter of support in there from our, my HOA. Um, I, this is the first time I've owned in Tennessee, and honestly, I, I kind of figured it was my house. I've got permission from the HOA. I was good to go. Um, I got this letter and immediately took action. You'll see when I received the letter was on Monday the 19th, and I came into what I thought would be file for the permit on the 23rd. And the reason there was a lag from that Monday to the Friday was simply I went about gathering all the documents and making sure I had everything to file for my permit. Did you cancel any um, yes. future, all of them? Yes. I have, how many? Um, I couldn't tell you exactly how many they are, but I had them booked all the way through the middle of June. Okay. And immediately, you'll see here, I, I was told how I had to have the uh, tax account set up. I set that up. I paid taxes um, right away the next day. And then we went back and we calculated all taxes that were due to when I started the rental. Okay. And um, there's proof of payment of, in that as well. Okay. Um, 
questions? One, one thing I did want to note, because I've, I've, I know I'm kind of close over into the Donaldson area, and I heard about that, the awful a Airbnb situation over there. Um, I take a lot of pride in my involvement in this Airbnb. It is, um, I have security cameras on the outside, because if anyone knows about this area, this area has been a transitional area and was in the news in the last six months. Um, I also interact with each of my guests. There has not been one complaint on this property. And I have two different homeowners that live, ne one lives next door and one lives across the street that have actually asked and offered to assist with this. So it's a very, um, over 50% residential uh, rentals throughout this, this subdivision. Okay, questions of the applicant? Uh, anything else to add? No, that's it, thank you for your okay. time. Okay, we're gonna close the public hearing. Discussion. I mean, it, it looks like all the reservations were canceled after um, March 23rd. The uh, that which is also the date of the application. Um, I, I, it feels like it's in the category as we have heard in the previous two, which. Um, and those uh, had made the motion for uh, right at three months from the date of the last rental. So I will say this would fall into that category and I will uh, move that the zoning administrator did not err, that the applicant operated prior and that the applicant will be eligible to apply for a short-term rental permit. And I'll say if, for your information for, of the appropriate type, uh, Make sure it's if it if you don't live there that you apply for the uh -huh. type two, uh, and may apply on June fifteenth. Okay, motion has been made. Is there a second? I'll second. The motion has been made and properly seconded. Any discussion? Seeing none. All those in favor of the motion signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed. Passes. You're That's eligible to apply on June fifteenth. What they, they might need a copy of. Mr. Chairman, the next case for the board's consideration is 2018-198. Bridget Pilkington is the appellant and owner of the property located at 1514 McKinney Avenue in Council District Number 6. Heard from the council member on that matter earlier today. It's a short-term rental permit case. Property here shown on the aerial map and again on the face of the property from the assessor's website. Uh, the, is there anyone here in opposition to case number 198? Seeing no one, if the appellant will go ahead and assume the position at the front of the room, staff will make the presentation with regard to the case, and then we'll hear from the appellant thereafter. Okay, yes, give it to our lawyer. Please identify yourself and address for the record and why we're well, Let's hear from Mr. Osborne. Mr. Osborne, why right, are so we here? So this what one happened? was brought to our attention by Host Compliance. Host uh, Compliance, they're just... They're great. Finding everybody in a dental permit. On 12-1 uh, of 2017, we sent a notice and flagged the property. Um, it looks like she came in and applied for the permit uh, on December 12th. On uh, February 6th of 2018, the advertisement was still up, so I had issued a warrant. On February 26th of 2018, it looks like she was issued a permit over that flag. Um, and then on 3.30, our court date, um, legal decided to dismiss it because she had been issued a permit. Although the permit ha was canceled on March 20th. It was canceled, so she got yes, it, sir. and then it just... Because it was issued in error. She had operated before okay. obtaining it. And so how many times did she operate before? Give me just a second. <coughs> uh, 45 or so, and probably five of those are within her permit. Okay. 
Uh, please state your name for the record and address and right, why are you here. Good afternoon. I'm Bridget Pilkington Strad and I live at 1514 McKinney. Okay. Um, just over a year ago, I applied for the permit at my house. It's owner occupied. Um, I followed all the steps to run it legally. Um, I got the fire inspection, everything is on the timeline I gave you. Um, but I failed to go back, come back and pay for it. So you um, did everything. So tell our nice <laughs> viewers on the Metro National right. Network you have to pay. what you have to do to get a short-term rental. This is a quiz. What do you have to do to get a short-term rental permit here in Nashville? Oh, well, uh, you have to um, send a letter to your neighbors. Yep. You have to Ooh. have the insurance. Mm -hmm. Of how much? A million dollar insurance. Yes. Mm -hmm. You have to have um, Fire inspect, uh, smoke detectors, smoke detectors and, and have a fi uh, fire inspector fire come marshal. out and approve. And you, after everything's approved, you affidavits. go back. Affidavits. Affidavits, mm -hmm. yes, yes. And then after that, you take all of those pieces of paper, right. send it to Metro, bring it down here with $50. So you did everything but yes. send us $50. Right. But when I got the letter, I was like, I just, felt like the sick feeling in my stomach and I'm like I went back to pay I'm like oh god I forgot to pay so I came up was like I'm here to pay for my permit I've been approved I've done all the steps and they're like oh well it expired so they renewed it they said I I'd have to get a another fire inspect inspector to come out did that got approved came back to pay got my permit um, but in the meantime had got the summons for the court um, then when I went to court um, they gave me my options and uh, I took my, I had to take my uh, listing down by March 28th, which I did to be in compliance. Why didn't you take it down before that? Because I, I thought I just had to go and pay, like I forgot to pay. So I've already had been approved in my mind because I've been approved and I'm like, oh, let me go pay to get this totally legal. Um, I thought that's all that was the missing piece, okay. basically. So what are you asking us today? So I'm asking um, that my short-term rental permit be um, legal again um, and be able to operate my owner-occupied, very small studio, um, Airbnb, no complaints, and people, it's a very small, uh, dead-end street, very quiet. We rent, we rent to one to two people. Okay, and as you know, at the top of the meeting, Councilman Brett Withers of the 6th District uh, oh, supports yes. your uh, appeal. Yes, he yeah, does. Yeah, he said tomorrow. Yeah, he, 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 yeah, the word he used was tomorrow. So, um, questions of the applicant? Do you have anything else to add? Um, Nope, I would just appreciate my permit being reinstated. Okay, thank you. We're going to close the public hearing discussion. Sure, I'll take this one. Um, seems like a simple mistake that was made, and she knew she needed a permit. She tried to get the permit, just a mistake. Um, and you said you canceled your bookings. I think I read that in here. And so, any more discussion? Nope. Okay, then I will move um, that the zoning administrator did not err and that um, we allow the applicant to be eligible to apply again for the permit on June 1st. Okay, motion's been made. Is there a second? First? She said June 1st. Mm -hmm. Okay, second. Motion's been made and properly seconded. Any discussion? Mm -hmm. Seeing none, all those in favor of the motion signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Passes. You're eligible to reapply on June 1st. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, the next case for the board is 2018-199. John Clardy has the is the appellant and owner of the property at 2801 Alhambra Circle, shown here on the zoning map, shown here on the aerial, as an item A case involving a short-term rental permit. Is there anyone here in opposition to case one, number 199? Seeing no one, the appellant will have five minutes to make the desired presentation after we hear from staff with regard to case 199. Mr. Osborne. This was brought to our attention by host compliance. Um, we sent a notice on 1027 2017. Um, it appears that he removed the listing shortly thereafter. The last day that we have is from October, and there is another one previously from August. Um, I don't have any other complaints on this one. Okay. Please state your name and address for the record and why you're here. 
My name is John Clorty. Uh, I'm the owner of uh, the property 2801 Alhambra Circle, Nashville, Tennessee. Uh, coming, I got the I got the notice that I uh, was in violation. In violation of the <laughs> um, Mr. Osborne is absolutely correct. Was n I personally was not aware that I needed to have a permit. That's not a great excuse. I don't have a great answer why I did not do that. So what did you do when you got Mr. Osborne's letter? Uh, I took down my advertisement. All of them? Yes, I took that. I only had it on Airbnb. Okay, but no future listing. You have any future I, listings? I did have a future listing that was confirmed. It was a few weeks after I received this notice. I didn't want it to completely rupture my reviews. Ah, so and remember I said there are two reasons people don't want to cancel future listings. They want to keep their five-star rating or they want the money. So you wanted your five-star rating. Correct. And when was that? Was that in October? That listing. When was that October? December. So I received it October twenty seventh, I believe. So there was a few weeks later. I wanted to keep that. Okay. Any other questions for the applicant? Anything? And then why did it take you from December to March to? I had a lot going on with work, and December, January, I was traveling a lot, and I just could not get to all the requirements that were on the checklist that I needed to adhere to. But got to it in February, uh, got the checklist, got the uh, uh, million dollar insurance coverage, uh, notified my neighbors, talked to my neighbors, talked to, uh, sent an email to my councilwoman to let her know I was doing this. Um, no, that's not on the list, but it's also well, a nice I, thing to do. Yeah, wanted to make sure, you know. Sure. I, I'm, I'm not trying to, uh, you know, this is an owner-occupied situation. I travel a lot for work. It's something I, you know, want to run a room out here and there when I can. Uh, and uh, all I'm looking for is, uh, you know, to see if I can shorten the yep. time. Okay, very good. We're going to close the public hearing discussion. Yeah, I, you know, I, I, I do believe that, you know, at the last running is important. I know it takes people time. Um, <laughs> especially when the last running is confirmed by host and the, what we have for code. So um, I, I do think that there should be a penalty for the uh, rental after being told not to. Um, but since the last rental was in December and this is the middle of May, uh, the, the typical penalty that we would impose is, for the most part, already passed. So, make so that I, would, motion. I would move that we um, and the, the, in the item 8, the zoning administrator uh, did not err, um, and the applicant would be eligible for a permit on June 1st. Okay. Motion's been made. Is there a second? I'll second. Motion's been made and properly seconded. Any discussion? Um, I won't vote in favor. I think it that's too lenient. I, I see what you're saying about the last day was December, but the date of the filing is um, what I typically go by in my, the way I look at it, and I would do. Would you, what would you do? I would do four months from the date of filing. Do you want to amend your motion? Yeah, Which, I mean. I don't think he's going to amend it. Yeah, <laughs> okay. I don't know. And we may not agree, okay. Okay. which is fine. No, we can talk it through, but, the, and, and, and it's fine okay. if we don't, but the, you know, again, and I, okay. and I, I just look at it is you know, when did you stop your bad behavior and if you and, and, and initiate the process and so to me you know it, it i'm looking at you know if you looked at you know i mean even if you if you looked at the end of june which would be three that's still a six month penalty from the last rental and so um I mean, I don't, again, we all have to agree okay, for him to have any relief today, but so that, <laughs> does that change your mind? No, I really go by the, when someone makes the effort to come down here and okay. file, that's. So, so that would we're be three months from the last, that would be three months from the last, from the date of the applicant, it, 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 the middle, if I said, he, it was uh, applied on uh, March 28th, so if you said June 28th, that'd be three months instead of the four you wanted. Does that change your mind? Well, I guess we all have to try to agree or it gets delayed. Um, 
It's not my preference, but I can go along with it. So do you want to? I'll amend my motion to June 28th. And then you'll, you're fine with that? Yes. Okay. Um, motion's been amended and properly seconded. Any more discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor of the motion signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Passes unanimously, so he'll be eligible. To apply for June apply. 28th. Okay, June 28th. Okay. Good. John Thank you for your time. The next case is 2018 203. Carrie Stringer is the appellant. The main revo uh, revocable trust is the technical owner of the property located at 4500 Colorado Avenue, shown here uh, in, the, in the Silver Park neighborhood. The request is for a variance from fence height requirements. As you know, Mr. Chairman, to install a fence does not require a permit. However, you got to meet all the requirements for fences, even though it doesn't require a permit. So the variance request is for a taller fence would otherwise be allowed on a portion of the property here. The aerial photograph shows you the neighborhood, not too far from the kind of epicenter of Sylvan Park there in the commercial district near the roundabout. The site plan submitted and the elevation submitted show the proposed fence as conceived by the architect. From my recent site visit on a beautiful sunny day, a Chamber of Commerce day here in Nashville, Tennessee, face the property in the lower right-hand corner and the view across the street in the upper, then the views up and down Colorado here uh, to give a sense of the neighborhood. Is there anyone here in opposition to case number 203? Seeing none, the appellant will have five minutes to make the desired presentation to the board. Staff members, you have the board packet in front of you with all the needed information. Uh, sir, just please introduce yourself by name and address to make the desired presentation. My name is Kerry Stringer, I live at 522 Patterson Street, Nashville, Tennessee. Um, I also have additional pictures into that that my client sent me recently that if y'all would like to see, it's just the side of the house we're talking about putting the fence on. Um, why do you have such a tall fence? How tall? Uh, he's wanting six feet where currently it's allowed at 30 inches um, on the spot we're wanting to do it. He's wanting to line it up with an existing carport that is there. Um, they have a sunroom on the side of their house that as Ed Lee's and other restaurants in the neighborhood have gotten more popular, um, especially during the later of the week, starting Wednesday and into the later of the week, um, people park on their strip of grass right outside and they kind of, to use his words, they feel like a fish in a fishbowl sitting in their sunroom on that side of their house. And so, so people- I'm sorry, to interrupt. There, oh, yeah. there, there's an existing fence there now. There's an existing carport that we want to line up the fence. Well, no, I mean, I like I said, um, well, I thought on, on Google Maps, that, I mean, there was there seemed to be a short. There was vegetation there before. Okay. Because it, it. I've never seen any of that though. It was gone before I was hired. So. Okay. Yeah, there seemed to be a, a small fence, and the drawing that you provided appeared to show the new fence where the old fence was. I mean, how, do you know how far fun. that fence is going to be from the road? It would be approximately 11 and a half, 12 feet from the road. Yeah, I mean, it seemed to be a pretty good distance. It wasn't right on the property line. Right. Or is it on the property line? It's a foot, it's 14 inches off of the pro right. interior of the property line. But you just have, you have that much right of way between. Right. And there is a, I, I do know there's an existing picket fence on the rear okay. of the existing carport, but I don't even know how long it goes, to be honest. Okay. okay. So, um, John Michael, give us the 101 about privacy fences, how tall they can be, and why we have these rules. Hold on, i got to read law to you. You don't know that off the top of your head? Come on. Unlike my Bible, Mr. Chairman, I've not memorized this entire document. <laughs> uh, the folks that live them would be so proud of you. Well, primarily for the benefit of counsel. Yes. Yeah. John, if you, I have it if you want me to go ahead and read it. Uh, yeah, I've just okay. looked to it. It's 1720-12-040, subsection 26, under the permitted obstructions into setbacks, screening walls, or fences. Perhaps as my voice fades, I'll hand that off to council at this point. Okay. Okay. Why do we have these rules? Okay. I'm sorry, John, and your voice was fading, so I That's actually couldn't hear you. Yeah, I, I actually couldn't hear you. So, uh, number 26 under uh, 1712040E, screening of walls and fences, the maximum permitted height measured from the finished grade level on the side of the wall or fence with the greatest vertical exposure shall be A, two and one half feet in height with 10 feet of a street right of way. Open fences such as chain link or those of similar nature are permitted to be six feet in height. Um, B, six feet in height with the remainder of, of the required front setback. And C, eight feet in height within the required side or rear setback or within any platted common open space. 
and I think that the, I remember us having a case in Belmont area that was on the corner. They wanted a side fence, and 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 I think the rule was if it if it's ten feet in, it can you can go higher. Right. And their property line was right on the road, and this property line is ten feet off the road, and then they want to go a foot past that. So I mean, to me, there's an effective ten foot buffer. Yeah, and the real reason the Belmont case was people kind of pulling out and turning. They said that yeah. it would hurt their vision and, you know, potentially cause accidents. So this seems to just keep the, we have some very good pictures that the applicant has given us of cars parked nearby, the very popular places, Edley's and Local Taco. And Do we have to see if there's anything else in close? Yeah, is there anything else? Okay. Well, so you have more questions. Close the public hearing. Um, yeah. And so to me, and there were also some red solo cups uh, on the lawn too. So, you know, I think there's a situation of fence would probably do well and Edley's and McCabe's and local taco are not gonna get less popular. So I think the parking is gonna continue in the indefinite future. And, and, and because of the extraordinary street setback uh, or right of way that, you know, that they're distance from the public property, I think. Yep. Okay, do you want to make a motion? Uh, yeah, I'll move that we approve the variance from the fence height uh, for the uh, proposed fence that was uh, presented to us in your plan um, at a maximum of six feet uh, because of the unique nature of the corner lot and the fact that it will not present any uh, known uh, safety issues. Okay, motion's been made. Is there a second? Second. Motion's been made and properly seconded. Any more discussions? Seeing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Passes unanimously. Good luck. Thanks. John Michael. Mr. Chairman, the next uh, case for the board's consideration is 2018-208. Jimmy Brooks is the appellant and James Mason, the owner of the property at 3203 Curtis Street, up in Council District Number 2. The aerial photograph of the property is shown here. It's, uh, so site plan submitted shown here. The request is for variances from number one, lot size restrictions, and number two, sidewalk requirements in the R8 zoning district in order to construct a duplex. This has been referred to the board under the sections pertaining to lot size under the uh, bulb regs and also the sidewalk section. Uh, the request is for no construction and no contribution to the sidewalk fund for the sidewalk issue. You already have planning's recommendation in your case file. Uh, the appellants are present. Is there anyone here in opposition to case number 208? Seeing none, you'll have uh, five minutes to make the desired presentation. Just introduce yourselves by name and address, please. Yes, my name is Jimmy Brooks. I'm the contractor uh, working with uh, Juliet Mason to uh, do this project. And uh, I live at the 1055 Little Maribone Road in Ashland City. Juliet Mason, 3203 Curtis Street. Okay, so tell us about this lot size variance. Why are you asking for a lot size variance? Well, sir, in this case, this uh, was originally an illegal lot. They sort of had to cut the corner off um, uh, just on the back corner, and that's what makes it ineligible for the, the minimum 8,000 square feet. Uh, what they're trying to do is uh, uh, build some uh, affordable housing for people to keep the price at a, uh, you know, it's, it's a big thing now. What's, people. What's affordable nowadays? Uh, well, listen, uh, you know, in that, the 200, the high 200s in the range in this area. But I'm doing it for another, we're doing, trying to do it in 189. So, but the difference is, is if, if we get the one lot versus the two, then more people can afford this house. That's what we're trying to yep. do. Okay. Um, sidewalk. The sidewalk, this is a unique situation. It, it's, it's a real steep drop off. What would happen if we had to do this sidewalk, uh, we would have to cut into the, si into, the, into the property and then build a retaining wall. So it's not just the cost of the uh, sidewalk that would be incurred, but the retaining wall because it drops off pretty steep coming down to the road there. Have you talked to your council person about this? Metro council person? No, no, so we've not. Okay, Councilman Hastings. Um, so continue. Well, that's it. We would like to uh, build the lot, even though it's uh, it's uh, it's a little short on the square footage. Uh, from the drawings that we've submitted, it, it, there's plenty of room. It's not like we're we're just losing a little bit of the backyard, is what it amounts to on one of the houses. And uh, the other is the significant. Uh, it would look odd the uh, the way it comes down. We'd have to cut back 11 feet and then uh, build the retaining wall. 
And if we had to pay the in lieu of fee, again, we're making the houses more expensive. So we're trying to make affordable housing for people. Okay. Questions for the applicant? Do you have anything else to add? Okay. Thanks for being here. Um, we're going to close the public hearing. Discussion. And you have Planning Commission's recommendations in front of us, which they're not for this, by the way. Not for the sidewalk. The sidewalk. Experience. They didn't evaluate the lot yeah, size. The, the, right. Yeah, Planning mm -hmm. Commission just does sidewalks. So. Well, the challenge with, with I mean, it's, it's not unusual for us to grant a variance for strange shaped lots, lots that are different from uh, the neighbors because of a creek or whatnot. Uh, I get it. The, the, the question is, at what point do you stop? And is this in that area? Is this too much or is this not? I mean, it's a 20% it's a almost, um, you know, it's 20% less uh, square footage than is required. Um, I think it's maybe in the gray area, the lot next to it. You know, the, the little triangle, I don't, I think that's clearly in the, well, sorry, it's just too small. Mm -hmm. um, and so I don't know, uh, I, 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 assuming that, uh, I done my geometry, but assuming that it actually is too small. But um, yeah, I, uh, I don't know. I mean, you know, on some of these, they don't ask for any additional variances. I actually don't generally have a problem with small lot construction. I think that's one way to make things affordable. <clears throat> I am curious, uh, John Michael, if if they're re required to put sidewalks on both streets or just the front street, uh, Curtis. I believe that was just triggered on the front street, on the actual Curtis side, not on the Summit side. That is correct. That's what they told us. Oh. Curtis. Just on the just of the 50 Curtis, feet for Curtis. The front of it, also the back of the house. Right. Okay, any other thoughts about this? Anyone have a motion? Well, I don't have oh, yes. yes. What's the zoning on the adjacent properties, or, or is it all R8? Do we know? Don't have that information. Okay. Well, it is all R8. All, all of the it, lots. all the lots exactly. in that there's area some, are R8. There's some several splits already there, and it's all, all the whole street is like R8. Okay, thank you. Thank you. I'd say these. Lot size variances are difficult, especially there was one earlier today which wasn't really a true hardship. But this is a uniquely shaped lot that was, this when the road was built, part of the lot was taken. Um, so to me, that's the hardship. And there are, I know it's zoned R8, but there is an R6 zoning, and if this had been zoned R6, you could be allowed to build um, the duplex. So, I think I would make two motions today, though. Go ahead. I would move on the lot size that we approve the variance request due to the unusual shape of the lot um, that was made by the when the road was developed. Okay, the motion's been made. Is there a second? I'll second. Okay. Motion's been made and properly seconded. Any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor of the motion signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Passes unanimously. Second motion. Well, I would move on that that there is not a hardship and that they either build the sidewalk on Curtis Street or pay into the in lieu fund. Okay, motion's been made. Is there a second? I'll second. Uh, I'll, and would you accept an amendment that if the, if for whatever reason Summit Avenue is triggered by the sidewalk variance that, that we do grant a variance for Summit Avenue? Yes. Okay. Motion's been made and properly updated to um, any other discussion. Seeing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Passes unanimously. Good luck. Good luck. Thank you. Thank you. John Michael. Maybe you to talk just a little bit about lot size variances just because you raised the issue, of, raised a question about that. Um, that is, lot size variances generally are a little bit tricky, um, but you do still have to find a hardship. So I was glad to see that the board did that. One thing to remember in lot size variance applications is it's legal for the board to grant them so long as it does not uh, undermine the zoning, the base zoning. So if, if your variance, and I bring it up because you said at what point do we stop, if your variance could be viewed as such as to, 
that it undermines the base zoning that's in that area, then at that point it should not be granted. But those are those are some things that we can kind of um, talk about more at another time. But I thought since you all both had raised questions about right. specifically about lot size, size variances, I would at least mention that that's when it becomes to be too much, is it when it's undermining the base zoning there. Okay. And that's also why I ask about the uh, zoning around that area. Sure. Okay. Thank, awesome. you. Thank you, John Michael. Next case. Thank you. 2018-213 is an appeal brought by Tim Bland, the appellant and owner of the property at 1072 First Avenue North here in the downtown area. The request is an item A appeal involving a short-term rental permit. A previously issued permit renewal was denied based on a change in ownership of the, per, of the property. Uh, and there were a couple of rentals after that expiration, so technically the uh, denial is predicated on operation without a permit. So this is one where there is a 12, months, a 12 month wait that the board has the opportunity to reduce if you find facts appropriate for such reduction. Uh, Tim Bland, as I mentioned, is the appellant and owner. Is there anyone here in opposition to case number 213? Seeing none, I will point to the aerial photograph of the subject property, not too far below the Jefferson Street Bridge there, I believe. Face of the property into the uh, development. Uh, we'll hear from staff first. Out thereafter, we'll have five minutes to hear from the appellant. Mr. Osborne. So like John said, they did have a permit issued on March 31st, 2017. On uh, July 25th, 2017, there was an ownership change. Uh, the permit was canceled due to that ownership change on February 8, 2018, and on March 2nd of 2018, a notice was sent for not having a permit. It appears that around March 16th-ish, the advertisement was removed. Okay. Can you repeat? You said there was a permit on March 17th, and then what happened? Um, on March 31st, 2017, they had a permit. The ownership change was July 25th, 2017. And on February 8th of 2018, it was canceled due to that ownership change. Oh, okay. And then do you know what type of, what type of permit? I believe it's multifamily, type three. Which we now merely refer to as non-owner occupied, of course, so after the passage of 608. Okay. So please state your name for the record and your address and why we're here. Tim Bland, uh, I'm the owner of 1072 First Avenue North. First of all, I'd like to thank the board for the privilege of being able to present my case to you today. And after four hours of watching you perform, I am so thankful you're doing this and not me. <laughs> so, so why are we here? Uh, we're here because um, I'm kindly requesting the board to approve the removal of the STRP permit restriction from my property. So what the, happened with the ownership? The, well, uh, the reason for that request is, is simply my own ignorance. I assure you that there was no intentional uh, no intention, uh, intentional regarding, a violation regarding that, the permit. As Mr. Osborne has stated, I, I had a permit, which I got last year. We ran it the way we were supposed to run it. Um, in, uh, in fact, we got the permit. We did not actually start renting it until June of last, last year. Uh, so for those three months, I obtained the proper permit, did all the things I needed to do. Uh, I also got, as you've seen, I handed out to you, I got the uh, appropriate accounts with the uh, Tennessee uh, Department of Revenue as well as the hotel occupancy and made those tax uh, collections and payments as well. In July of last year, I was uh, advised to change the name of the deed to the LLC business that we have uh, and not the personal. Some lawyer probably advised so, you that. Is that correct? Uh, yeah. So um, I... Now, at the time, I was well aware of the fact that you couldn't transfer permits upon the sale of property. I knew that, but I wasn't selling the property. I was simply changing the name on the property, so I, w I didn't why, give it a second thought. Why did you think that was such a good idea? Well, to put for liability standpoint. But there's things called insurance. Well, that's, I, I had the million dollar insurance. I did all the due I diligence. Know. So anyway, I was aware of that, uh, that we couldn't change at, at sale. It wasn't for sale. Um, I just changed the name on it. I didn't even get a second of thought. Um, then you got the letter. Then I got the letter. At the time we got the letter, we did pull it off Airbnb, and we did make a, other arrangements for, uh, for, the, for renters. So you pulled it off. Did you cancel all the permit? Well, we future? didn't have to. We have a second, we have a second uh, rental contract. But there weren't any future? No. Uh -huh. OK. Um, so anyway, all this time, I, as you've seen from the documents I've given you, I've continued to pay the taxes, collect the taxes, pay the taxes, done everything as, as I was probably should have. 
Um, I just was not aware of it until we filed for the renewal. That's all. Is, it, is this is this eligible for type two? So I mean, so there's I mean there's no issue with. I mean, we just have to decide what do we. Yeah, the short answer is yes. It's so, the, the, so this is strictly just a rented prior, rent, rented without a permit because of the sale and change of ownership. And we, and, yeah, and change. we don't have to decide if the type two, whether okay. it's eligible. Okay. okay, perfect. Anything else? It was said that it was a type three permit because it was. It was a multifamily under the prior scheme where you had types one, two, and three. Now uh, we really have owner occupied, non owner occupied, and those which had been previously categorized as type three. Are regarded as non owner occupied permits. Okay. So it's just now one or two. Okay. <laughs> okay. Any, any other questions of the applicant? Anything else to add? No. Okay, we're going to close up hearing. Discussion. Well, I mean, uh, to me, this is this is that, you know, I, I get if you if you sell your property that it doesn't go with it. I think this is the type of thing that you just didn't know. I think it's, mm -hmm. it's a bit of a technicality. Paid taxes. Yeah, so I mean, I, I, I'll move the zoning administrator didn't err and that the applicant is eligible to apply for a permit tomorrow. Okay, motion's been made. Is there a second? Second. Motion's been made and properly seconded. Any more discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Passes unanimously. You will be eligible to up, reapply tomorrow. So. I will be on that phone bright and early at 7 Very good. John Michael. <laughs> Thank you. Mr. Chairman, the next case for the board is 2018-216 involving the property at 1106 Kirkwood Avenue. This is a short-term rental permit case. Brian Smith is the appellant and owner of the property. He's present. Is there anyone here in opposition to case number 216? Seeing none, we'll hear from staff first on this particular case. Then Mr. Smith will have five minutes to make the desired presentation. The zoning map here shows the area in question. The aerial photograph shows the property in question. The assessor's website shows you a lot of trees and a little bit of house. All right, Mr. Osborne. So this was brought to our attention by host compliance. It looks like it's been operating since our best records indicate November 2014. Um, we sent a notice on March 4th for uh, short-term rental and tax violation. Looks like he removed it on or before March 18th. Um, looks like there are about 52 stays in that time. 52 stays in what time? In that period from beginning to end. There, so, there, was, okay. there was a note, I think, in the in the file that said um, two of the three units independently advertised. Is that from? Is that your note or is that? Uh, I don't I don't generate y'all's packets, so I may have a little different. Well, I think it was it was on. Let's see. Make sure I got the right thing. I think that. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Yes. It's uh. Yeah, it's 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 this sheet. It, there does appear to be several units for this. It says this property is a triplex. Two of the three units were independently advertised and rented for STRP. But so are we talking? We're talking about the whole property. Or are we talking about? That is for the B unit. Um, the A unit. If you give me just a moment, I'll add them up for A and, and the other one. And do you know if this is a owner occupied or type two? One is an owner occupied. One was used as an owner occupied. One was used as a type two. And again, Mr. Smith will be able to speak to that more eloquently and more precisely. But that's what our records indicated. Okay, let's get started. Identify yourself for the record and address. And my name is Brian Smith, and I live at 1106 Kirkwood Avenue. I bought that property in 2004. And I've lived there since 2010, okay. uh, post real estate bubble burst. Um, I, I did uh, independently advertise two of those units um, off and on through over the period of time. I started in 2015, actually. Um, so you got this letter on March 4th. Right. Because you've been doing this for a while without Absolutely. a permit. So I have a permit. That. I was under the uh, impression that since I have a commercial usage zoning on a multifamily dwelling that I live in, and I also have a landlord permit, which I've had for many years, registered with the fire department, I was under the impression that, of course, they can't be talking about an owner-occupied multifamily commercial usage with a landlord permit. 
So if Council Lady Berkeley Allen was watching this on the Metro National Network, she would be looking at you saying, have you not been watching TV, reading the newspaper? We have legislation related to short-term rentals. Sure. You did not know. I did not know. And how did you not know? Here's how I did not know, by what we just talked about, the confusion between um, what is a type two, previously known as a type three, now we don't know if it's, you know, they got rid of the type three, and it's kind of a, it's kind of a, you said it earlier today, this is not crystal clear. So immediately when I received the letter on March 14th. I said it I was got, not crystal clear related to an HOA language. Not, our laws are crystal clear. John Michael, how many people have successfully applied and gotten permits here in Davidson County? Approximately 3,750 as of today. Um, Mr. Chairman, not counting the ones that have previously obtained permits that have just let them expire since then. Of note, this is R8 zoning, lest there be any question about the notion of commercial zoning. This is zoned residential, one or two family. The triplex is considered a legally non-conforming use that is allowed to operate as a triplex, no problem there. But I didn't want there to be any confusion that this was zoned commercially. It is probably taxed commercially by the tax assessor's office, and sometimes that is a point of confusion. Okay, so you got the letter on the 4th, and then what happened? Let me just reiterate, he said sometimes that is a point of confusion, which is where my confusion lies. In my $8,200 worth of property taxes that went up by 40% last year, um, that was kind of solidifying. And I'm not arguing the fact that I don't need a permit because I'm, I'm on the same page now. I understand that I do. So You want to be 3751 Absolutely. So why? I took down my advertisements. Okay. I, I did every step to comply. I spoke with several people in the codes office that when I asked about the owner-occupied multifamily situation, I did not get an answer because um, they also acknowledge the fact that that's kind of a gray area. What's a gray area? What type of permit I would be applying for. If you rent less than 30 days, there's one type of permit that you should apply for, and it's the one that you're trying to get today. Absolutely. Um, and the further explanation of why I advertised two, two bedroom units rather than one four bedroom unit um, is because I, I want to avoid the problems that I see all over. Um, with the big parties and we govern it very closely. We're right there. Um, in my time, I host US ambassadors, Grammy award winners, NFL philanthropists, um, and occasionally Vanderbilt patients, patients that are receiving extended treatment. We live right in 12 South, which is one of the big tourist areas. Um, so I just, I'm not saying that ignorance is any excuse, but I was simply seemed to be uninformed. Um. Now, okay. Your council person says that he supports the, uh, your application, says you've reached out to him and you may be doing a historic B&B. I inquired about information regarding that. Okay. Other questions of the applicant? Do you have anything else to add? No, sir. Okay. We will close the public hearing discussion. It's not really all that different than some of the other ones we heard. I would say, um, I just want to be sure I understand. Maybe I can ask the applicant this question sure. if you don't mind. Um, it looks like there were no more bookings after March 10th. We don't have anything in our <coughs> files. So did you have to cancel any? We forgot to ask that question. Yes. You did. How many? Okay. Over 30. Over 30. So you didn't care about your five-star rating? I only cared about the law. The law. <laughs> First time today. Someone the law. Okay. Four, four hours to hear what the right answer was, and you're the uh, one person to give it. Okay. Does that answer your question? I think so. Um, okay. it, it does. I'm Do just you want to make them a 30? That's a lot of bookings to cancel, actually. It is. So. Um, okay. 
second. Um, given, <coughs> excuse me, those facts, I would <coughs> think I'm losing my voice as well. It's going around. <laughs> I would um, move that the zoning administrator did not err and that we um, assess a two-month penalty from the time of the date of filing, which was April 3rd, so that would be a June 3rd eligibility to apply for the permit. Okay. Motion has been made. Is there a second? I'll second. Motion has been made and properly seconded. Any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor of the motion signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Passes. You're eligible to reapply June 3rd. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. John Michael. Chairman, next case is 2018-217. Michael Williams is the appellant um, for the property located at 1912 Truett Avenue. The request is for variances from number one, the sidewalk requirements, and number two, the rear setback requirements. This is in Council District Number Six. You've already heard from the district council member with regard to his take on the property. You also have in your packet planning's recommendation with regard to the sidewalk requirements specifically. So the zoning map shows a proposed layout for the HPR that has been contemplated there at the intersection of uh, North 20th Street and Truett. This is, of course, the sneaky little back way to park if you're trying to go to dinner at 2 Jack 10 and can't find parking in the immediately eligible parking lot. But nobody knows that, so don't tell. The area photograph here shows the property in its most recent configuration. Uh, the, proposed, the site plan shows a proposed layout. And of course, this is uh, drawing attention here to the rear uh, near the alley where there would be the rear setback in play. From my recent site visit, the view back 20th going toward um, Eastland, the face of the property in the lower right hand corner, and the views on the two frontages that would be in play for the sidewalk variance. Is there anyone here in opposition to case number 217? Seeing none, the appellants will have five minutes to make the desired presentation. So before we get started, I remind everyone Councilman Withers, who represents this area, expressed he had um, no objections to the rear setback requirement. He did not support the sidewalk variance. So please state your name and address for the record. My name is Michael Williams and I work with DBS Engineers and I'm representing uh, Mr. Wright on the owner of 1912 Truett Avenue. Okay, so why are we here? What, what's going on? So um, how the, the Metro ordinance reads for setbacks, it's based on either A, B, uh, front vacate of the building or be the type of road but what it does not specify is if you have an HPR and one house faces one direction and the other house faces another direction so in our case the existing house is facing um, Truett Avenue and the proposed house is facing 20th Street uh, North and um, so the rear setback which would be the side setback for the proposed home would be five feet based off the rotation of the building. Um, however, um, in the area, there's five houses right across the alleyway that have accessory structures, garages that are offset 10 feet. Um, and that's actually, and that's per the, uh, I was permitted by 17.12.04. That's uh, for an accessory structure per garage. And um, to main, maintain continuity in the area, uh, my client is requesting 10 feet instead of 5 feet, which the rotation would allow. Um, How do you need 10 feet to be required 10 feet? Well, so um, the original intent was for his daughter, this was going to be a primary residence, his daughter, um, they wanted to put trampoline in the backyard. This was going to allow for uh, more, for a larger backyard, basically. and. Um, my client, Chris, w is willing to forfeit an extra 10 feet on the west side. Um, so he, and that's, that's actually going to decrease his building envelope. So he's not trying to get a, a bigger house here. And so let me read a letter of opposition from Marie Wingett. I'm writing in opposition of the zoning appeal for this property. 20th Street, which runs next to the lot, is already a very narrow street. Having something that sits in the setback would cause a visual hazard to drivers and safety of walkers since there's no sidewalk you must step onto the setback to get out of the way of traffic. This is a huge lot. If, there's, if it is truly a single family residence, there's no way that anything within a reasonable side will encroach on the setbacks. For the safety of the neighborhood aesthetics, I strongly 
I am strongly in opposition to this request on Marie Wingate. Okay, so she said that's a, a safety issue, which that doesn't really make sense because um, it is, you can't actually have a uh, accessory structure, a garage within, the, within 10 feet. You can't have a building, the actual building within 10 feet. So the, the difference is one's an accessory structure and one's what the actual house. The street is narrow and the lot is huge. Why do you need that? That's what she's saying. Um, well, so originally, I, I wanted to continue this, but originally he, he wanted to have a trampoline, have a backyard for his daughter. He found out there was a sex offender uh, adjacent to the house, so he's no longer actually going to live there. He's going to sell the property. Um, with that said, he still wants to have a backyard for the home. He thinks that's going to make that, the home look better. Um, additionally, designing this house this way will um, actually decrease impervious area just from a stormwater design standpoint. He's actually decreasing his building envelope. He's not just trying to maximize everything. And um, like I said, it, it will maintain continuity in the area because How is it across the other alleyway. the building envelope wanting bigger setbacks? Um, uh, I'm sorry. So the, uh, he said he was willing to forfeit 10 feet on the west side. But he couldn't do that. As the law says, and that's why you're here asking for a variance. Well, I, was ju I just wanted to explain to you all that he isn't just trying to get the biggest house possible. He just wants to have a, you know, a normal house but have a backyard. And I, I feel like that's a reasonable request. He's, he's keeping the existing house. He's not the, the existing house is staying. Is that that's correct. It's, it's an HPR lot, so it's HPR eligible. Right, but I mean, but you're not tearing down the front house. You're just building a house in the back of the lot. Yes, sir. Okay. And so what about the sidewalk? Why Can we just stay on this? Okay, we'll stay on this. Sure. Because a picture is worth a thousand words, a diagram as well. And this was a lot of writing, and I don't fully understand where you're asking for the 10 feet. So can um, you draw it's, it's it on this? It's mainly based off just the rotation. Well, I need you to draw it on this or so, show me. I need someone to show me what, where, this, where this variance request is happening. Okay. It's a 10 feet on the alley, right? Yes, sir. So this was where? So this is the alley? This is the alleyway. So right now this is the proposed, this is the proposed garage. And that is showing 10 feet. So okay, and it's supposed to be 20. It's supposed to be 20. Okay. But it based, based off this house facing that way. But this, this house facing that way, that should be a so side that ha Right. But they're considering, codes is considering that a rear? There, there's nothing that specifically talks about it in the ordinance. So that's why I'm easy to. Okay. So the setback variance is from the alley? Yes. Okay. From the right of way. Alleyways. From the right of way. <laughs> from the property line from the alley, right? Yeah. Well, Public Works will probably require a forfeit right of way dedication to widen the alley at some point. Yes. Is that what you're referring to? Yeah. Okay. It, yeah. Same line. <laughs> The sidewalk, is that? Yeah, um, uh, go ahead for sidewalk. I'm so the sidewalks, um, it, it, from, a, from a design standpoint, it, there were, if we were to put sidewalks there, it would, uh, number one, you, it, you, you, you basically couldn't actually design it because there's not enough fall. There's roughly 18 inches over 113 feet, and there's just not enough fall to actually put a pipe in there and have three foot of cover. Okay, so which, why not pay into the fund then? Okay, so I knew you were going to say that. Um, so, um, y'all are familiar with the sidewalk calculator, right? And no, what is, use it. What are you talking about the square footed, I mean the, the linear feet, is that what you mean? Yeah, I mean you just click on the parcel and it just tells you if, if the sidewalks are required. Um, well, they're required here because of the new so legislation. So on, on Truett, uh, it, this is another intersection type deal. Mm -hmm. And on Truett Avenue, if you click all the properties on um, Truett Avenue. We're not talking about the other properties. We're talking about this property. Well. So why don't you want to pay into the sidewalk fund? Because there, is, there shouldn't be sidewalks required on 20th Street. Because but the, the only reason John is. John Michael, tell us what happened last year in the Metro Council. Metro Council passed Council Bill 2016-493, which took effect on July 1, 2017, and uh, greatly updated 
the sidewalk requirements throughout all of the jurisdiction of the Metropolitan Government, including the property at 1912 Truett. Um, on a parcel by parcel basis, we analyze whether or not that sidewalk requirement is triggered. If so, whether or not the sidewalk fund or the in lieu fund, as it is often called, is in fact an option for a given property. And based upon those determinations, the uh, builder or uh, applicant for a building permit has the opportunity to, number one, go ahead and submit a site plan with the sidewalks as required. Number two, make a payment into the fund if in fact they are eligible as an alternative to construction. Or number three, file an appeal to the BZA to try to get out of any or all of that. Um, sometimes uh, the chairman will ask me how narrow was the vote on that bill when it went through. It was a unanimous vote, of course, Mr. Chairman. That's the law now. So when we said, talk about things like sidewalks should not be required at this location, that may be exactly right on a subjective analysis. But the objective analysis, which is law in this city, says they should, they are required. And that's what we're stuck with uh, at Coates. And we are not the legislative body, so you have to build sidewalks here or... Res respectfully, I, I think you're missing what I'm trying to explain. Okay. Truett Avenue, that you all want to build sidewalks on Truett Avenue, that's fine. Mm -hmm. 20th Street, there is no sidewalks anywhere. It, 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 this, this property is located at an intersection. So but if you don't want to build sidewalks, you have to pay into the fund. So that's how I start off this question. Why don't you want to pay into the fund then? It, it just doesn't. It just doesn't make sense because there's no other houses that are required on 20th Street. What doesn't make sense to me is going against what John Michael just said. That's the law. Wait, are you, and wait, are you saying that if, if it were one parcel in on 20th, you would not be yes. required to build the sidewalk? Yes. So it, when you click on the sidewalk calculator, which is, I think is all anyone has to go off of if it's required or not, it says it's required because Truett Avenue is required. But 20th Street, no one's building sidewalks there. It, it's not even really a great area to build sidewalks. Do, are, do you see what he's saying? He's saying if, if he were only on 20th, he would not, he would not get, have triggered the I sidewalk. I get people don't want to build sidewalks, but the law, and John Michael also said they did their own calculator, and their own calculator says you have to build law sidewalks on Truett and 20th, and that's why he's in front of us asking not to. I, I'm asking only for 20th Street, not Truett Avenue. So. Okay, well, that's new. And so, and why? Just because it's longer and expensive? Um, I, I'm actually more just saying that it, it's not actually required. Like, you guys don't actually think it's required. It's just kind of like a little flaw in the system. A flaw in the system? John Michael, have we made a mistake? The city is not prepared to recognize flaws in the system. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Questions of the applicant? Anything else to Wait, add? So, I just want to clarify. So, John Michael, if, if you were only on 20... Would, would he have to build a sidewalk? Don't know because we didn't review that because that's not the case. We have the case that we have. We don't go doing speculative research on other so, properties. If other properties don't require sidewalks, those might have been the ones to buy. Okay, but I guess what I'm asking is when, when you do your analysis and it says sidewalks are required, did it say on both streets? Or did I didn't just... do the analysis, so I can't say what pulled up with the analysis. This was performed by Mr. Thermopolis, our senior most uh, zoning examiner. Okay. And we have the Planning Commission recommendation in front of us related to sidewalks, too. Um, like, like four cases ago, you were looking at uh, one, there was a property that had two roads. It was sitting between two roads, and you clicked on the property, and it said sidewalks are required, and then someone mentioned, oh, but that, that road actually isn't, or that part of the road isn't, doesn't require sidewalks. So I, I'm, I'm pretty That was a lot because it fronted two streets. And so that's the, why we said this on one street, well. no, fronted, like the property. This is the corner. That's different than one street asking to build sidewalks on the front of the yard and basically the back of the yard. This is a corner lot, which every case <laughs> I've seen related to a corner yacht, the sidewalks apply to the whole corner. But if a house happens to you know, go from one street to another street, you only have to buy, build it on the front part, not the backyard part. So this okay, is different. So, is there two, so, two Okay, frontages? so that's, that's it. We're, we're going to close the public hearing discussion. Yeah, I mean, I, I agree with the council member on, on the setback. I think it, 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 it's, uh, 
a, a district that pays very close attention to these requests and it's a very active district and if the council member uh, is okay I think that that uh, makes sense I think that the uh, the unique hardship is the orientation of the homes um, you know the, the sidewalk to me it's it's in that in that area where you know corner lots just get penalized at a, at a, in a way that uh, that it feels um, disproportionate to the intent because it, I think that you think of the neighbors and others on the street uh, having a, a different type of, of penalty so I, I'm inclined to think of this as a, a acceptable variance with no pay on 20th but to not uh, have a variance on Truett where you pay for Truett okay I just which I think the applicant had proposed but that's just my thought I disagree it. we said that we're not the legislative body this passed unanimously for the Metro Council they could fix this if this is some sort of error but I don't think it's an error do corner lots get penalized more because they have more frontage sure but that's not our situation to just say, well, we don't want him to spend all the money. I get it, but we've done it twice today. But those were very unique, different situations well, in this okay. one. I mean, I, and, and, I and it's say, fair enough. That, I mean, they weren't different to me, but I can, and I, I respect others thinking that they so, are. But so my to me, that's on this, my point. My two cents on this. This is my neighborhood. Uh, I live around the corner from here. And, and I will say that there are... And I'm not talking about industrial areas or undeveloped areas. I'm talking about there are some neighborhoods that are and have been designed from the beginning by their nature not to have sidewalks. My neighborhood happens to be one of those. It's, it's a streetcar suburb. And just the, the way the, the sewerage and the, the properties are laid out, there's nowhere for a sidewalk because it was never intended to be a sidewalk neighborhood. Uh, now, the only difference is on, on this street versus my street is this this does have through traffic my street doesn't uh, but I you know I think I, I think it is worth offering you know one street or the other on this okay well so I'm gonna make a motion then. so Mr. Taylor, what were you saying? I was going to say David, but everybody here except you. Well, that's, David. Yeah, that's all three of us. <laughs> um, no, I mean, I, I was I was comfortable with um, a variance with no pay on 20th, but no variance on Truett, uh, which is the the street frontage side. You make that and in part, you know, and to me, the the unique aspect of this is that that you're keeping the existing home too. So I mean, that that. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, I think that's. That I, I would agree to that if that were a motion. I would second that. Well, then I'll, I will make a motion that we grant the uh, rear setback variance and that we grant a variance for the sidewalk requirement on 20th with uh, no pay and that we deny the variance for the sidewalk on Truett. Okay. Motion's been made. Is there a second? I'll second that. Motion's been made and properly seconded. Any more discussion? none. All those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed? Three to one. John Michael, what happens? I would recommend the board take up a separate motion with regard to the setback in case you can get a 4-0 on that one. If you cannot, okay. then we will good, stay open on the second matter. Setback. Um, I'll move that we uh, approve the variance on the rear setback um, because the conditions for the variance have been met. Okay. Motion's been made. Is there a second? I'll second. Uh, motion to made and properly seconded. Any discussion? Seeing none. All those in favor of the motion signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed. Passes unanimously. With that, Mr. Chairman, the setback is the variance on the setback is approved. However, the sidewalk question will stay open on the uh, board's docket until our next meeting, June the seventh, actually for a 30-day window, 
um, which will only include the June 7th meeting. So the board will have the opportunity to vote at that date and members who are not present today will have the opportunity to review both the case file and the video of today's proceedings so that they can participate in that vote as well. John, John Michael, quick question. Uh, if, if we made another motion and voted on it and, and the vote came out the same, that would allow anyone that's not here to vote versus if at the next meeting uh, one of us is not here, then our vote would not be recorded on the issue even though we've heard the case. Typically we take a fresh motion in these scenarios in the later oh. date, so it would be kind of the same either way. Okay. I wish we didn't have to because this happened. On occasion this happens and it's unfortunate because we do have board members that are ill and not able to attend. And I'm sure they'd love to be here and vote, but it's unfortunate that it, it can actually swing the vote. It's an item that could be sharpened in the board's rules if the board's ever, board wanted to take it up that way, but we found historically that it's worked well enough to have it as a fresh motion each time because we can't predict who might be out sick or have a sick child and be unable to attend. So what, basically what it means is that the, the two members that aren't here will have a chance to review it if, if they choose to vote for the, for the variance and you get a fourth vote, then you will get the, the motion will pass. If they choose not to, then it, it doesn't pass. Right, it'll be ultimately clear, it dies by Just for the sidewalk, but you got the rear days. setback. Okay. The, the setback is fine, but okay. the, the sidewalk right now is still in limbo. Okay, okay. John Michael, next case. Um, final detail, there will be no public hearing on that case at the next meeting, it's just the board vote, just right. in case that's confusing for anyone. The next case to be considered by the board is 2018-220, involving the property at 1013A, West Grove Avenue, okay. Council okay. District Number 17. Scott Sutton is the appellant and the owner of the subject property. He's here to present his case. It's a short-term rental case. Um, you may recognize the address because you heard 1011 West Grove Avenue at your last meeting just seven short days ago. This is 1013. Is there anyone here in opposition to case number 220? Seeing none, Mr. Sutton will have five minutes to make the desired presentation after we hear from Mr. Osborne, the uh, code's representative on the case. Mr. Osborne, tell us about this. How'd you hear about it? And um, how many times was it rented? Anything else we need to know? So this one's been operating since about November 2016, uh, roughly 145 stays. Um, I found out about it through another one of my cases uh, that I was working. It was issued a permit on February 8th of 2018. Uh, that permit was canceled on 3-27-18 after I found out about the previous operation and the notice of violation was sent on April 2nd of 2018. It looks like he had about 15 people there after being permitted and about 130 before that. Can you say that again? You said 15 people after being? After being permitted and about 130 before. After okay. It looks like uh, the advertisement was removed on on or before April 7th. And when was your letter? Uh, April 2nd. Okay. The cancellation letter was sent on March 27th. Okay, very good. Please identify yourself for the record, your address, and why you're here. Hi, my name is my name's Scott Sutton. I live at 1013A West Grove Avenue. Um, thank you for your time today. Mm -hmm. um, initially, I just do want to point out that the host compliance record is not my house. Um, this is not my house. That's another, that's ain't my truck. Hey, what? <laughs> Inside okay. joke. Sorry. So, who's, so, and I'm not so, just, I'm not so is it the picture not, that's wrong or the address that's wrong? Or? I, I don't understand exactly how can how you show, host Can you show works. that to Mr. Osborne? Mr. Osborne. Sure. So, the house is that I live in references is uh, Airbnb. This picture? Yeah. Okay. okay. So, I'm just. Like I said, I'm not disputing the fact that I ran an Airbnb b before I had the permit, but I'm just pointing out that the host compliance data is not accurate. Um, the in all photo cases, is not accurate. Well, that's how they says that's how it's triangulating who I am or how it's determining okay. who I am. Okay, well, and I would just, imagine it could influence how many. So, stays when I did stay. you first start renting, and how many times did you rent it? Without um, so I still, um, I started renting in. Um, uh, 2017 about and um, end of 2016 like you said mm -hmm. um, I voluntarily um, I didn't know that I needed a permit okay. um, I just found out that I needed a permit um, and so I upon my own you know I didn't receive any notices or any violations 
Um, I began the process at the beginning of January. And at that time, I immediately, when I started seeing all the things that you had to do, I immediately shut down. Um, I turned the listing off okay. um, and didn't have any more um, rentals. Um, and that took about a month. I was issued the permit on February 8th. And then I began um, advertising and running again um, because I'd received the permit. Okay. And then what and, happened? You and got then the letter on the notice, And then seven. I received a notice saying that I was in violation and that they were revoking my permit because I had run before. Yep. My assumption was that everything was cleared when I went through the long, lengthy permitting process. But that was before you got the letter. I'm sorry? That was before you got the letter, right? I went through the process before I got the letter, yes. Yeah, so if you get the letter later saying, no, you shouldn't be, why would you think you should still operate? We didn't. No, I didn't. Now. Okay, so I you, did. you took everything down. When so there got, were two things. I took, I took everything down when I started the permitting process. Yes. Because I was running in 2017. Mm -hmm. I, I had stays. I stopped everything when I began applying for the permit, and I got a permit. So when I got the permit, I started advertising and I started running. Um, I started having people say my place again. But when you got the letter, you then I turned it all off again. Okay, you turned it immediately off. turned it off. Okay. Um, and I, do you have the packets that I sent? Yes, yeah. we do. Yeah. Thank so you. I have the letters. There's letters for people complaining about it. Yep. Um, just so it's come up a couple of times. And you have many letters of support for the record. Well, I take it seriously, and I take complying with the rules seriously. Uh, and I could be the second person today to say that I'm trying to comply with the law. Um, I lost over $3,000 with booked rentals. I could tell you um, that all you have to do is call Airbnb, and they will cancel them for you. Mm -hmm. um, I have and a bad rating. Do your ratings get dinged if you do that? Well, you saw that I have a bad rating, and you, I called Airbnb, and that'll be taken off when I resume advertising again. Okay. So it's, you know. It's cost me a lot of money, but I want to be compliant. Um, uh, I, I mean, it's pretty straightforward. I So basically, I pulled everything down um, in January. So I'm looking to have it reinstated. I mean, I feel like I've, I understand I did it wrong. I'm admitting that I did it wrong. I pulled it down every time I was supposed to pull it down. And I'm just looking to lawfully continue. OK, so it will just depend on who gets to make a motion Related to Mr. Osborne. Oh, the, the what the photo? I mean, I don't think that has anything. I, I just wanted to, to clarify because we're running out of post compliance and how we go through and identify stuff. This says 1012. They often use Google Maps to go through and identify properties. That is not the sole reason that this was picked up. It, and like I said, I'm trying to be compliant. I'm just pointing out that host compliance is. Do you have something else to say? Uh, no, the, the, I, the advertisement did have the permit number that he was issued in it. Okay. So okay. When I would, after, and that was after I had received the permit. Okay. And, and the other, and if, if, I'm, if they cancel the, revoke the permit, I'm supposed to get 15 days notice, but I still pulled everything down, and they didn't indicate that I had 15 days notice. So I can't tell more than I had to, because right. I'm okay. trying to do the right thing. OK. Any other questions for the applicant? OK. We're going to close the public hearing discussion. I mean, so it's going to come down to when he pulled it down or when he applied. Well, I, I mean, there, there's a couple things. One is that you know, I, it's rare that we get such a thorough packet of information. Um, it's extraordinarily rare to get the level of support uh, personal letters and uh, I mean it, it's not unusual to have the immediate neighbors say hey I like my neighbor and they run a good site it's much more common to have people complain and in this case you have a whole lot of folks saying and, and we also have an email from Colby Sledge the council person in the area and he said he supports this as the applicant has reached out to me and has neighbor support yes. oh, go ahead. yeah so I mean I, I, I'm inclined to uh, for, for pretty lean, good leniency on it because I, I just think that, you know, twice the applicant, I mean, I don't think it was the applicant's fault that the permit was er issued in error. I think that the applicant, uh, you know, twice uh, complied when they knew. And because of the time frame between, you know, first taking it down and getting the permit, which was issued in error, and then taking it down again until today, um, uh, I'm, I'm pretty good with, with, what, with 
time served. So I'll, I'll move that the zoning administrator uh, did not err and that the applicant would be eligible to apply for a permit uh, tomorrow. Okay, motion's been made. Is there a second? I'll second it. Motion's been made and properly seconded. Discussion. I was just going to say um, the applicant actually came and tried to get a permit on his own without host compliance citing him, and we don't hear those much nowadays. So I'll support, of course, oh, your motion. Okay. <laughs> okay, any more discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Passes unanimously. Thank Good you. luck. You're eligible to apply tomorrow. Thanks. Okay. Well, the last case on today's <laughs> dock is 2018-246. <laughs> I got the nod before I made the motion. I want to make sure you're... Like, I said, I got your nod, but it's like, yeah, okay. <laughs> okay, <laughs> last case. Mr. Chairman, case 246, Todd Clark is the appellant and owner of the property at 4506 Idaho Avenue. It's an item A appeal involving a short-term rental permit. The aerial photograph here shows the neighborhood and the property in question. Face of the property is shown on a dated, but hopefully still somewhat accurate, photograph from the uh, assessor's website. Is there anyone here in opposition to case number 246? There is. As a result, the appellant will have 10 minutes to make the desired presentation. The opposition will have 10 minutes to make their presentation. For the appellant, a reminder, if you wish to save some of your time back for rebuttal, you have the opportunity to do so, but it should come out of this original 10 minutes. We'll hear from the um, staff first and then from the appellant. Okay. Um, we'll hear okay. from the staff first. Oh, I'm sorry. So, Mr. Osborne, tell us about this case, how you heard about it, um, when you, how many times it's been rented, uh, when you sent out a notice, and what happened after you sent out your notice. So. They actually started an application for this property, it looks like, on September 2nd, 2016. That was never finished. Um, a tax notice was sent out on December 1st of 2017, and a short-term rental property violation and tax notice was sent out on February 9th of 2018. Um, BZA application was processed on 3-9 of 2018. Um, I can get the rentals for you here in just a second. <coughs> Approximately 68. 68? Uh, yes, sir. Okay. And when did you send out, oh, you sent out letters when? There December 1st of 2017 was the tax notice. Okay. Uh, February 9th was the short-term rental and tax notice. Okay. And I've got a note somewhere, and I, I don't see it in, in this file, but it, I think it was in the PDF that was sent, that said, I guess a letter from a neighbor saying there was a restrictive covenant on the uh, uh, they do or whatever it is that I mean that I guess that the building is being rented and is that do you know anything about that and how we're supposed to think about it if was this an out I mean if you don't we can ask the applicant but I should know if, if how that I'll, I'll mention it so you can be thinking about it and then we can ask the applicant but it, are you it, asking an HOA question no it says I, I think it's the way I read it was it uh, it would be you know, if I built a studio in the, in, in, on my property that I signed off saying it'd never be living space, and now it's being rented as short-term rental. That's that's what the letter said, and I can't find the letter, but I wrote that in my notes. So that's what I was asking, kind of administratively. Yeah, no, that's that's an that's an appropriate question, and we take that part at the front end. Basically, a lot of people have accessory structures on their property: the carriage house, apartment over the garage, an actual you know mother-in-law suite attached to the main house, or a completely separate and second dwelling unit on the property. Regardless, any of those have to be properly um, issued a use and approved for use and occupancy as a residential dwelling unit. The idea being that your garage where you keep your yard tools and your work truck uh, doesn't have to meet or has to meet a lower level of code compliance than a residential right. dwelling under IRC and IBC and ICC, I guess. Um, regardless, only once a structure like that is approved for residential dwelling under the zoning code and subsequently the building code would it be approved for use obviously as a short-term rental permit. So we see people come in every now and then wanting to get a short-term rental permit on the apartment that they have above their garage, which has never been permitted as such. So we start them on the process to see if they're even eligible to get that permit for the work that may have been done years before they bought the property. 
get them squared away legally in that regard, then they're in a position to make the application for the short-term rental. So to your question, I'll bring it back in a little tight here. Yes, that would have to be resolved if in fact it was that issue. Doesn't have to be resolved here today. The same question is before you on this case that is with many others. Um, there's a one-year wait based upon prior operation. Do you see fit to reduce that one-year wait by any amount? If so, how much? That will only put the appellant in a position to come make an application for the permit. At that time, all the other legal criteria would be reviewed by our staff. Okay. So if that's not something that, if, so basically if, if that's the main opposition point, it will be addressed. At the staff level. Okay. Please state your name and address for the record and why you're here. Okay. Do you mind if I read off of here? Sure. Just, go ahead. I, this stuff is hard for me to do. Okay. So start with your name and address. Okay. So uh, my name is Renee Gerard and I live at 4506 Idaho Avenue. I would first like to apologize for operating our short-term rental without a proper permit. Um, a bit of a better situation. We're originally from Canada and New Zealand. When we moved to Nashville a few years ago, we knew we would have many people coming to visit, family, friends, and my husband's work associates. This has proven to be the case with us having visitors at least once a month. We have a garage structure separate from our house, and we decided to build a suite above the garage so our visitors could stay in their own space comfortably without feeling they are infringing on us or our children. When we don't have any visitors, we thought we could help supplement our costs by having people stay short term. We chose to do this through Airbnb. As a family, we always try to stay in Airbnbs, bed and breakfast, etc., when traveling and really value the experience and prefer it over hotels with all the personal touches and getting to know the host and the neighborhoods. We really find it so much nicer than staying in a hotel in a city. We hope to never have a full-time renter due to our desire to accommodate our family and friends. Listing our suite through Airbnb simply helps financially and it's also really great meeting the travelers and hopefully helping them navigate and enjoy the city. Additionally, since we live on the property and access to our suite is only through our backyard, this means we monitor all guests and ensure there are no parties, no more than two people staying at a time, etc. This is beyond important to us. When we first began with Airbnb and learned we needed to get a permit, we applied. This was in 2016. My husband came down and provided all the required information. We had the fire inspector come out. She recommended we change the location of our fire alarm, which we did. It was my understanding that my husband had finished the process of our application, and he believed he had, but apparently we had not. The letter notifying us that we were operating without a permit was actually sent to our prior address in Toronto, Canada, where we lived before moving to Nashville. Fortunately, my in-laws owned that house and noticed the mail addressed to us and forwarded it on, but not until March. The letter came as a surprise to us, as we thought it was a mistake. The day after we received it, my husband went down to meet with Clint again and Clint informed him that we did not have a permit and needed to remove the ad and that we would be receiving in the mail a letter um, with, I believe, our hearing details. We waited a few weeks and nothing came, so we followed up. It was determined that for some reason our letter had not been sent to us. We were then given this date of May 17th, or we would have to wait another few months for our hearing. Unfortunately, my husband already had a business trip scheduled and was in, unable to be here today. Since he's the one who's been dealing with our permit situation, I apologize for any lack of detail that I have. I sent a message of apology to our future renters before Airbnb helped me to cancel the reservations. I still feel incredibly bad for putting them in this situation despite our not realizing we had done so. We put the sign up on our property after having it made and then sent another message out to our neighborhood, um, letting them know that our, about our situation. My surrounding neighbors were all very supportive. One actually wanted to come down here with me today until I learned that it could be a very long day. <laughs> and I believe another neighbor sent a letter of support. I love living in Nashville and sharing our community of Sylvan Park with guests and hope to be able to continue doing so as soon as possible. Thank you for your time and consideration. Okay, questions for the applicant. So you, you, uh, you originally applied and you got through, you thought, the whole process and what, what, at what point, what did, what did you lack? What did you not do? I'm actually because not, that's what I'm not sure of. I'm not sure if my husband came back with the, all the information we moved. The, I just know what, what I was involved in and that was putting moving the um, fire alarm did you, did you the pay the uh, hotel motel tax we've submitted it all no back then when you thought you had the application had you been paying the hotel motel? we had not no we've actually gone back and submitted it now but I but if you thought you had the permit why weren't you I, paying actually, the I didn't actually know about the taxes until more recently and now we've gone back and submitted them again our accountants are actually going back and going through that as income as well, and we're trying to fix all of that now. So you have no idea what you did or your husband did to, quote unquote, finish the application? I don't. I thought he, I thought he finished it. I thought he came back down with the information. Like, I know we have, we have the whole packet set up with our liability insurance, the 
million dollars. The hey Robert, yeah, do you know how far along they got in the process? Say again. Do y'all know how, how far along they got in the process? Or we just pulled up the permit application, which was initiated on September the second of 2016. So they got up and running and trying to get it going in the right direction, obviously. However, it shows that the UNO, use and occupancy, life safety, final approval, which is the fire marshal inspection, was never <coughs> completed. So it's not clear whether they were ever contacted to set up the uh, review of the property or if when they reviewed it, they determined that it did not pass inspection. Uh, usually in these instances, they weren't called out is kind of the nine out of 10. And but everything else they turned in as far as you could tell? Based upon the criteria that were in place in September of 16, it looks like they were already approved on the zoning initial review and the bond license review as applicable, which would have been the insurance checkpoint. Um, they didn't finish the process of the fire marshal and then subsequently picking up the permit once approved. If okay. approved. And sending $50. Okay, very good. Thank you. Question. Um, we have opposition, so do you want to speak after? You'll be able to have a chance. Okay. So opposition, please come forward. You'll have 10 minutes uh, total cumulatively. And state your name, your address, and why you're in opposition of this. Uh, it looks like you have some handouts. Okay, good. Bernard Pickney, 4604 Dakota Avenue. Okay. It's about a block from oh. this location. Yeah, please. Okay, Bernard Pickney. Thank you. Is this thing on? Okay. Yes, yes. Anyway. Uh, under the 1998 comprehensive rezone in our neighborhood was rezoned for single family zoning and so you can't have two dwelling units on one lot so you know i don't know if these folks went and got a building permit to convert the garage into a dwelling unit okay. or you know or how if the codes department looks at you know the the application for a short-term rental to see if it's appropriate, you know, or not. Okay, please do find yourself. I'm John Summers. I live at 5000 Wyoming Avenue, and Bernard and I are both here on behalf of the Silver Park Neighborhood Association and Historic, uh, Historic Silver Park, two neighborhood associations. The issue here is that um, this is single-family zoning. This is RS 7.5. This property was built, or this structure was built in 2015. Uh, we have a number of people that build areas over the garage. I have one over my own, um, but you're not allowed to have dwelling units um, in the uh, bonus room that you build over your garage. And I've talked with Mr. Herbert about this because I had one just recently built about a half a block down the alley. And what they're doing now is making sure that there's a letter sign that they understand that there's restriction to that. So. While this property owner has the ability to apply for a non, an owner occupied in the main structure, they cannot, under our current zoning, uh, apply for a type one or owner occupied in the detached garage. Um, that's, that's the issue. It's a zoning issue. Um, and Ms. Snyder, I think, uh, there was some understanding in terms of the the property where I'm not sure if these people were the original owners of it, that they did sign a restriction when it was built. <coughs> But I don't have that documentation. It doesn't show up when you pull up. So. And I guess, you know, that, and that's why, I, and again, that's why I asked at the very front because it, we haven't seen cases like that. And from my understanding was that, um, that 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 will take care of itself. And, you know, and what we're looking at is, you know, do they rent, do they rent without a permit? And then when would they be eligible? based on their rental behavior and knowing that if they have an accessory dwelling unit that's not, uh, you know, uh, you know, that they're not supposed to be using as living space that they would not be getting a permit at all. Um, and so to me, I, I feel like they're almost separate. And so, well, uh, I don't disagree with you, but I would disagree with you and that the right hand needs to know what the left hand's doing. Right. And the coast department has a history of making errors. Uh, I'm not saying they make errors in every circumstance, but there's a, there are errors and you have to deal with them. This body has to deal no, with come them. come on, sir. Mr. Summers. Um, that's, so, that's not a fair, you know, um, you know talk of, talking about the codes department. We're here to talk about this one particular well, property. Saying, right. You might so what I want to make sure is that the, but there is an issue here with yes. this property. And I hope that you would at least be cognizant of it because you even yes. have by the own admissions of the applicant is that they are using 
the the area above the garage is living space, and that's in violation of our zoning ordinance. And you're making this legal argument about the use of this space too, but I would like to hear about why you're opposed to just the general use too and this process outside of this legal technicality. Is there anything else besides you know that, that in, basically in terms of the application? Yes, that this basically if it's if you're right and it's illegal to have this use, right. which you might be right. What else besides that are you opposed to as far as her use of this short term? Is, or is that in your well, only argument? I, I, you know, uh, obviously, as I've stated publicly, I think um, uh, the one year ought to apply in all these cases. Obviously, y'all have that discretion. Um, and, and y'all. Well, why should one year apply in this case? Uh, I, I, th I think one year should apply in every case. I think that's the standard, and there it needs to be extenuate, real extenuating circumstances to deviate from that. But that's, and and that's, this, that's but my but opinion. Mr. Summers, you know, we, we in, like in, to talk in about. This, in this case, not only do you have an, an operator without a, the proper permits, you've got them actually housing people in an area that they do not have the legal right to do okay. that. And, and, and that's evident from the records of the metropolitan government. Right now, it shows it's a single family one, single family permit, and you cannot you cannot rent out bonus space in your garage. You can't rent out your garage. You can't. Yeah. And you came here to stand through our long meeting, so I'd like yeah. to hear from you too. Well, basically, I was just that's my only concern about it. It's not there. Oh, your name and address. Oh, I'm please. sorry, Jeannie Snyder, 4603 Dakota Avenue. Okay. Um, it just seems like Silver Park is poised to explode with short-term rentals on single-family zone lots. And it's my understanding when I go to the Gov site, there is a restricted covenant on file for okay. the use of their building. And you, I read your left email, thank you for sending sure. um, that I want to emphasize. You said, and this is kind of what I've been saying all day, you say everyone knows that you have to have a permit. <laughs> but as you know, people say, I didn't know. Yeah, I, I just find it really hard to phantom that people, it's such a contentious subject. And when you live next to one, which I do. Can you speak on the year? So Mr. Summers over here says they should get a year. What do you think? Oh, get? I'm just not that up on the penalties that should be. Okay, so the penalty is, since they operate without a permit, they got a year when staff kind of flagged them. Right. And now so, they're coming to us today to ask for less. So what do you have to say about that? Well, first off, I think anybody that operates years and 80 visits and 40 visits, just listening to this today, I think that that should be taken into consideration with their penalties. Okay. You know, How many years have they done it? How much <coughs> revenue have they gotten off of it? Are they going back and paying all the taxes? You know, and I do think that maybe three months from the time that there is pulled or I, you know, that's, I don't know how that would work. My problem is that it's illegal, mm -hmm. period, destruction. That's what I'm here today. I don't have anything against this neighbor. I don't know her. You know, it's just, I think it's a big, huge can of worms. Okay, Mr. Summers, you have the floor again. Tell us why this is terrible. Well, uh, I, I, uh, again, the neighborhood's worked very hard to maintain a single family zoning and we had to fight to get that and overwhelming support for it and that's that's the law and I comply with it and Bernard complies with it Jeannie complies with it we think everyone should comply with it um, and we would ask you to uphold the zoning administrator's ruling as being um, not an error and not arbitrary okay. and uh, we appreciate your time and Absolutely. We we, appreciate we've had a great time being here with you today right. so <laughs> question for the um, opposition I don't have a question for them but um, I don't think that we're here on a case where the zoning administrator erred on determining whether or not this is an allowed use on an RS zone property. I think his we're here on his to debate whether or not he erred um, in giving them a permit based on prior operation. Right. So, right. so Mr. Summers has made his good legal argument, and that's mm -hmm. codes, and other people will get to determine that. We will of course take that in consideration but um, this most likely you know we're not aware of the particular facts about mm -hmm. the use of this garage and all that so today we'll be ruling based on you know prior use without a permit and then kind of your neighborhood support and things like that 
Okay. Thank you. Thank you. But in order for them to, I mean, they will have to go back to Metro Codes and discuss it, correct? John Michael, to, tell us what the procedure is, assuming that Mr. Summers is right that basically this garage cannot be used. How will the staff deal with that? You'll have it. Whether in 12 months or 12 days, whatever, uh, the applicant will have the opportunity to come in and make the application for the short term rental permit. This is RS zoned property, so it'll be a matter of determining what structure or structures are eligible for use for residential purposes. There does not appear to be a permit on record that reflects that the um, accessory structure has ever been inspected, approved, or permitted as a dwelling space. So, in all likelihood, what will be determined based upon that analysis is that only the primary residential structure is eligible for use as a short-term rental permit or for any other dwelling purposes, whether for them or for their guests. Um, they will be analyzed to determine um, whether they're eligible for the owner-occupied or non-owner-occupied. All the evidence here today seems to suggest that it is, in fact, an owner-occupied property, which is still a permit that's eligible under RS zoning, whereas the non-owner-occupied would not be eligible or okay. available under RS. Thank you. We're going to hear from the applicant again. Thanks for being here. Please come forward. This is rebuttal time. You get to respond to what you just heard. Um, okay, so, um, geez. Sorry, I just didn't think there would be any opposition, so I'm a bit shocked. Um, and why didn't you? I mean, you live in Sylvan Park. This is a very, it's like Hillsborough Village, 12th yeah. South. There are people that, you know, just generally don't like short term rentals. And I totally, don't that's like why I sent out the, that actually, operate them without absolutely. a permit. They and don't these like might have that. been the people when I sent out an email to our neighborhood because right away, as soon as I had to put the sign up, I knew it was going to be like, what's going on in your house. And I was afraid that people were going to think we were going to end up with a big party house all of a sudden. Mm -hmm. Our house is. You know, you see a lot of it when you're on the, anyway, it just looks kind of okay. like so, it could be one of those party houses. So I just wanted to make sure that all of our neighbors knew that our intention was not to operate a full-time short-term rental in replace of having a full-time rental. So did you hear what uh, Mr. Osborne basically said that apparently your husband filled out the application and didn't do the end part, which was the inspection by the fire marshal? We did have the inspection. That's when they told us to move the fire alarm, which we did. We did get to that stage. She did you came, get, did the, you get a, pr when was that? That was all at the same time. Like we called that, and booked it with like the fire marshal. In 16, yeah. We called and booked it with the fire yeah, marshal. We moved the fire alarm. She requested oh, you, that we move you, it. Oh, move it. But then you have to have them come back and say, hey, you moved it and everything's good. Yeah. And you didn't do that. I, I passed it on to my husband at that point. Okay, so that didn't get done. So whatever he didn't, whether he did get call her back and we didn't, okay, they never so called her. Okay, so that's why you don't happened. have a permit. So yeah. anything else to add based on what they said? No, except again, just that I understand what they're saying to protecting Sylvan Park, and I, I, I mean, I'm all for that as well. <clears throat> I love our neighborhood so much. Um, that's why we chose it when we moved there, and I don't want, I don't want it. I also don't want it to turn into one of those huge areas that are becoming a real problem across Nashville. I really feel protective of it as well, and that's um, and that's why I want. I thought we had a permit, and that's why I'm here to, to get a okay. permit and as well. And are you aware of any covenant that the accessory dwelling has? So I would check into that too. So any yeah. other questions for the applicant? Okay, we're going to close the public hearing. Discussion? Well, and, and, and I, I appreciate uh, all sides of this and, and, and always have, I always don't share the same view as some folks in terms of um, the waiting period and, and it's just an honest disagreement of how to look at it. But I do think that in this case, um, and you all can suggest the appropriate time uh, from March 9th when that uh, when the applicant could uh, be eligible to apply for a permit again, um, provided that all taxes are paid, but I do think that, uh, and we can discuss that, and I'm happy to make the motion, but uh, I do think that it needs to be noted that there is, uh, has been testimony presented, and there is reason to believe from the testimony, or from the research, the uh, not exhaustive research, but the initial research from the, the uh, code staff here, that, uh, we're skeptical to the uh, legality of the use and that we would hope that that would be explored fully before any permit was issued. Uh, but just to have that noted, uh, because I do think that's a, a very valid and important point from the opposition. Right, and they have submitted to us, you know, paperwork and I'm sure they'll submit more. So 
please staff, you know, before any sort of issue is uh, resolved to look into that. So, do you have a, a thought on time? Uh, well, it's always, you know, if people who think they applied for or applied for a permit, they went through steps, they missed a step, and I feel like those are honest mistakes. So, I would be lenient, like you, and I would well, say, go ahead. So missing a step to me is not sending the letters to the neighbors. This is, okay, five, this is the safety part of the short-term rental, which is smoke detectors. And we have to have them certain numbers. They have to be in the right place. They weren't in the right place. The fire marshal came out and told them that wasn't in the right place. They said that they fixed it, but then they never came back. And they rented this place without the proper sign-off on the fire marshal. I don't think that this is kind of a small thing. Yeah, but but did what the fire marshal asked, and so. Mm -hmm. But yes. do we know that? I mean, well, the, the testimony was. I don't mm -hmm. think there's right. reason. But then to the fire, but we don't know that the fire marshal said that that's done in the right way because it wasn't the first time around. So to me, it's not just leaving off. Oh, I didn't send letters to my neighbors. Mm -hmm. So to Our me, do you have a range you. you were thinking? I think it's closer to seven months. And I was thinking three to four. Yeah, I was thinking more three to four. Mr. Harper. Let's call it five and go home. Call it what? Let's call it make, five and make go a home. Motion. I, yeah. I'll move that the zoning administrator did not err and that the uh, applicant be uh, allowed to apply for a permit five months from the date of their, uh, they filed their appeal 3918. And then would you, I will second if you'll accept the amendment that the, uh, we, have serious doubts to the legality of the accessory structure based on the testimony and that we would ask that that be explored uh, fully, before fully before issuing a permit just so that it, it's in the I'll, record. I'll accept that. Okay. Motion's been and made. That, that no permit before all taxes, but I think that's a given too. Yeah. Back taxes paid. But I, th I think you have to do that anyway. They, they has to, no, I won't add that, just the, the initial thing, because all back taxes have to be paid to get your. So motion has been made and properly updated and seconded. Yeah. Um, any more discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor of the motion signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Passes unanimously. Good luck. So, John Michael. Mr. Chairman, that concludes the Board of Zoning Appeals meeting for May the 17th and for the, the month vote. of May. We'll we see you on June the 7th. A vote for mayor and District 1 councilperson. Thanks. This has been a service of the Metro National Network. If you would like to see this presentation again, or for more information about this and other programs, visit Nashville.gov.